Welcome to Data Structures and Algorithms for Coding Interview Course. I designed this course with ton of content. If you want to build your strong understanding in data structures and algorithms, this is the perfect course for you. Now let's see what we will be learning throughout this course. We'll start off with a random analysis. First, we'll see how to find out complexity of your algorithms. We'll talk about omega notation, big o notation, and theta notation. For rest of the courses, we'll be talking about big o notation. Just for learning purposes, we'll be talking about omega notation and theta notation. In this section, you will learn how to find out time complexity of an algorithm using some examples. Then we will start learning array data structures. In the array data structure section, we will be talking about 1D array and 2D array, how to create array, how to use array, and we will be talking about how 1D and 2D array is represented in computer memory. Then we will talk about linked list data structure. In this section of this course, we will be talking about four types of linked list, single linked list, circular single linked list, doubly linked list, and circular doubly linked list. We will implement the four types of linked list and we will implement all functionality of linked list for four types of linked list from complete scratch. Then we will talk about stack. We will implement stack from scratch and we will see how LIFO principle works for stack. Then we will talk about queue data structure. We will implement queue using linked list and array and we will implement queue from complete scratch and you will see how FIFA principle works for queue. Then we will start our new data structure a tree. For a tree data structure we have many types of tree but in this course we will be talking about most commonly used tree data structure. First we will see binary tree We'll see how to implement binary tree, how to traverse binary tree. We'll traverse a binary tree using breadth first traversal and using depth first traversal. That means a VFS or DFS. Then we'll talk about binary search tree and we'll talk about a wheel tree. We'll implement binary search tree from scratch and we'll implement all the method of a binary search tree. And also we will implement a wheel tree from scratch and we will implement all the functionality for a wheel tree data structure from complete scratch. Then we will talk about try data structure. For auto search suggestions or for word corrections, we use try data structure. When you type something on Google, then Google gives you some suggestions and the suggestions comes from a try data structure. Then we will talk about binary heap. We have two types of binary heap, mean heap and max heap. We will implement binary heap from complete scratch. There is a famous algorithm that is called sorting algorithms, heap sort. Heap sort uses binary heap data structure. And we will see that also in the sorting algorithm section. Then we will learn sorting algorithms. You are given an unsorted array, you have to sort the array into ascending order. In this course, we will learn 7 sorting algorithms, Babel sort, selection sort, insertion sort, quick sort, merge sort, bucket sort, and heap sort algorithms. After that, we will see recursion. For tree problem, recursion is almost mandatory. There are a lot of applications for recursion and that we will see throughout this course. A dynamic programming uses recursion. For tree problems, most of the time we use recursion. For graph problem, we use recursion. And there are a lot of problems where you use recursion. Then we'll talk about dynamic programming. Using dynamic programming, we can transform our exponential time complexity to linear time complexity. That we'll see in this course. We'll see the properties of dynamic programming, overlapping subproblems, 
and optimal substructure. Also, we will see what is the bottom up approach, what is top down approach of dynamic programming. Then we will talk about hash table. Finally, we will talk about graph data structure. In this section of this course, we will have a lot of content, a lot of algorithms and we will implement graph data structure from complete scratch. We will have a complete section for graph. In this section of this course, we will talk about some popular algorithms, Dijkstra algorithm, Belman-Ford algorithms, floyd Warshall algorithm, Primes algorithms, Kruskal's algorithm and there are a lot of content we'll have in this section. We'll have a complete section for graph data structure. If you want to work at a big tech industry like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, Uber, etc., then you have to understand data structures and algorithms deeply for a recording interview. After finishing this course, you will have a clear understanding on this concept data structures and algorithms. You will feel confident. After finishing this course, I use illustrated video examples and we'll go through line by line of codes and we'll explain every single details and how the algorithms works and how the data structures relates to that algorithm. If you want to ask your next coding interview, this course will help you a lot. If you are a self tough programmer, if you don't have any college degree, don't worry. Enroll this course and start learning data structures and algorithm from scratch. This course comes with 30 day money back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to talk about a random analysis. In order to be a great programmer you have to understand the random analysis of an algorithm. In this video we are going to talk about what is a random analysis. Now let's talk about that. What is algorithm random analysis? A random analysis is an estimate of increasing the runtime of an algorithm as its input grows. This is the formal definition of algorithm runtime analysis. Why should you learn it? We should learn random analysis to measure the efficiency of the algorithm. In order to measure the efficiency of your algorithm, you should learn a random analysis. For random analysis, we have two factors, time factor and space factor. The number of operations required for a particular algorithm is called time factor and the amount of memory used by an algorithm is called a space factor. The time factor is called time complexity and the space factor is called a space complexity. Time complexity measures the number of operation requires for a particular algorithm and the space complexity measures the amount of memory used by a particular algorithm. Now let's talk about the notations for runtime analysis. We have three notations for runtime analysis. Omega notation, big O notation, theta notation. Omega notation measures the best case of an algorithm. Big O notations measures the worst case of an algorithm. Theta notations measures the average case of an algorithm. For interviewing purposes, most of the time we'll be using big O notations. In the rest of this course, we'll be talking about big O notations, not omega notations or theta notations. Omega notations and theta notations are used for academical purposes, mostly. Now let's talk about omega notations, big O notations and theta notations. Now let's talk about omega notation. This notation gives the lower bound of an algorithm. That means the base catch. This notation is used to measure the best catch of an algorithm. When we need the best catch of an algorithm, then we have to consider omega notation. Now let's talk about bigger notation. This notation gives the upper bound of an algorithm. That means the worst catch. This notation used to measure the worst catch of an algorithm. Now let's talk about theta notation. This notation gives the average of lower bound and upper bound of an algorithm and this notation used to measure the average case scenario of an algorithm. So we can say theta notation is the average of omega notation 
and to bigger notation. Now let's take an example to understand omega notation, bigger notation and theta notation. Let's say we're given an array. This is an array of integers. We have here integer from 1 to 8. For omega notation, to find out an element in this array, the best catch is omega of 1. If you are said to find out the element 1 in this array, then we have to do here just one operation that will find out the desired element in one unit of time. And this is the best catch. For big O notation, it will take big O of in time complexity because this is the worst case. If you are said you have to find out the element 8 in this array, then you have to scan this array from left to right. And here we have the element 8. If the length of this array is n, then it will take big of n time complexity. So it will take n units of time. This is the worst case. And this is the best case. Okay? The worst case is big of n and the best case is big of 1. For theta notation, basically theta notation is the average of omega and bigger notation. And that is n divided 2. The average is n divided 2. So you can say theta notation is the average of omega notation and bigger notation. Hope you have understood what is omega notation, bigger notation and theta notation. In the rest of this course, we will be talking about bigger notation. And this is used for interview settings and almost in everywhere. So we will be talking about bigger notation for the rest of this course. Now let's see example of runtime analysis. Here we have complexity, here we have name and here we have example. Bigger of 1. This is called constant time complexity. Adding an element in the front of a linked list takes constant time complexity. Bigger of log n. This is called logarithmic time complexity. Searching an element in a sorted array takes logarithmic time complexity. Bigger of n. This is called linear time complexity. Searching an element in an unsorted array takes linear time complexity. Bigger of n log n, this is called linear logarithmic. Linear logarithmic time complexity, Mars sort algorithm takes linear logarithmic time complexity. Bigger of n squared, this is called quadratic time complexity. Shortest path between two cities in a graph takes quadratic time complexity. This is called cubic time complexity. A matrix multiplication takes cubic time complexity. This is called, this is big of 2 to the power n. This is called exponential time complexity. Nape solution of nth Fibonacci problem takes exponential time complexity. Big of n factorial. This is called factorial time complexity. Nape solution of traveling salesman problem takes factorial time complexity. So these are the examples of random analysis. Now let's see a graph for a random analysis. This is big O complexity chart. Here we have the graph representation for our complexity analysis. Here we have number of operations and here we have the size of elements. Here this black line is called constant time complexity because it's super fast. Then we have big of log n. This is also a fast time complexity than linear time complexity. This is the area for logarithmic time complexity. Then we have here linear time complexity. Linear time complexity is better than big of n log n. This is called big of log n area. Okay. Here we have O of n to the power 2. Then we have here exponential. Then we have here factorial. Factorial is the worst ever. This is considered bad. This is considered fair. This is good. And this is excellent. So our constant time complexity is excellent, logarithmic time complexity is good, linear is fair, then n log n is bad, then we have here horrible for exponential factorial or we can say for cubic. This is big O complexity chart and this is the basics of random analysis. In the next video we are going to talk about in details a time complexity analysis. See you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to talk about a random analysis. For random analysis we have time complexity and space complexity. The number of operations required for a particular algorithm is called time complexity. The amount of memory is used by an algorithm is called space complexity. 
the time complexity is not about timing with a clock how long the algorithm takes instead how many operations are executed the number of instructions executed by a program is affected by the size of the input for a high configuration able computer a program will work faster than in a low configuration able computer but for time and space complexity analysis will not consider the power of cpu will just consider the number of operations or the unit of memory is taken by an algorithm big notation is used to classify algorithms by their worst case scenario that's what we have talked about in the previous video now let's talk about common running times one unit of times is required for arithmetic and logical operations one unit of time is required for assignment and written value and one unit of time is required for read and write operation these are the common running times now let's talk about constant time what is constant time constant time means the running time is constant it's not affected by the size of input constant time complexity is not dependent on the size of input here we have a function if in this function takes an input in inside here we have int equals to n times n here we're declaring a variable then here we're printing a value and here we're returning a value this all are constant time operations these are this all takes one unit of times to execute the statement so this program works in constant time complexity this variable declaration takes constant time this printing a value is taking constant time and returning a value is taking constant time. What is a linear time complexity? When an algorithm accepts an input site, it would perform n operations as well. For example, here we have an array and then we have here a loop. We're iterating this array from the first index to the last index. If the size of this array is n, then this loop will run for n times. The error declaration will take big of one time complexity but big of n space complexity because we have here n number of elements and this for loop will iterate through from 0 to n. Actually, it will iterate through from 0 to n minus 1. So we can say it takes big of n steps to, to execute this loop. And inside here, we're printing a value and this will take constant time complexity. So we can say this is taking big of in time complexity so you can say this program is taking big of in time complexity now let's talk about logarithmic time complexity algorithm that has a running time o of log n is slightly faster than big of n example binary search algorithm this is your binary search algorithm t for time uh, n for size of the given array for this binary search algorithm then here this operation takes constant this operation takes constant here we're declaring two variables here we have a loop using this loop we're dividing the array into two halves each time that's why we're saying here t of n divided 2 and this all are taking constant if you want to find out the time complexity for the first iteration the length of our array is n divided 2 to the power g that means n for second iteration length is n divided 2 to the power 1 and we're dividing the array into two halves for each time for k step it takes n divided to the power k after k division length of the array will be 1 n divided to the power k equals to 1 and here we have solved this problem and we get here log 2 n and this is the time complexity for this binary search algorithm hope you've understood how to find out time complexity of a binary search algorithm the time complexity is big of log 2 n and the space complexity is big of 1 because we are using some variable here left right and mid now let's talk about linear logarithmic time complexity this algorithm divide the problem into sub problem and then merge them in n time example merge sort algorithm this is merge sort algorithm this is a little bit critical to understand we have a section where we have explained every single informations about merge sort algorithms we have a section in this course sorting algorithms you can check the video in that section merge sort algorithm here we have t of n and we're dividing the problem into two halves 
each time here we have t of n divided 2 and here we have t of n divided 2 and here this function takes linear time complexity and if we solve this formula then we will get our time complexity big of n times log n and space complexity is big of n this is the time complexity analysis of linear logarithmic time complexity we have explained everything in the video march sort algorithms in the sorting algorithm sections and this is called back substituting method now let's talk about quadratic time bubble sort algorithm takes quadratic time complexity in other words a loop inside other loop is considered quadratic time this is an example of quadratic time complexity we have here two loop one loop for int i 0 i less than n i plus plus inside here j equals to 0 j less than n j plus plus I mean, this loop iterated through from 0 to n minus 1 that means n times it takes n unit of times and this loop also takes n unit of times and this statement will execute in constant time if we add all then we'll get big of n square time complexity for one unit of times of this loop this inner loop takes n unit of times for n unit of time of this outer loop the inner loop takes n times n unit of times hope you have understood what is a quadratic time complexity now let's talk about cubic time complexity it has the same principle as big of n square this is a slow algorithm now let's talk about exponential time complexity o up to the power n it is a very slow algorithm as input grow if n equals to 100000 time complexity would be 21000000 we can consider a brute force algorithm example backtracking algorithm backtracking algorithm takes exponential time complexity factorial time big of n factorial it is the slowest algorithm ever now we're familiar with common random algorithms now we're familiar with common random analysis now you might say why should we learn complexity analysis now let's answer to this question let's say you were given an input of size 10 now for input n equals to 10 if you perform binary search or linear search then there is no significant difference but if the size of our input n equals to 1 billion then if we perform linear search it will take 1 billion millisecond but if we perform binary search binary search will take 32 millisecond here we see a huge difference for 1 billion millisecond if we convert 1 billion millisecond into day then we get 46 day for the input n equals to 1 billion if each unit of operation takes 1 millisecond then linear search algorithm takes approximately 46 day and this is called linear algorithm for binary search algorithm this is called logarithmic algorithm linear search algorithm takes linear time complexity binary search algorithm takes logarithmic time complexity binary search works in 32 milliseconds but linear search takes 1 billion milliseconds for the input n equals to 1 billion now you can see here a huge difference this is why we should learn a random analysis that means complexity analysis if we write an algorithm then you can measure the efficiency of your algorithm using complexity analysis you can say your code is optimized if you do not know complexity analysis then you will have no idea about your code about the efficiency of your code with that complexity analysis you cannot be a great programmer complexity analysis is a must having skills for a software engineer hope you have understood what is complexity analysis and the basics of complexity analysis now we have a basics knowledge of complexity analysis in the rest of the video in this sections we will be talking about how to find out the complexity of an algorithm thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see how to find a time complexity of an algorithm let's say we're given this code here we have a for loop and inside here we're just printing the value of i this for loop start from one and end up at n if we consider each iteration of this loop takes one unit of times then for n iterations this loop will take n unit of times so we can say the time complexity is bigger of n and the space complexity is bigger of one that means constant space complexity because we're not using any additional data structure to store our 
data in computer memory. So the time complexity of this algorithm is big O of n. Now let's take another example. For example, if you're given this algorithm, here we have a loop for i from 1 to less than equals to n. And here we're incrementing by 2 is time. And this speech operation takes constant time. Now we have to find out the time complexity of this algorithm. If we have n equals to 10, then this loop will iterate in divided 2 times. That means 5 times. If each iteration of this loop takes 1 unit of times, then for input n, this loop will take n divided 2 unit of times. For time complexity analysis, we will not consider our constant part. We will take the degree from that expression. Okay, so here we have n. We will take just n. We will discard this constant part. n divided 2 here, 2 is a constant. So the time complexity of this algorithm is big O of n. If you are given this algorithm, here we are increasing by 20 is time. This for loop will take n divided 20 unit of times for the input n. And here we will discard the constant all ages no matter what. If we have here 100, 200, 300, we will not consider that. We will just discard that part and we will take the degree of the equation and that is n. So the time complexity is big of n and the space complexity is big of 1 because we are not using any additional space. Now let's take another example. For example, if you are given this algorithm, now we are going to break it down the iteration for the outer loop and for the inner loop. And this print statement is taking constant time complexity. Here we break down the iteration for outer and inner loop. For first iteration of outer loop, inner loop will not execute. For the second iteration of the outer loop, the inner loop executes one times. For nth iteration of outer loop, the inner loop executes n times. If we add all the execution, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, n, then we get this equation, okay? So we get from this equation n times n plus 1 divided 2, and here we get n squared plus n divided 2. Now, in order to find out the time complexity from this equation, we'll consider the degree of this equation. The degree of this equation is n squared. So the time complexity of this algorithm is big of n squared and the space complexity is big of 1 because we are not using any additional space. Now let's take another example. For example, if you are given this algorithm, we have p equals to 0 and here we have a loop. We are running this loop from 0 to less than equals to n. Here we have p, okay? p less than equals to n and we are increasing i, i equals to i plus p. And here we have a statement. Now how we can find out the time complexity of this algorithm. We break down the iteration for this loop. Okay, for i equals to 1, p equals to 0 plus 1. For i equals to 2, p equals to 1 plus 2. For i equals to k, p equals to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 dot 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 plus k. If we assume p is greater than n, then this loop will stop. When we see p is greater than n, this loop will stop. Okay, now here p equals to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus so on. So here we get from this equation k times k plus 1 divided 2 k square plus k divided 2. Now here k square plus k divided 2 equals to p. So k square plus k divided 2 is greater than n. When we find out this condition, the loop will stop executing. Now here we will take the degree from this equation that is k square. So we will we'll discard this part k and 2. So you get here k square greater than n. For random analysis, we will consider only the degree of a equation. And here we get k equals to root over n. So we find out our time complexity of this algorithm is root over n. So the time complexity of this algorithm is O of root over n. And the space complexity is constant because we are not using any additional space. Hope you have understood how to find out time complexity of an algorithm. In the next video, we'll see more examples. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to see how to find out complexity of an algorithms. For example, if you're given this algorithm, you have to find out the complexity of this algorithm.
time complexity and space complexity. First, we break down the iteration of this loop. For first iteration, i equals to 1. Then for second iteration, i equals to 2 to the power 1. Then for third iteration, i equals to 2 to the power 3. Then for kth iteration, i equals to 2 to the power k. Because we are multiplying the value of i by 2 in each iteration. Inside here we have a statement. This statement will take constant time complexity. Now how we can find out the time complexity of this problem? Here we see for kth iteration i equals to 2 to the power k. If we found i is greater than or equals to n, then this loop will stop executing. So here we have find out i equals to 2 to the power k where k means kth iteration that means the last iteration of this loop where the loop where the loop stop its execution so we can say 2 to the power k greater than equals to n and here if we take log 2 on the both side then we get k equals to log 2n and this is the time complexity of this algorithm so the time complexity of this algorithm is o of log 2n and the space complexity is constant because we're not using any additional space. Hope you have understood how to find out the time complexity of this algorithm. Now let's take another example. For example, if you're given this algorithm, we're starting i from n until i is greater than or equals to 1 and in each iteration we're dividing i by 2. Here we break down the iteration of this for loop. For first iteration i equals to n divided 2 to the power 0 we can assume okay so for first iteration i equals to n then for second iteration i equals to n divided 2 to the power 1 for third iteration i equals to n divided 2 to the power 2 here we are not showing n divided 2 to the power 0 for kth iteration it takes n divided 2 to the power k now if we see one is greater than i whenever this for loop find out one is greater than i then it will stop its execution. Here we have find out i equals to n divided 2 to the power k for kth iteration. So here we can replace i with n divided 2 to the power k. And if we solve this expression, then we get greater than log 2n. So this is our time complexity of this algorithm. So the time complexity of this algorithm is O of log 2n. And the space complexity is constant because we're not using any additional space. Now let's take another example. We have i equals to 0, then i times i less than n, then i plus plus. Here we have the condition i times i less than n. Here if we assume i times i equals to n, then this loop will stop. Okay, for the last iteration, i times i equals to n. Here i times i equals to i square, so i square equals to n, so i equals to root over n so i equals to root over n so the time complexity of this algorithm is o of root over n and the space complexity is big of one because you are not using any additional space we're just using some variables now let's take another example for example let's say we're given this algorithm first we have for i equals to zero i less than n i plus plus we have here for z equals to zero z less than n z plus plus we know that this algorithm takes big of n time complexity and this algorithm takes big of n time complexity from the previous explanation. What is the time complexity of this algorithm? Okay, this algorithm uses this two for loop. If we add the time complexity of this two for loop, we get big of 2n. For a time complexity analysis, we'll reject or discard the constant part. Here 2 is constant. So the time complexity of this algorithm is big of n. We're not considering the constant part. So the time complexity is big of n and the space complexity is big of 1. Now let's take another example. We have here nested for loop. For this for loop, we have here i equals to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. For this for loop, z equals to 1, z less than n, z equals to z times 2. So here we see we're incrementing by 1 and here we're incrementing by multiplying the value of j by 2. From previous example, we saw that this algorithm will take logarithmic time complexity and for these algorithms, takes linear time complexity. 
because here we're iterating from 0 to n minus 1. For each iteration of this loop, this loop will take logarithmic time complexity. For n iteration of this loop, this inner loop will take n log n time complexity. Here we're not saying for nth iteration of this outer loop, we're saying for n iteration, okay? If this loop iterate n times, then it will take big of n log n time complexity. So the time complexity is n log n. So for one iteration of outer loop, inner loop takes log n time complexity. This is simple math, okay? For n iteration of the outer loop, the inner loop will take log of n log of n time complexity. So the time complexity of this algorithm is big of in login and the space complexity is big of one because we're not using any additional space. Hope you've understood how to find out time complexity of an algorithms. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we're going to talk about what is an array and why we need an array. Array is a data structure that contains a group of elements is element identified by array index and array is stored such that the position of each element can be computed from its index cell by a mathematical formula. This is the formal definition of array. Array will store a group of elements and we can access any of the element in constant time using the index number. Array has some properties. Array can store data of same type. Array cannot store the data of different type. It only can store the data of same type. Array has contiguous memory location and we'll talk about in details in this section of this course. Then the next property is the array index start with zero. Then the next property is the size of array need to be specified mandatorily and cannot be modified. So the array size is constant. We can't change the size of array after a declaration. This is an example of array. We have here eight elements and here we have index number. Using the index number, we can access any of the array element in constant time. The length of this array is eight and we see the index start from zero. The index of first element is zero. The index of second element is 1, then 2, then so on and so forth. Now you might ask why we need an array. Before answering your question, let me ask you a question. We want to store 1 million similar data types in computer memory. Then what you will do? How you will store 1 million similar data types in computer memory? You might say we will declare primitive data structures like integer, float, boolean, etc. Now the problem arises, how will you maintain such a huge list of variables? You have to do a lot of works. The solution to this problem is that we'll declare an array of size 1 million. We'll store 1 million elements in an array and we can access any of the element by index number in constant time. We don't have to maintain a huge list of variables. This is an example of an array and the length of this array is 8 and we have index number from 0 to 7. We can access any of the element in constant time using the index number. If we have an array of a length 1 million, we can access any of the array element from that array using the index number in constant time. Now let's take an example. Let's say we want to store 100 integer from 1 to 100 in computer memory then what you will do you might tend to create 100 variables to store the integer from 1 to 100 and that will take a lot of works and that's not efficient if you have to declare 100 a variable then you have to maintain the list of variables and that will need a lot of works instead doing that you can declare an array of length 100 and you can assign the integer to the array 
and that will take less work and you can access any of the array element by the index number and that's super efficient this is why we should use array instead of variables this is an example of the array and the length of this array is 100 1 2 3 4 5 6 dot dot door then 100 we have index number from 0 to 99 we can access any of the array element from this array using the index number here we are using dot 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 uh, we can't show you the 100 element in this array for the display side anyway hope you have understood what is an array and why we should use array thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about different types of array there are two types of array one dimensional array and multi-dimensional array in this video and in this course we'll talk about two dimensional array we'll not talk about three four or five dimensional array for most of the cases we use one dimensional array and two dimensional array as multi-dimensional array in this video and in this course we'll talk about 2d array this is an example of one dimensional array and this is an example of a 2d array now let's talk about one dimensional array in details in one dimensional array each element is represented by a single subscript the elements are stored in consecutive memory location we'll see how are elements stored in computer memory in the next video this is an example of an array we have declared an array of length 8 the size of this array is 8 and here we have 8 elements this array will be represented something like this we have index number from 0 to 7 and we have the array element from 1 to 8 if we say array 1 and here in between this bracket we have 1 this is index number so at index 1 we have the element 2 so it will return 2 if we say here array 4 then what it will return instead 1 if we say array 4 then it will return 5 because at index 4 we have the value 5 if we say here array 7 then what it will return it will return this value 8 because at index 7 we have the value 8 hope you have understood the concept of one dimensional array now let's talk about two dimensional array in two dimensional array each element is represented by two subscript a two dimensional array m by n has m rows and n columns and contains m times n elements and this is an example of 2d array array it has three rows and four columns and this array will be represented something like this this is row we have three row and we have four column we have index number of is row and column now here if we say array one two here one means here one means the row index and two means the column index here at row one this is row one and column two so at row one and at column two we have the value 40 so it will return 40 if we say array two one at row two and at column one we have the value 300 so it will return 300 and if we say array two three at row three at column three we have the value 500 so it's written the value 500 this is two dimensional array and this is how we can access any array element in two dimensional array let's say we want to get the element 2 then what do we have to do we have to say array 0 0 at row 0 at column 0 we have the value 2 if we want to get the value 3 from this two dimensional array then we will say array 0 1 first the index of row then the index of columns hope you have understood the concept of two dimensional array and one dimensional array thanks for watching this video 
I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about how array is stored in random access memory. First, we're going to talk about how 1D array is stored in computer memory. Then we'll talk about how 2D array is stored in computer memory. Now let's talk about one dimensional array. This is an example of array. The size of this array is 8 and we have here 8 elements. This is the representation of this array. We have index number with the index number we can access any of the array element in constant time. Now let's say this is our computer memory. I mean this is our random access memory. And we assume that this memory is empty. Now how this array will be stored in computer memory? Computer memory is the collection of a block okay in each block our array element will be stored the array element will be stored the array element first will be converted to binary then the binary equivalent will be stored to the computer memory for sake of understanding we're going to store the decimal value so you might say the array element will be stored something like this one will be here two will be here then 4 will be here, 5 here, then 6 here, 7, 8. We might assume the array element will be stored something like this. In the definition of array, we see that array element will be stored in consecutive memory location, one after another. So the array element will not be stored something like this. It will be stored in contiguous manner one after another the array element will be stored something like this one then two then three then four then five six seven eight we see that the array element is stored in consecutive memory locations one after another first block at the first block we have this value one then in the second block we have this value two then three then four then five six seven eight we see that array is stored in consecutive memory location, one after another. This is how array is represented in computer memory. For sake of understanding, we are just storing the integer value. Actually, the array element will be converted to a binary equivalent and the binary equivalent will be stored in the computer memory in consecutive memory location, something like this. Hope you have understood how one dimensional array is stored in computer memory. Now let's talk about how two-dimensional array is stored in computer memory. This is an example of 2D array. Three rows, three rows, two columns. And this array will be represented something like this. You might assume the array will be stored something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. You might think the inner array will be stored in consecutive memory location, but not the whole array. That's not two. The 2D array will not be represented something like this. This array will be stored in consecutive memory location. First 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. They'll be represented something like this. 1 will be stored here, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. They'll be stored something like this. This is how 2D array is stored in computer memory. This is the fundamentals. Hope you have understood the concept of how array is stored in random access memory thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about how we can create 1d array in the declaration statement we'll create a reference to an array then we'll instantiate in the instantiation phrase we'll create an array then initialization. In the initialization phrase, we will initialize values to the array. Now let's see how we can declare, how we can instantiate and how we can initialize an array. First, let's talk about the declaration of an array. For a declaration phrase, first the data type, then the bracket, the square bracket, then the name of the array. Something like this int, this square bracket, then the name of the array, in this case, the name of the array is nums. Then we're going to instantiate the array. 
in the instantiation fetch we will create a reference to our original array new data types then the side something like this nums equals to new int for here we have created an array and we assigned that array to this variable nums and we have a reference of this array here then we're going to initialize the array at index 0 we're going to insert 1 at index 1 we're going to insert 2 at index 2 we're going to insert 3 and at and at index 3 we're going to insert 4 we can declare instantiate and initialize the array in one statement something like this int square bracket then the name of the array equals to the curly braces and the array elements this array will be represented something like this 1 2 3 4 and we have here index number 0 1 2 3 this is how we can create 1d array the declaration of an array will take constant time the instantiation also will take constant time and this all operations the insertion operation will take constant time and if the length of the array is n then all the insertion will take bigger of in time complexity and if we declare initialize and instantiate the array in one statement it will take bigger of one time complexity hope you have understood how we can create 1d array thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about how we can traverse an array let's say we're given this array of size 8 here we have 8 elements this array will be represented something like this we have your index number with the index number we can access any of the array element in constant time now let's see how we can traverse this array element traversing means simply visiting uh, this is your given array this array will be represented something like this and then we have here our for loop for i from 0 to the length of the array minus 1 and this is for index for this array this loop will iterate from 0 to 7 that's why we have here length of the array minus 1 then we're just printing the value of current element for first iteration the value of i is 0 so it will print 1 then for second iteration the value of i is 1 it will print 2 then for third iteration the value of i is 2 it will print 3 then for the next iteration it will print 4 5 6 7 and 8 whenever we raised to this index this loop will stop for the next iteration the value of i will be evaluated 8 and that's out of this array boundary so we're done with this array and this is our traversing result 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 this is how we can traverse an array this is 1d array it's pretty simple by using a for loop we can traverse the array now let's talk about the time complexity for the array declaration it will take constant time complexity for this for loop it will take big of in time complexity where n is the length of the given array and then we're just printing the array element and the print operation will take big of one time complexity so the average time complexity is big of n for array traversing so for array traversing the cost is big of n and this is time complexity thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys in this video we're going to see how we can made get insert and update operations in an array let's say we're given this array one two three four five six seven eight this array will be represented something like this now first let's talk about get operations this is a pseudocode for get operations let's say we're given this array we have here eight element from one to eight we have your index number if we call this function get with array and the index number then it will return one because at index number we have the element one at index five we have the element six and index seven we have the element eight and using this return we're just returning the element to the given index so at index seven we have the element eight and this is called a get operations it's pretty simple we have this function then we have this return statement we're passing this array to this function and the index number and then this function will return the value at the given index 
This function takes constant time complexity and this return statement takes constant time complexity as well. And the operational time complexity for this function gate is big of one that means constant time complexity. Now let's talk about insert operation. Let's say we're given this empty array. We have to fill this array. And this is our pseudocode to fill this array. First, if we call this function insert array 0, 1, and here first argument is the array, the second argument is the index number, and the third argument is the value we have to insert. So we'll insert 1 to the first index. Then if we say insert array 1, 2 at index 1, we have to insert 2. Then if we say array 2, 3, at index 2, we have to insert 3. Then at index 3, we have to insert 4. So we have filled this array with this function call. And this operation will take big of 1, that means constant time complexity. And this operation will take big of 1, that means constant time complexity. This is all about insert operation. Now let's talk about update operation. This is a pseudocode for update operations. It's super simple. Let's say we're given this array. We want to update the value in this array. If we say update r05 at index 0, we're going to at index 0, we're going to replace that element with 5. So let's replace 1 with 5. Then if we say update r16 at index 1, we're going to replace 2 with 6. Then if we say update r27 at 2, we're going to replace 3 with 7. Again, if we say update r38 at index 3, we're going to replace 4 with 8. And this is called update operations in an array. This update operation will take constant time complexity and this operation will also take constant time complexity. This is all about update operations. We can update any array limit by the index number, something like this array index equals to value. Now we're going to talk about delete operation. Delete operation is super simple. Initially when we construct an array in Java, by default we have the array element is zero. If we replace any of the array element with zero, that means we deleted the element. Let's see how we can make the operation that's, and that's similar to update operations. We're just replacing the element with zero. If we say delete array index zero, so we'll just replace one with zero. Initially, when we declare an array, we have all the array element zero. If we say again array one delete, so we'll delete at two, so we'll replace two with zero. If we say delete array two, then we'll replace three with zero. If we say again array three, we'll replace four with zero and this is called delete operations in an array and this operation will take constant time complexity and this is all about get insert update and delete operation in an array thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about sourcing algorithms binary search and linear search First, we'll see how linear source works, then we'll see how binary source works. Then we'll explain the runtime complexity of binary source log 2n and that we will see in the last part of this video. For linear source, we'll scan the array from left to right, one by one, and that will take speaker of n time complexity. And that's super simple, we'll not show you the code for linear search. We'll just show you how linear search works. We can do that by using a simple for loop for i from 0 to the length of the array. And then we can check if we found any of the element at any of the index is masked. Then we'll return that index. And for binary search, we'll see every bit of information you need to understand binary search. And we can do binary search only for sorted array. We can do linear search for any type of array. And in this video, we will focus on binary search and how binary search works and everything you need to understand binary search algorithms. Also, we'll talk about linear search algorithms. Now, let's talk about linear search. Then we'll talk about binary search. For example, if you're given this array and a target 34, 
we have to find out the index of the target element. If the target element does not exist in the array, we should return minus 1. If this target exists in the array, we should return the index of that element. You might assume that the given array always is sorted. We can solve this problem using linear search pretty easily by checking the array element one by one. Let's see how linear search actually works. First, we will check the first element 1. Does 1 equals to 34? No. So let's go to the next element. Does 3 equals to 34? No. Let's go to the next element. Does 5 is equals to 34? No. Let's go to the next element. Does 8 is equals to 34? No. Let's go to the next element. 12 is not equals to 34. Let's go to the next element. Now we see that the current element is equals to target. So in this case, we will return the index 5. And this is called linear search algorithm. Linear search will take big of n time complexity because for worst case, we have to traverse each element once. So the time complexity is big of n. Linear search is not an efficient algorithm to search an element in an array. Now let's talk about a binary search and how binary search works. Okay, now we're going to talk about binary search. Our target is 34. Now we have to search this target in this array in logarithmic time complexity. Don't worry about logarithmic time complexity. We'll talk about in details. First, what we're going to do? We're going to find the middle element in this array. The middle element is 8. Now our goal is to check, does 8 equals to target? No. Now we're going to check, does 8 less than target? Yes, it is. If the middle is less than target, then we will discard all the element on the left, including the middle element. Alright, so we discarded the left portion. Now let's find out middle in this array. The middle is 34. And we see that we found that target in this array. In this case, we have to return the indices of this element 34. Alright, and this is how actually binary search works. Don't worry, we'll see how we can find the middle element. We are given this array and target equals to 34. If we divide this array by its middle element, then this will be like this. Then if we divide this sub array using this middle element 3, then we get like this, okay? Then if we divide this sub array by this middle element, then we get like this, okay? Now, we see that this is a binary search tree. Now, how this actually works? Now, let me ask you a question. How do you search a target value in a binary search tree? First, you check the value of node and the target value. If the target value is greater than the value of node, then we will go to the then we will go to the right subtree. If we see the target is less than the value of node, then we will move to the left subtree. And we keep doing that process until we found our target value. Okay. Now let's search 12 to this binary search tree. First, we're gonna check 8 and 12. Does 12 is greater than 8? Yes, it is. So let's go to the right subtree. Now let's check this target and this value 34. We see target is less than 34. So we'll go to the left subtree. And we found this element. Do you see here? We found 12 by 3 step. Okay. 1 step, 2 step, 3 step. We don't have to visit all elements. We're just visiting 3 elements. Okay. Now let's see how we can find a target value 5 in the binary search tree. We have here target equals to 5. First we're going to check 8 and 5. Does target is greater than 8? No. So let's go to the left subtree. Does 5 is greater than 3? Yes it is. So let's go to the right subtree. And we found this value 5. And this is how we can search a target value in a binary search tree. Binary search algorithm works exactly like this. Now let's see how we can find the index of our target element in an array. We're going to find out the index for target 34. Okay, first we're going to declare 
to point a left and right left point to the first element and right point to the last element then we're going to find the middle and this is our middle how we can find middle we can find middle by doing a simple formula left plus right divided 2 0 plus 6 divided 2 3 so this is our middle now we're going to check does the target is greater than this middle yes it is so we'll move the left pointer to middle plus 1 so left pointer will point to this element 12 now our goal is to find the middle for this array okay so 4 plus 6 divided 2 5 so 34 is our middle now we're going to check does target equals to 34 yes it is so we'll return the index of this target so we'll return the index of this element that is 5 and this is how we can search an element in an array using binary search and how many step we have done so we found 34 by 2 step just by 2 step we don't have to traverse the entire array to find a value we found 34 by doing 2 step this middle and this middle and this is how we can search an element in an array using binary search now let me show you how this actually works using sudo code first we're going to declare a function search that takes an array and a target as input the array always is sorted array binary search doesn't work for unsorted array the array must be sorted then we're going to declare to point a left and right left point to the first element right point to the last element then we're going to run a while loop until left is less than or equals to right then we're going to calculate mid left plus right divided two then we're going to check if the middle element is our target then we will return index of the middle element if not we will check if the target is greater than the middle element then we will move left pointer to the next up middle if not then we will move the right pointer to the left up middle at the end if we haven't found this element target in the array we will return minus one now let's see how this works we're given this array and a target value 34 we have to find the index of this value 34 in this array first we're going to declare to pointer left and right then we're going to find the middle and 8 is the middle then we're going to check does the middle element equals to our target element no 8 is not equals to 34 then we're going to check if target is greater than the middle element then we'll move left to the next up middle and we see that 34 is greater than 8 so we'll move left to the next of middle then we're going to calculate middle for this subarray okay and the middle in this case 34 now we see that 34 is equals to target so we will return middle so we will return the index 5 if we see a target value doesn't exist in this array we'll just return minus 1 if the target is does not exist in the given array then this if condition will never be evaluated true for this input it will return 5 5 is the index of the value 34 that is our target as well now let's see the time complexity for this problem for first iteration the length of the array is n where n is the length of the given array and we can rewrite this like this n divided 2 to the power 0 for second iteration the length of the array will be n divided 2 because each time we're dividing the array by two halves for third iteration n divided 4 then for fourth iteration n divided 8 we're dividing the given array by two halves each time for kth iteration the length will be n divided 2 to the power k after k division the length of the array will be 1 in that kth the left pointer right pointer and middle pointer will point to the same element then length of array for kth iteration will be 1 then if we do this math then we will get this time complexity big of log 2n all right guys so the solution will take big of log 2n time complexity and constant space complexity hope this concept was clear if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about how we can create 2d array in order to create 2d array first we have to declare in the declaration phrase we're going to create a reference to an array then in the instantiation phrase we'll create an array then we'll initialize 
Then in the initialization phrase, we'll assign values to the array. In the declaration phrase, we'll declare an array something like this data type. Then the square bracket, two square bracket here. Then the array name, since this is two dimensional array. This is an example of array declaration int square bracket square bracket then the name of the array in the instantiation phrase we'll create an array and we'll assign that array to the reference of array declaration and this is the example nums equals to new int 3 2 3 is number of row and 2 is number of column and this is the example of 3 rows and 2 columns to the array to the array is also called matrix then in the initialization phrase we will assign the value to the 2d array something like this we have at index 0 at row index 0 and column index 0 we have value 1 at row index 0 column index 1 we have value 2 at row index 1 column index 0 we have 3 then at row index 1 column index 1 we have value 4 at row index 2 column index 0 we have 5 at row index 2 and column index 1 we have 6 or you can declare instantiate and initialize using one statement something like this and this is similar to this step this is shortened this is how we can create a 2d array now let's the time complexity this operation takes constant time for the declaration of array then for creating the array it will take also constant time then we're going to instantiate of the array. Then we're initializing the array. Here is operation will take speak of one time complexity. That means it will take constant time complexity. And here we see we have six steps. We take here six operations. We have here six operations. So the overall time complexity is big of row times call. Here we see 3 times 2 equals to 6 and here we have 6 operations. Or if we declare, instantiate and initialize the array in one statement then it will take constant time complexity. Hope you have understood the concept how we can create 2D array. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to made get insert and update operations in 2d array let's say we're given this array this array will be represented something like this we have three rows and two columns now let's talk about get operation this is the code for get operation this function takes array and row index and column index and it will return whatever value we have at the row index and column index let's say we're given this array if we say array 0 1 this array means this array and at row index 0 and at column index 0 we have the value 2 so it's written 2 then at row index 1 and at column index 1 we have the value 4 so it will return value 4 then at row index 2 and column index 0 it will return the value 5 this function will take speak of 1 time complexity and this operation also takes constant time complexity so the overall time complexity is bigger of 1 now let's talk about insert operation this is our function insert it takes array then the row index then column index and a value that we have to insert then we have here this array then row index column index equals to val let's say we're given this empty 2d array we have to fill this array with some value if we say insert r00 at row index 0 column index 0 we have to insert 1 so here we'll insert 1 then at row index 0 column index 1 we have to insert 2 then at row index 1 column index 0 we have to insert 3 then at row index 1 at column index 1 we have to insert 4 then at row index 2 at column index 0 we have to insert 5 then at row index 2 and column index 1 we have to insert 6 and this is how we can insert element to 2d array this insert operation will take speak of one time complexity and this operation also takes speak of one time complexity and if we add all the operations then it will take speak of row times column time complexity since we have here functions so the time complexity for this functions is 
because one because it takes because it's doing one operation at a time no matter what if we use a loop to insert the value then it will take big of m times n time complexity where m is the number of rows and n is the number of columns and let's talk about update operation this is our array and this is our code this is our code to made update operation if we say update 00, 0 at row index 0 at column index 0 we're going to update the value with 7 then if we say update r 18 at row index 1 column index 1 we're going to replace this 2 with 8 or we're going to update with 8 if we say 20 at row index 2 at column index 0 we're going to update with 9 so let's update this 5 with 9 if we say 1 1 10 at row index 1 at column index 1 we're going to update with 10 so here we'll update this value with 10 and this is how we can make update operations and the update operations will take speaker of one time complexity and this operation also takes speaker of one time complexity these are constant this will take constant time complexity this is how we can update an element to a 2d array all right guys thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see how we can traverse 2d array let's say we're given this array of three rows and two columns and this array will be represented something like this one two three four five six we have the column index and we have the row index now let's see how we can traverse this array this is our pseudo code to traverse the array this function takes the array then we have the rows rows equals to nums length and it will return the number of rows we have then columns it return the length of the column and then we're running a loop for i from 0 to row minus 1 rows minus 1 here we have three rows so length of rows is 3 so 3 minus 1 is 2 so we'll iterate from 0 to 2 then we have this inner loop in this inner loop we have for j from 0 to calls minus 1 so it will iterate from 0 to 1 and then we're just printing the current element here we have the iteration we break it down the iteration i equals to 0 j equals to 0 so for i equals to 0 j equals to 0 it will print 1 then for i equals to 0 j equals to 1 it will print 2 then i equals to 1 j equals to 0 it will print 3 then i equals to 1 j equals to 1 it will print 4 here i is the index of row and j is the index of column so i1 means the index of row so is 1 that is that is 1 and z equals to 1 means the index of column and that is 1 so 1 1 here we see 4 then for i equals to 2 and z equals to 0 we have 5 then for i equals to 2 z equals to 1 we have this element 6 and this is how we can traverse 2 d array this is super simple Hope you've understood how we can traverse 2D array. This is our code. I will attach the source code to this video. You can check it out. Now let's see the time complexity. Now we have to calculate the time complexity for this function. This operation will take constant time. This operation will take constant time. And this loop will take big of row time. And this loop will take big of call time complexity. And this operation will take big of one that means constant time complexity now for one iterations of this loop this loop will iterate calls times that means number of column times if we have column equals to three for each iteration of this loop this loop will iterate three times so simply we can do a math here for complexity analysis, let's assume the row equals to 3 and column equals to 2. For one iterations of this loop, the inner loop will execute 2 times, since the columns is 2. Then for 3 iterations of this outer loop, the inner loop execute 6 times. Simply you can say, if this loop will execute once, the inner loop will execute columns times so we can see here c 
or if the outer loop is execute r times when r is unknown then the inner loop will be execute c times r all right so we can say the time complexity is bigger of columns times row or row times columns so the time complexity for this algorithm is bigger of row times column hope you've understood the time complexity analysis and it will just print the element it will not cost any extra space so it will takes constant space complexity all right guys thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video in this video we're going to solve a 1d array problem move zeros given an array nums write a function to move all the zeros to the end of it while maintaining the relative order of the non-zero element we have to solve this problem in pledge we can't use any extra space uh, if you're given this array we have to shift all the zero to the right end by maintaining the relative orders of non-zero elements so the array will be represented something like this uh, here we have the non-zero element and we have shifted the and we have shifted zero to the right end if you're given this import then what we should return right so first we have one then we have three then we have twelve then zero then zero okay we should return this error how we can solve this problem also we have to solve this problem in bigger of n time complexity okay let's see how i think about this problem if you're given this particular array then we'll start searching the non-zero element here we see non-zero element one so we'll replace this element at zeroth index so we have at zeroth index value zero so we're going to replace it with the value one okay then we see we have zero then we see non-zero element so then we're going to reflect the element at index one okay so we're going to replace this one with three all right then we see 12 is also non-zero element so we're going to reflect this zero with 12. then we see we're left with the two element then we're going to just replace the two element with zeros okay and this is our modified array right and this is how we're going to solve this problem now let's see pseudo code first i'm going to declare a function move zeros that takes an array nums for sake of understanding let's assume this is our given array then we have a variable current equals to zero it will point to the first element in our array right so it will point right over here then we're going to run a loop for i from zero to len nums minus one then we're going to check if the current element is equals to zero for first duration of this loop we see the element is zero so this condition is not match then for next iteration we have one right so this condition match then what we're going to do we're going to just change this zero to one okay so let's replace this zero with one all right then we're going to change current to this element right over here for next iteration we have zero so this condition is false then for next iteration we have three right so this condition is match then we're going to reflect this one with this three then we're going to change the current to this element all right current will point right over here then we have the next element 12 so it matches this if statement then it reflects this zero with 12 okay so we're done with this loop now let's fill up this two element with zeros for that we have another loop here for i from current to len nums minus one okay then nums i equals to zero 
so it will replace this element with zero and also it will replace this element with zero all right at the end we have this modified array and that is our answer right this is our solution to this problem the solution will take big of in time complexity where n is the length of the given array and it also takes constant space complexity hope this concept was clear if you have any suggestion if you have any question let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're gonna solve a coding interview problem remove duplicates from sorted array this is one dimensional array problem given a sorted array nums remove the duplicates in place such that each element appears only once and return the new length the problem statement bit of confusing for example if you are given this array what you have to return you have to return five because in this array we have total five distinct element and we have to shift all the distinct element and we should have all the distinct element from left to right no matter how much distinct element we have in the array in this array we have five distinct element one two three four five and the five distinct element we should have in the left of this array and the size of this array is eight but but the size of the distinct element in this array is five from index zero to four we have here five element there is no repeating element we have to solve this problem in pledge we can't use any extra space and we know that the array size is fixed we can't change the array size so we have to change the value in this array in fledge on the left with the distinct element we don't have to worry about whatever element we have on the right side we have to care the distinct element on the left from left okay if you're given this array we have to modify this array something like this and we have to return the length of the array for the distinct element now hope you have understood the problem now let's see how we can solve this problem all right let's say we're given this array to solve this problem we're going to use two pointer i pointer will point to the first element and the z pointer will point to the second element initially now what we're going to do we're going to check the value of this two pointer i pointer pointing to this element one and j pointer pointing to this element one and the value are the same if the value are the same we'll move z pointer to the next element so let's move z to the next element in this case we see that the value where i and z pointer is pointing are not the same if we found the value are not the same then we'll move i to the next element and we'll replace the value of i pointer with the value of j pointer so we'll replace one with two so let's replace one with two then in the next iterations we're going to move the j pointer to the next element so let's move z to the next element and we see that the value of i and j pointer are not the same so let's move i to the next element and let's replace the value of i pointer with j pointer with the value of j pointer so let's replace two with three and let's move z to the next element now we see that the value of i and j pointer are the same so let's move j to the next element that is four four and three are not the same so let's move i to the next element and let's replace the value of i pointer with the value of j pointer so let's replace this value with four now let's move j to the next element and that is five five and four are not the same so let's move i to the next element and let's replace the value of this element three with five now let's move i to the next element and we see the value five and five are the same so nothing need to be done here let's move z to the next and z is out of array boundary so we're done now we see that our left part is sorted and on the left part we have no duplicates no repetitions and the length of this is four so if we say i plus one and that will be the length of the array on the left okay so the length of this array is five from index zero to four and we have to modify the given array something like this and we have to return the new length of this subarray 
and here we have no distinct element this is how we can solve this problem now let's see how we can implement this solution using pseudocode all right this is our pseudocode to solve this problem first with this function remove duplicate it takes the array as input then we're checking if the length of the array is zero then we'll return zero then we're initializing i pointer i will point to the first element then we're initializing another pointer inside this for loop so j will point to this element one and then we'll iterate from this element to the very end using this for loop then we're checking if the value of i and j are not the same we see they are same so let's move z to the next element so j will point to this element and we see that one and three are not the same so let's move i to the next and let's replace the value of so let's replace the value of this element with three for the next iterations let's move j to the next element and that will point to the element three right over here so j is now pointing to this element three and we see three and three are the same so let's move j to the next element again and here we see three and five are not the same so let's move i to the next element i will point here and we're going to replace the value of i with five so let's replace this three with five in the next iterations we're going to move j to the next element let's move to the next on the next we have no element we're out of array boundary and this follow-up stuff here since we are out of the array boundary here we see we have no reputations of element and the length is three so the index of i is two so two plus one is three so this function will return three for this given array and this is how we can solve this problem if you're not understanding i'll highly encourage you to go through with your own examples then it will make sense uh, this is my solution to this problem this solution will take bigger of in time complexity or n is the length of the given array because we're traversing the array from left to right once and the solution will take constant space complexity since we're modifying the array in flat we're not allocating any extra space to solve this problem so the time complexity is bigger of n or order of n and the space complexity is and the space complexity is order of one that means the solution takes constant space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video welcome back to this video now we're going to solve very popular coding interview question rotate image here's the problem statement you're given an n by n 2d matrix representing an image rotate the image by 90 degrees clockwise but the constraint to this problem is that we have to rotate the image in place which means we have to modify the input 2d matrix directly we cannot allocate another 2d matrix to do the rotation all right and this is the problem statement and this is the constraint to this problem if you are given this particular matrix as input then we have to rotate this matrix by 90 degree clockwise so this first column will be our first row in our rotated matrix the second column will be our second row this third column will be our third row and this will be like this okay so this column is our first row this column is our second row and this column is our third row okay if you are given four by four order matrix like this if we rotate this matrix clockwise by 90 degree then this first column will be our first row in the rotated matrix this second column will be our second row this third column will be our third row and this fourth column will be our fourth row so if we rotate this matrix by 90 degree clockwise then we will see this matrix so here you see this is our first row this is our second row this is our third row and this is our fourth row okay now how we can solve this problem all right let's suppose that you are given this array as input first what we're going to do is that we're going to flip this matrix at the second diagonal this is our second diagonal if we flip this matrix at the second diagonal then these two value will be exchanged so 
4 will go here and 8 will go here then this 2 value will be exchanged 9 will go here and 2 will go here then finally 2 and 6 okay so 6 will go here 2 will go here all right after flipping this matrix at second diagonal we'll get this matrix does this matrix 90 degree rotated clockwise no so this matrix still not rotated how we can rotate it actually okay in order to rotate it we have to do one more operation in this matrix we have to flip this matrix horizontally and this is the middle right so we have to flip this matrix at this middle horizontally so this two value will be exchanged in between then this two value will be exchanged in between and this two value three and one will be exchanged in between so here seven will go here nine will go here four will go here six will go here one will go here and three will go here okay then we'll get this matrix and this is clockwise 90 degree rotated matrix that we have to return okay and we have to do this all operation in flat we can't allocate another 2d matrix to solve this problem all right basically we're going to flip the matrix at second diagonal then we're going to flip the flipped matrix horizontally so first we have to flip at second diagonally then we have to flip horizontally okay if you are given 4 by 4 order matrix how you can rotate this matrix so this is our second diagonal for this matrix right so we have to flip this matrix at this diagonal then this two value will be exchanged in between then this two value 2 and 12 will be exchanged then 5 and 16 will be exchanged then this two value 1 and 7 will be exchanged then 9 and 10 will be exchanged in between then 4 and 6 will be exchanged in between when you flip this matrix at diagonally then we will get this matrix we see that this is not 90 degree clockwise rotated matrix in order to get the 90 degree clockwise rotated matrix we have to flip this matrix horizontally so this is the middle if we flip this matrix then this 12 and this 14 will be exchanged then 6 and 3 all right then 8 and 4 then 9 and 1 so 12 will go here 14 will go here 6 will go here 3 will go here then 8 and 4 then 9 and then 9 and 1 then we have to exchange to 16 and 15 then 7 and 13 then 10 and 2 at the end even and 5 and this is our matrix in order to get this matrix we flipped the given matrix first by second diagonal then we flipped that second diagonal flipped matrix horizontally then we get this matrix and this is our answer okay and that's how we can solve this problem now let me show you how we can solve this problem using pseudo code okay let's assume this this is our given matrix and this matrix are uh, diagonally flipped and this matrix horizontally flipped okay first we're going to declare a function rotate that takes the given matrix as input then we're going to flip the matrix diagonally this is the function okay flip diagonally this takes this matrix as input then here we have this function definition flip diagonally matrix then we have here two loop this loop will start iterating from zero until the length minus one of the given matrix and j equals to from zero to length of matrix minus i minus one okay don't worry we don't get it so for first iterations of this loop the value of i and j is zero so it points to one all right now our goal is to find the index of this value 9 so how we can do that for that we have your matrix length of this matrix minus j minus 1 so that we evaluated 2 length is 3 minus j j is 0 minus 1 so 2 so it points to this last nested array here right and then we're going to get the last value here so length matrix minus i minus 1 so we're going to flip this 2 okay then this 1 will be replaced by 9 then we have your current equals to this value 1 so we're going to just replace this 9 by 1 so it will be 1 so our diagonal value remaining as it is then for next iteration of this loop so it will point to this array and 0 points to the last here by this rule here so then we're going to flip 2 and 6 so 2 will be at here and 6 will be at here okay then for next iteration j becomes 2 so in this case 
it will point to this value 3 and here also you have 3 so we're going to replace this 3 by 3 so it remain as it is for the next iteration of this loop it points to this nested array okay then for the first iteration here we have a zero right and here will be i equals to one okay so in this case what we're going to do here is that we're going to exchange this two four and eight so eight will be at here four will be at here okay so we're done with this flip diagonally matrix then we're going to flip this matrix horizontally and this is the horizontal middle right so we're going to flip this two so we have a function here flip horizontal that takes the rotated matrix and here we have function definition flip horizontally that takes the matrix as input then we have two loop here okay the value for this row will remaining as it is so 8 5 and 2 we have this two for loop so i is always just zero for this matrix so it's pointing to the first row then we're going to just exchange the two value here by this formula here so 7 will go here 9 will go here then 4 will be at here then 6 here and then 1 will be at here and 3 will be at here if you are wondering how it actually works just go through this pseudo code and the solution code is attached to this uh, video check the attached code okay and this is my solution to this problem and finally we have this matrix rotated and this solution will take bigger of n squared time complexity where n is the length of the given matrix and it will take constant space complexity because we are modifying the matrix in place. And this is my solution to this problem. Solution code is available for download. Check that out. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to solve a very popular coding interview question, Spiral Matrix. This is a 2D array problem. Given an M by N matrix written all elements of the matrix in spiral order. For example, if you are given this matrix, you have to traverse this matrix in spiral order and you have to return the elements in spiral order. So first we will traverse 1, then 2, then 3, 6, 9, 8, 7, 4, 5. So if you are given this matrix, you have to return this list. And this is the spiral order traversal of this matrix. For example, if you are given this matrix as input you have to traverse this matrix in spiral order and you have to return elements in spiral order traversal so first we'll traverse 1 then 2 then 3 then 4 then 8 12 16 15 14 13 9 5 6 7 11 10 so if you are given this matrix as input you have to return this list and this list we gained by traversing the matrix in spiral order. Now let's take another example. For example, if you're given this matrix as input, we have to traverse this matrix in spiral order and we have to return the list of elements in spiral order traversal. First, we have to traverse 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, 10, 16, 21, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 17, 11, 6, 7, 8, 9, 15, 20, 19, 18, 12, 14. So if you are given this matrix, you have to return this list. We can gain this list by traversing the matrix in spiral order. Now let's see how we can solve this problem. To solve this problem, we are going to use four pointer. Row 1, row 2, column 1 and column 2. Let's see how we can solve this problem. For sake of understanding, let's take an example. Let's say we're given this matrix. We have to traverse this matrix in spiral order and we have to return a list of elements in spiral order. So let's take clear four pointer R1, R2 and C1 and C2. R1 pointer will point to the first row, R2 will point to the last row. C1 will point to the first column and C2 will point to the last column. First, we're going to traverse the first row then the last column then the last row and then the first column let's see how we can do that first we're going to traverse the first row from c1 to c2 from c1 to c2 we have four elements so let's add these four elements to a list using a for loop and this is our list this list now contains four elements we have traversed the first row from c1 to c2 now let's traverse the last column from r1 plus 1 to r2 we have here 
three elements 8 12 and 16 so let's add that element to our list then the list will be represented something like this now we have to traverse the last row for last row traversal we'll traverse from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 so we have here just two elements 15 and 14 so let's add 15 and 14 to our list then the list will be represented something like this then we have to traverse the first column in the first column we have to traverse from r2 to r1 plus 1 from r2 to r1 plus 1 we have three elements 13 9 and 5 so let's add these three elements to our list then our list will be represented something like this so we have traversed first row then the last column then the last row then the first column now let's move c1 to the next and c2 to the left c1 will move here c2 will move here r1 will move here and r2 will move here all right now let's apply the same formula first let's traverse the first row in the first row we're going to traverse from c1 to c2 here we have two elements six and seven let's add that element to our list then the list will be represented something like this then let's traverse the last column from r1 plus 1 to r2 we have here only one element so let's add that element to our list now let's traverse the last row in the last row we have to traverse from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 in that case c1 will be greater than c2 and that's invalid and that will handled when we will go through our pseudocode so we can't traverse the last row in this case now let's traverse the first column in the first column we'll traverse from r2 to r1 plus 1 in that case we have only one element 10 so let's add 10 to our list and this is how we can solve this problem then if we move c1 and c2 c1 will be greater than c2 and here r1 will be greater than r2 and that's invalid and that will handled when we'll go through the pseudo code this is how we can solve this problem so we have traversed this matrix in spiral order something like this hope you have understood how we can solve this problem for better understanding let's take another example let's say we're given this matrix now let's say we can solve this problem for this matrix first let's initialize row one this is r1 r1 will point to the first row then r2 r2 will point to the last row then c1 c1 will point to the first column then c2 c2 will point to the last column first we're going to traverse the first row in the first row we have five elements from c1 to c2 let's add this five element to a list we can do that simply using a for loop from c1 to c2 now let's traverse the last column from r1 plus 1 to r2 we have here four elements 10 16 21 26 let's add that element to our list now let's traverse the last row from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 so in that case we have three elements 25 24 23 so let's add that element to our list in the list will be represented something like this then let's traverse the first column from r2 to r1 plus 1 here we have four elements 24 22 17 11 and 6 let's add that four element to our list then the list will be represented something like this now we're done we have processed two columns and two rows let's move c1 to the next c2 to the left r1 to the bottom and r2 to the top then it will be represented something like this in the row one we have three element unvisited now let's traverse the first row from c1 to c2 we have three element seven eight nine let's add that element to our list then let's traverse the last column here we have two elements from r1 plus 1 to r2 let's add that to our list now let's traverse the last row from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 we have only one element let's add 9 to our list now we have to traverse the first column in the first column we have two elements unvisited from r2 to r1 plus 1 we have two elements 18 and 12 so let's add that to our list now we have only one element 14 let's move c1 right over here c2 right over here r1 right over here and and r2 right over here now c1 c2 is now pointing to this column and r1 r2 is pointing to this column so let's traverse the first row from c1 to c2 we have only one element 14 so let's add 14 to our list now we have to traverse the last column from r1 plus 1 to r2 and that will be invalid 
iron will be greater than r2 and that will handled when we we'll go through the pseudo code all right this is how we can solve this problem so we have traversed this matrix in this spiral order this is the spiral order okay 1 2 3 4 5 10 16 21 26 25 24 23 22 17 11 6 7 8 9 15 20 19 18 12 14 this is how we can solve this problem I hope you have understood the concept now let me show you how we can implement this solution using pseudo code this is the pseudo code to solve this problem first we have this function spiral matrix it takes a matrix as input then we are creating a list this list will store the elements in spiral order then we're checking if the length of the matrix is zero then we're returning the empty list if not then we're declaring r1 r2 r1 will point to the first row r2 will point to the last row then c1 c1 will point to the first column c2 will point to the last column then we're running a loop while loop while r1 is less than or equal to r2 and c1 is less than or equal to c2 then this loop will traverse the first row this loop will traverse the last column then we're checking if we have two rows and two columns then we will traverse the last row then we'll traverse the first column and then we are moving the r1 to the next row r2 to the previous row c1 to the next column and c2 to the previous column and at the end we're returning the list now let's see how it works this is our empty list we created right over here let's suppose that we're given this matrix so r1 will point to this first row and r2 will point to the last row c1 will point to the first column c2 will point to the last column now this while loop is true because r1 is less than r2 and c1 is less than c2 now let's traverse the first row for c from c1 to c2 and we're adding the first row to our list here r1 is constant it points to the first row c is dynamic c will iterate from c1 to c2 so it will add one two three four to our list the list will be represented something like this now let's traverse the last column for r from r1 plus 1 to r2 so we're traversing this column from r1 plus 1 to r2 we have here three elements 8 12 16 here c2 is constant since we're traversing the last column and r is dynamic r is iterating from r1 plus 1 to r2 so it will add 8 12 and 16 to our list then the list will be represented something like this then we're checking if we have two rows and two columns and here we see that r1 and r2 is not pointing to the same rows and c1 and c2 is not pointing to the same column so let's traverse the last row from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 so it will traverse 15 and 14 here we see that r2 is constant because we are traversing the last row and c1 is dynamic it iterating from c2 minus 1 to c1 plus 1 so it will add this two element to our list 15 and 14 then the list will be represented something like this now let's traverse the first column using this for loop for r from r2 to r1 plus 1 and here we see that c1 is constant because you're traversing the first column and r is dynamic r is iterating because you're iterating from r2 to r1 plus 1 so we have here three elements 13 9 and 5 so let's add that element to our list then the list will be represented something like this now we're done with the first iteration of this while loop now we have traversed the first row last row last column and first column now let's move c1 to the next column c2 to the previous column and r1 to the next row r2 to the previous row here we have this formula r1 plus plus r2 minus minus c1 plus plus c2 minus minus so it will be represented something like this now let's traverse this first row from c1 to c2 using this for loop so let's add 6 and 7 to our list now let's traverse the last column from r1 plus 1 to r2 and that will point to this element only one element so let's add element to our list now we're checking this if condition we see that r1 is less than r2 and c1 is less than c2 it means we have at least 
two rows and two columns. Now using this for loop, we're going to traverse the last row. In this formula, we see that C2 minus one, C2 minus one is one, two, C1 plus one, C1 plus one is two. So we're iterating from one to two and that evaluated false. I have attached the source code to this video. Check the source code, then you will see how it evaluated false. Check the source code I have attached to this video, then you will see how this evaluated false. Then let's traverse the first column. In the first column, we're gonna traverse R from R2 to R1 plus one. And we have only one element, so let's traverse 10 and let's add that to our list. And we're done. And again, let's move R1 to the next, R1 will point he here and R2 will point here, C1 will point here and C2 will point here. And that's break this while loop. In that case, R1 is greater than R2 and C1 is greater than C2. And that's why this while loop stop because this condition evaluated false. And at the end, we're returning the list. This is the list. We gained this list by traversing this matrix in spiral order, something like this. This is the spiral order traversal of this matrix. Hope you've understood this video explanation. This solution will take a big O of this solution will take big O of m times n time complexity, where m is the height of the matrix and n is the width of the matrix. Because you're traversing all the elements in the matrix once, no matter what, no matter how much for loop we have here and how much nested for loop and how much nested loop we have here. It will all just take big O of m times n time complexity where m is the height of the matrix and n is the width of the matrix. And the solution will take big O of 1 space complexity if we exclude from our complexity analysis, if we include our output list to the complexity analysis, then the then the space complexity will be big O of m times n where m is the height and it is the width of the given matrix. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you are not understanding this video explanation, uh, if you have any question or if you have any suggestion, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about linked list data structure. Linked list is a dynamic data structure where each element called a node is made up of two items the data and a reference or pointer which points to the next node a linked list is a collection of nodes where each node is connected to the next node through a pointer or a reference this is the formal definition of a linked list data structure for every element we have only one items for linked list elements we have two items one a value or a data and a pointer or a reference okay so a node contains two parts one part is stored the data or a value and the other part is stored the reference or a pointer okay this is node representation okay using this pointer will connect one node with another node this is an example of a linked list the first node is called head and the last node is called tail in this linked list, we have four nodes. The size of this linked list is four. This node is connected by the pointer to this node. This node is connected to this node by this pointer. This node is connected to this node. And this node is connected to null node. That means to nothing. Because null means nothing. There is no existence in computer memory for null node. This is a high level representation of a linked list. The first node is called head. The last node is called tail. This node is stored two items. One is data and one is the address of another node. And the address of this node is 0x001 where head pointer is points to. When you say head, then it means we're calling the nodes of this address. And here this node is connected to this node by this address. And here we're storing the address of this node, here we're storing the address of this node, here we're storing the address of this node, and here we're storing nothing. That means null. This is an example of linked list. I hope you have understood what is a linked list data structure. Now let's talk about linked list versus array. Size of a linked list is not fixed. We can change or modify the size of a linked list during runtime. 
but the site open array is fixed we can't change the site open array during runtime we can't access a node randomly but we can access an element randomly for array we cannot access a node randomly for linked list but for array we can access an element randomly by the index number linked list is stored in non consecutive memory location but the array is stored in consecutive memory location one after another for example this is an array here we have five elements and we have here index number with the, with the index number we can access any of the array element in constant time this is an example of linked list the first node is called head the last node is called tail here we cannot access any node randomly in order to access any nodes we have to traverse the linked list from left to right let's say we want to find the value of this node then we have to say head dot next dot val then we'll get this value so to find out a value of a particular node we have to use a loop but for array we can access that in constant time now let's see how an array and linked list is represented in computer memory this is our array and this is an example of ram or random access memory and it will be stored something like this the element will be first converted into binary the binary equivalent will be stored in the ram but for sake of understanding we're showing the integer representation first it will store one then two then three then four then five this is stored in consecutive memory location so array is stored in consecutive memory location first one then two then three then four then five there is no gap in between now let's see the linked list representation in computer memory this is our given linked list and this linked list will be represented something like this the linked list represented in scatterly it's not represented in consecutive memory location this is our first node one then two then three then four then five this is our head node then this node is connected to this node this node is connected to this node this node is connected to this node and this node is connected to this node and this is called tail and we see that there are many gaps in between each node but for consecutive memory location there is no gap one after another but linked list is represented something like this it can be anywhere in the computer memory and we have link so you can go from one node to another node this is how linked list is represented in computer memory hope you have understood array and linked list representation thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about types of linked list there are four types of linked list single linked list circular singly linked list doubly linked list circular doubly linked list now let's see all of them in details for single linked list we have these types of nodes the nodes contains two items the first item is called value or data and the second item is called pointer or reference to another node this is the formal definition of a single linked list in a single linked list each node in the list stores the data of the node and a reference or pointer to the next node in the list it does not store the reference or pointer to the previous node this is an example of a single linked list each node in single linked list contains two items data and a pointer this is data and this is pointer and this pointer is pointing to this node by this address now let's talk about circular single linked list the circular single linked list are the same as single linked list but with only one difference the end node or the last node in the list is connected to the first node of the linked list something like this the last node is connected to the first node that means the tail is connected to the head node and this is called circular single linked list in single linked list the tail node is connected to a null node that means connected to nothing but for circular single linked list the last node is connected to the first node now let's talk about double linked list in double linked list we have different nodes in double linked list the node contains three items one data and two pointer pre pointer and next pointer pre pointer point to the previous node and next pointer points to the next node 
In doubly linked list, each node contains one data and two reference or pointers that references or points to the previous and next node. This is an example of doubly linked list. This is our head node and the address of this node is this address. This node contains three items, two pointer, pre pointer and next pointer or you could say reference and data and data. For this head node, the pre pointer is pointing to nothing and the next pointer is pointing to this node and for this node, it contains three items, pre pointer pointing to this node and a data and the next pointer, next pointer pointing to this node. For double linked list, we can go forward and backward. But for single linked list, we can only move forward from left to right. But for double linked list, we can move from left to right and also we can move from right to left. Now let's talk about circular double linked list. Circular double linked list exactly same as double linked list, but with only one difference. The last node in the list is connected to the first node and the first node is connected to the last node of the linked list. Something like this. The first node is connected to the last node and the last node is connected to the first node. And this is called circular doubly linked list. Hope you have understood four types of linked list, single linked list, circular single linked list, doubly linked list and circular doubly linked list. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to create a single linked list and let's see how you can create a single linked list. Algorithm to create a single linked list first we'll create a class node with two attributes data and next. Next is a pointer to the next node. Then we'll create another class which has two attributes head and tail. Then we'll create a method add node. Add node method will add new node to the list. And we'll create a method print. Print method will print the nodes present in the list. This is the class node and this is my single linked list class. This is our first class node and this is our my single linked list class. Now let's combine them together. If we combine them together then we get this code. Here we have inside of this class we have a class node. This node represents a node, it contains two properties, int value, we can say also data and a next pointer. Then we have here head node and tail node that points to null node. And then we have here two method add node and we have print. And this is the node, okay? It contains a data, here we have val as data and a next pointer. And we have here null node, okay? This node contains null data and null pointer and head and tail is now pointing to this node. Now let's see the code for add node. We have initially this node head and tail pointing to a null node. Now here we have this method add node it takes a parameter data then we're going to create a new node with the data and the node checking if head equals to null we'll create a new node and we'll attach the head and tail pointer to that node. If not, then we will add the new node to the tail.next and we will move the tail to the newly created node. Let's see how we can do that. If we call this function add node 1, then we will create a node 1 and we will add us here to pointer head and tail since our head is empty initially. Then if we call this function again add node 2, then we will create another node two and then we're going to say tail dot next so we'll add this pointer to this node and we're going to move tail to this node then it will be represented something like this if we call this function add node 3 then we'll create a new node and we'll add this pointer to this node and we'll move tail to this node then it will be represented something like this then again if we call this function add node 4 then we'll create a node 4 and we'll Attach this link to this node. Here we're going to say tail dot next equals to new node. So we're disconnecting this link and we're connecting to this node, and we're going to move tail to this node. Tail equals to new node, and the link list will be represented something like this. So by calling this function four times, we get this link list something like this. Now let's see our print method. How we can traverse this link list and how we can print the node's values. 
this is the code for printing the nodes values print function takes no parameter then we're checking if head equals to null will print empty list and it will exit by this return statement if not then we're creating a current pointer to head node and then we're checking while current is not equals to null we're going to print the current node data and then we're going to move current to the next node until current is a null node initially current pointer is pointing to this head node and now we see this node is not a null node so let's print one now let's move to the next node this node is not a null node so let's print the value of this node by current dot data now let's move to the next node and let's print the value of this node three let's move current to the next node and let's print the value of this node four and we get this output and this is how we can print value of a linked list that means nodes values this function will take speak of in time complexity since we are traversing the linked list from left to right and it will take constant space complexity since you are not using any additional space we are just using a pointer current and here this function will take big o of one time complexity because we are adding the node to the tail in constant time and it will take also constant space complexity because you are inserting one node at a time if we add all of them functions if we consider then it will take big o of in time complexity or n is the number of nodes and here we see this current pointer is pointing to the last node in the next iteration it will point to the null node when it will point to the null node this while loop will stop and this is how we can print the values of nodes all right guys this is all about this video thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about traversing and searching in a linked list in this video we're going to implement this two method traverse and search this method will traverse the linked list from left to right and it will print the nodes values from left to right and this method will return index of a given node if the node does not exist then it will return minus one now let's see how we can implement this two method this is our linked list representation okay we have this class then we have this two pointer head and tail and we have this traverse method inside this method we're gonna check if head equals to null we'll return using this return statement we'll just exit then we're creating a pointer current that will point to the head node then we're running a while loop while current is not equals to null we'll print the value of current node then we're moving current to the next let's see how it works let's say we're given this linked list first current pointer will point to the first node so we see that this node is not a null node so let's so let's print one now let's move current to the next this node is not a null node so let's print the value of this node 2 now let's move current to the next node the value of this node is 3 this node is not a null node so let's print 3 now let's move current to the next node and let's print the value of this node 4 again let's move current to the next now we see that our current pointer is pointing to a null node so we'll stop this is how we can traverse a linked list this method will take bigger of in time complexity and it will take constant space complexity since we're not using any additional space now let's talk about search method this is our method search this method takes one parameter val we'll search the val in the linked list if we found the val in the linked list we'll return the index of that node inside here we're checking if head equals to null will return minus one then we have index equals to zero initially the index zero means the first node initially index zero means the index of first node then we're initializing current pointer to the head node then we're running a while loop while current is not equals to null we're gonna check if the value of current node equals to val then we'll return the index then we'll increase index and then we'll move current to the next node if we do not found the value in our node we'll return minus one let's see how it works let's say we're searching the value three the head is not null so current pointer will point to this node and the value is not equals to 3 so let's move to the next node and we see the value is not equals to 3 so let's move to the next node now we see the value equals to 3 so we'll return the index 2 and we're tracking the index of our current node using this index variable okay if we are searching the value 5 and that value is not exist in this linked list then this current pointer will point to this node in that case this while loop will stop and it will just return minus one 
Hope you have understood this search method and this is how it works. This method will take big O of n time complexity for the worst case scenario and it will take constant space complexity since we are not using any additional space. The source code is attached to this video, check it out. Thanks for watching this video, I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys, welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to see how to make delete operation in a single linked list. In this video we are going to implement two delete operation, delete at index and delete entire list. This method will delete a node at a given index and this method will delete the entire list. First let's see how we can implement this method then we will see this method. This is our code. This is our delete at index method. This method takes a parameter index and here we are checking if index is less than 0 or index is equals to or greater than size then we will just return. If index is 0 then we will move our head pointer to the next node. Okay. If not we are going to get the previous node then we are going to say p dot next equals to p dot next dot next. Here we are just skipping our current node and then we are checking if the index is the last node then we have to move tail to the prev node and here we are just decreasing the side. Now let's see how it works. Let's say we are given this linked list and we call this method delete at index with 3. So our job is to remove this node 4 from our linked list. So for that what we are going to do, we are going to get the previous node. This is our previous node. Okay. Then we are going to say p.next equals to p.next.next. .next. So we are going to disconnect this pointer, we are going to connect this pointer to this node. Next, this is the next node. So next dot next, that means null node. So this node is now pointing to nothing. There is nothing is pointing to this node. So garbage collector will remove this node from computer memory. In computer memory, that means in random access memory or in RAM, there is a garbage collector. Garbage collector always is looking for unused data in RAM. Whenever it found unused data, the data will be removed by the garbage collector. Then we see that index equals to size minus 1. So we are going to move our tail pointer to this node. So this linked list will be represented something like this. Now if we call this function delete at index 1 in this case we are going to delete this node. For that what we are going to do? We are going to get the previous node. This is the previous node. Then previous.next.next. .next. So we are going to disconnect this link and we are going to connect to this node. And in this case, this if condition is false, and we'll just decrease the size. And now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node, so this node will be removed by garbage collector. So the linked list will be represented something like this. This is how delete at index works. Let's call delete at index with zero. In this case, what are we going to do? In this case, we're going to move our head pointed to the next node. So head will point to this node, and this. So head will point to this node and there is nothing is pointing to this node 1. So this node will be removed by garbage collector. So our linked list will be represented something like this. We have only one node in our linked list. This is how delete at index method works. This method takes big O of n time complexity since we have to find out the previous node for the worst case and it will take constant space complexity we are not using any additional space now let's see how we can delete entire linked list now let's see how we can delete entire linked list this is our method delete entire list and here we're just saying tail equals to head equals to null let's say we're given this linked list then we call this function delete entire list and here we're just moving head and tail to the null node okay now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node. So this is unused data in RAM. So garbage collector will collect and delete this node from RAM. Then we have this node. There is nothing is pointing to this node since this node is already removed by garbage collector. So this node will be also 
get removed by garbage collector then this node three we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node so garbage collector will collect this node and will delete this node from ram then this node we see there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be removed by garbage collector and then we have null null means nothing this is how delete enter list works if we say tail equals to here equals to null then this linked list will be deleted from our computer memory this is how this method works and it will take constant time complexity and constant space complexity since we're moving tail and head node to the null node nothing we're doing except these operations so it will take constant time and constant space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any question if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see how to create a circular single link list this is our node okay this node contains two attributes data and the next pointer and we have this circular singly linked list head and tail equals to null and size equals to zero initially this is our node representation and this is our linked list initially head and tail is pointing to null node that means it points to nothing this is our code okay my linked list this is my circular single linked list we have this class node then we have head and tail equals to null and size equals to zero initially we have this node in this video we're going to implement add node and this method will add node to the tail and will print the nodes values now i'm going to convert this code to pseudo code so it will take less space on our computer screen now let's see add node method this is our add node method it takes one parameter then we're creating a new node and here we're creating new node and then we're checking if head equals to null then we're going to then we're going to assign head and tail pointed to the new node then we're saying tail dot next equals to head if not then we're going to say tail dot next equals to new node new node dot next equals to head and tail equals to new node and then we're going to increase the size of our link list let's call this method add node with one now what we're going to do we're going to create a new node with value one and then we're going to assign head and tail pointed to this node since head and tail initially null and the address of this node is 0x001 for example now here we're saying tail dot next equals to head so we're going to add this pointer to this node okay so here we're storing the address of this node so this node will be represented something like this so we have a connections of this tail to head okay now the size of our linked list is one now let's call this function add node with value two in this case we're going to create a new node so let's create a new node this is our new node and then we see head is not equals to null and we see head is not equals to null so now we're on this else statement here what we're gonna say tail dot next equals to new node so we're going to disconnect this pointer and we're going to connect to this node okay then new node dot next equals to head so we're going to connect this pointer to this head node and then we're going to move tail to this node then this link list will be represented something like this and the size of this link list is 2 and this tail node is connected to our head node now let's call add node with value 3 now we created a new node here okay and we see head is not equals to null so we're gonna say tail dot next equals to new node so we're gonna disconnect this and we're going to connect to this node and then we're gonna say new node dot next equals to head and then tail equals to this new node and then the link list will be represented something like this and we see here we have a cycle we can go from one to two from two to three from three to one we have a cycle here okay this is called circular single link list this is how we can add node to the tail this method will text bigger of one 
time complexity and big of one space complexity now let's see our print method how we can print the value of the circular single link list okay initially we'll print the value of a head node so we have printed the value of a head node then our current then current pointer current pointer will point to this node and we see this node is not our head node so let's print the value of this node so let's print two now let's move current to the next node now our current pointer will point to this node three now let's print the value of this node uh, three then let's move current to the next node the next node of this node tail is height since we have a circle here so current will point to this node and in this case we see that our current node is head node so we'll stop we have this result one two and three this is how we can print nodes values of a circular single link list thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video oh the time complexity for this method is bigger of n since we're traversing the link list from left to right once and it will take constant space complexity since we're not using any additional space all right guys hope you've understood this video explanation if you have any question if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to traverse and search in circular single link list we're going to implement two methods traverse and search this traverse method will traverse the link list from left to right and it will print the nodes values and search method will search for a specific nodes values if the values exist then it will return the index of that particular node if the value do not exist then it will return minus one first let's see traverse method then we'll see search method this is our code and this is our traverse method first we're gonna check if head equals to null we will print empty list and we'll just exit by this return statement if not we're going to print the head value then we're gonna initialize current point to the next node of our head node then we're gonna run a while loop while current is not equals to head then we'll print the current node value and then we're gonna move current to the next node this method is exactly similar to the print method that what we have learned in the previous video we're going to recap this one more time this time this method name is towers so initially we'll print the value of our head nodes so we'll print one then we're going to initialize a pointer to this node this is the next node of our head node and this is our current node and we see this current node is not equals to head node so let's print the value of this node let's move current to the next we see this node is not our head node so let's print the value of this node three then let's move current to the next and the next node of tail is head since we have here a circle and we see that now current is equals to head node so we'll stop and this is our traversing result and this method will take bigger of in time complexity since we're traversing the link list from left to right once and it will take constant space complexity since since we're just using one pointer current now let's see search method this is our search method first we're going to check if head equals to null will return minus one if the value of our head node equals to val will return the index of our head node this is zero based index index of this node one is zero index of this node two is one index of this node three is two then we're going to initialize a variable int index equals to one then we're initializing a pointer current to our next node of our head node then we're going to check if current is not equals to head we're going to check if current the data equals to val will return the index if not we're going to increase the index and then we're going to move current pointer to the next node after doing this while loop if we found if we do not found current dot data equals to val then we will return minus one now let's call a function search three now we're going to search the value three in this link list and we're going to return the index of the node three if we do not found this node in the link list we'll return minus one so first we're going to check this value with this head node we see one is not equals to three so let's initialize a pointer to this node two then we're going to check two and three 
so they are not equal let's so let's move current to the next now we see 3 equals to 3 so it will return the index of this node 3 that is 2 so it will return 2 and we're counting the index by this variable index okay if we're searching a node that do not exist in this link list then we will return minus 1 all right this is how this search method works this method will take big off in time complexity for the worst case scenario and it will take constant space complexity since you are just using two variable index and current here current is a pointer hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're gonna see how to insert in circular single link list in this video we're gonna made three operations added head added tail added index first we're gonna start off with this method added head then we'll see added tail then we'll see added index first let's see added head method all right this is our added head method initially we have this link list and size equals to zero this method takes one parameter val inside here we're creating a new node with the value then we're checking if head equals to null we'll, we'll assign head and tail to new node then we'll say tail.next equals to head else if not head equals to null new node.next equals to head tail.next equals to new node head equals to new node and size plus plus if we call this method added head with one then we'll create a new node with the value one and we're gonna say here head dot tail equals to new node so we're assigning head and tail pointer to the new node and then we're gonna say here tail dot next equals to head so we're gonna so we're connecting tail to this node so we're storing the address of this node now if we call this function again then we're going to create a new node okay and in this case head is not equals to null so what we're going to do we're going to say new node dot next equals to head so this is not prep node this is new node okay so new node dot next equals to head and tail dot next equals to new node and we're gonna move head to this node so this link list will be represented something like this this is our head node and this is our tail node and this tail is connected to this head node okay this is how this add at head method works this method will take big of one time complexity and big of one space complexity now let's talk about added tail method initially we have this link list okay here this method takes one parameter val here we're creating new node and then we're gonna check if head equals to null we're gonna assign head and tail pointer to the new node then we're gonna say tail dot next equals to head if not tail dot next equals to new node new node dot next equals to head tail equals to new node and we're increasing the size now let's call this method added tail with one so we're gonna create a new node and here we're assigning head and tail pointer to this new node and here we see that head equals to null so we're assigning head and tail to this node then tail dot next equals to tail dot next equals to head so we're connecting this tail with this head so we'll store here the address 0x001 so the link list will be represented something like this okay this is the representation and the size equals to 1 now if we call this function again added tail 2 and here we're creating a new node and we see head is not equals to null so tail dot next equals to new node so we're going to disconnect it let's connect to this node and then new node dot next equals to head so we're going to connect to this head and we're going to move tail to this node and the link list will be represented something like this okay the link list will be represented something like this this is head and this is tail this is how added tail method works this method also takes big of one time complexity and big of one space complexity now let's talk about added index method 
this is our added index method for this method we need a helper method get node okay this method takes two parameter index and a val then we're checking if index is less than zero or index is greater than size then we'll return here if index equals to zero then we'll apply added height if index equals to size then we'll apply here added tail and these two methods we have learned in the previous slide if index is not equals to zero and index is not equals to size then this else statement will be executed here we'll create a new node then we'll get the previous node then previous node dot next equals to new node new node dot next equals to previous node dot next and here to get previous node we'll call this helper method and here we have a current pointer and we're running a loop to find out the node at index minus one since we have to find out the previous node for example let's say we're given this link list and we have to add at a particular index to this link list let's call this function add at index 2 4 so we have to add this node 4 at index 2 so right here in between this two node let's create a new node here this is our new node so we're going to get the previous node so the previous node of the index 2 is this node this is our previous node so we're going to say previous dot next equals to new node so we're going to disconnect it we're going to connect it to this node then we're going to say new node dot next equals to Prev node dot next so we're going to connect this node to this node so this node will be inserted right in between this two node two and three so the link list will be represented something like this this is how this added index method works this method takes big of in time complexity since we have to find out the previous node for the worst case scenario and it will take big up one space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we are going to made delete operation in circular single link list in this video we are going to implement two method delete at index and delete enter list delete at index method will will delete a node at a particular index and delete enter list will delete the entire link list now let's see how we can implement these two method first let's talk about this deleted index method then we'll talk about delete enter list method this is our code for delete at index this is our helper method that we need to implement this method delete at index this method takes one parameter then here we're checking if index is less than zero or index is greater than or equals to size we'll just exit by this written statement if index equals to zero then we'll move head pointer to the next node if not then we're gonna get the previous node using this helper method then we will say privilege next equals to privilege next dot next and here if we find out index equals to size minus one then we have to move our tail pointer to the prev node and we're just decreasing the site now let's see how it works if we call this method delete at index one so we have to delete this node so how we can do this for that we have to first get the previous node this is your previous node and then we're gonna say prev dot next equals to prev dot next dot next so we'll skip this node and we'll connect to this node now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node so garbage collector will collect this node and will remove this node from ram you know in computer ram there is a garbage collector that's always search for unused data if it found any unused data then the garbage collector will remove that unused data from ram so the link list will be represented something like this if we call this method again with this index one then what's going to happen in this case we're going to get the previous node and we're going to we're going to say prep dot next equals to prep dot next dot next so it will disconnect and it will connect to this node so it will point to this same node and now we see there is nothing is pointing to this node so garbix collector will collect this node and will remove this node and also we will move our tail pointer to this prep node in this case index equals to size minus one okay so the linked list will be represented something like this hope you have understood this method delete at index this method will take speaker of in time complexity 
for the worst case scenario because we have to find out the previous node of a given index and it will take constant space complexity now let's talk about a delete enter list this method takes no parameter and inside here we're gonna check if tail is not equals to null then we're gonna set tail dot next equals to null and head and tail equals to null and we're gonna set size equals to zero so what does this means first we're gonna check if it if tail is not equals to null if tail is not equals to null we're gonna disconnect this link by saying tail equals to uh, tail dot next equals to null okay so it will disconnect this link so there is nothing pointing to this node one except the pointer ahead now what are gonna do we're gonna remove this two pointer and we're gonna point this two pointer to a null node so head is not pointing to this node and tail is not pointing to this node and we see now there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be collected by garbage collector and it will be removed then this node there is nothing is pointing to this node since this node is removed by garbage collector so this node also will be collected by garbage collector and garbage collector will remove this node then this node and there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node also will be removed by garbage collector and now we see there is nothing in our computer memory and this is how this method works hope you have understood this method this method will works in constant time and constant space complexity since we have to made here these operations hope you have understood this video explanations if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know the source code is attached to this video check it out thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're gonna see how to create a double linked list this is our node for double linked list we have three attributes data prev and next here two pointer prev and next this is our double linked list initially head and tail is pointing to null node and size equals to zero this is node representation we have two pointer prev and next and we have a data this is our link list initially okay just a null node head and tail will point to this node this is our code we have here node it contains three attributes data prev and next and here we have this null node this is our node representation okay and here we have added tail method it takes one data and we're creating a new node inside then we're gonna check if head is equals to null then we're gonna say head equals to tail equals to new node here we're assigning head and tail pointer to the new node if not tail dot next equals to new node new node dot prev equals to tail and tail equals to new node and we're increasing the site let's see how it works if we call this method add at tail with one then we'll create a new node okay and we will assign here head and tail since our head initially null so we'll assign head and tail pointer to this node now let's call this function again now we'll create another node with value 2 now in this time we see head is not equals to null so tail dot next equals to new node so tail dot next equals to new node this is our tail so we'll connect this node something like this tail dot next equals to new node then new node dot prev equals to tail so we'll connect this node something like this and then tail equals to new node so we'll move tail to this node so the link list will be represented something like this we have here address with that address you can see how it actually works we're storing the address right here of this node and right here of this node if we call this method again with three then we'll create a new node again and we'll add here tail dot next equals to new node something like this then new node dot prev equals to tail and tail equals to new node so the link list will be represented something like this this is how we can create a double link list this method will take constant space and time complexity since we're doing one operation at a time and the size of this link list is a three hope you've understood this video explanation if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're gonna implement two method search and towers search method 
will search for a particular value in the double linked list and traverse method will traverse the linked list from left to right. Now let's talk about that. First let's talk about traverse method. This traverse method takes this traverse method takes no parameter. Here we're checking if here equals to null will print empty list and will exit by this return statement. If not, we're gonna initialize a current pointed to head node and we'll run a while loop while current is not equals to null, we'll print the current dot data. That means the current node's values, then current equals to current dot next. Here we're moving the current pointer to the next node. If you call this method traverse and if you're given this link list, then what's gonna happen? First, we're gonna check head equals to null. No, head is not equals to null. So let's create a new pointer that will point to this node and this node is not a null node. So let's print one. Now let's move current to the next node. So current will point to this node. And we see this node is not a null node, so let's print here too. Now let's move current to the next node. So current will point to this node and let's print here 3. Now let's move C to the next node. That means the current pointer to the next node and this node is not a null node. So let's print the value 4. Now let's move current to the next node again. And now we see current pointer is pointing to this null node. So this while loop stuff and we get this output 1, 2, 3, 4. This is how traverse method works. This will take big off in time complexity because you have to traverse the link list from left to right once and it will take constant space complexity since we are just using one pointer current. Hope you've understood traverse method. Now let's talk about search method. Now let's talk about search method. This method takes one parameter. Here inside we're checking if head is equals to null will return minus one. Then we're initializing a variable index equals to zero. Then we're creating a new pointer that will point to the head node. Then we're running a while loop while current is not equals to null. Inside here we're checking if current dot data equals to data, then we'll return the index. If not, then we'll move current to the next node and we'll increase our index. If we do not found this statement is evaluated true while running this loop then we will return minus one if we call this function if we call this method search with three and if you're given this link list then first we're going to check this node head is not equals to null we see head is not equals to null so we will not return minus one we have here index zero we'll keep tracking the index of our current node using this index variable then then we're creating a new pointers current that will point to this node then we're running a while loop while current is not equals to null current dot equals to data we see 3 is not equals to 1 so let's move current to the next node this is our current node and we see 2 is not equals to 3 so let's move again to the next node now current will point to this node and in this case we see that the value of this node equals to 3 so in this case we will return the index of this node the index of this node is 2 so we will return 2 for this function call if we call this method search with 5 then it will return minus 1 because 5 is not exist in this link list this is how this search method works this will take bigger of in time complexity for the worst case uh, because for the worst case we have to traverse this link list from left to right and it will take constant space complexity since we are using one variable index and one pointer current hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any issue if you have any problem understanding this video explanation let us know the source code is attached to this video check that out thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about insertion in doubly linked list in this video, we're going to implement two methods, add at height and add at index. Now let's talk about add at height, then we'll talk about add at index. This is add at height method. This method takes one parameter. Here we're creating a new node with the data. Then we're checking if head equals to null, then we're going to initialize head and tail pointer to new node. That means we're going to assign head and tail pointer to the new node. If not, we're gonna say new node dot next equals to head, head dot pip equals to new node, head equals to new node, and size plus plus. If we call this method added head with one, then we'll create a new node, prep pointer is null, and 
next pointer is null and the current data and the data is one and we're going to assign head and tail pointer to this node since head equals to null initially and the size of this linked list is one now if we call this function again add it head with two then we'll create a new node in this case we're going to apply this else statement new node dot next equals to head so new node dot next equals to head then head dot prev equals to new node so head dot prev equals to new node and we're going to move head to this node okay then the linked list will be represented something like this if we call this function again then we'll create a new node this is node 3 then we're going to say new node dot next equals to a head then head dot prev equals to new node and head equals to this new node then the linked list will be represented something like this okay this is how this method works this method will take speak of one time complexity and big of one space complexity hope you've understood this method added head now let's talk about added index method all right this is our added index method to implement this method we need another method get node this is a helper method and we'll attach code and in the code you will see this method this method takes two parameter index and data if we see index equals to zero we'll apply added head method if index equals to size then we'll apply here added tail method if index is not equals to zero and index is not equals to size then we'll apply this code let's see how this actually works let's say we call this method added index one three one is index and three is the data so we'll insert a node in between this two node so we'll insert a node in between this two nodes so let's create a node with value three then here what we're going to do we're going to get the previous node this is the previous node then previous dot next dot prev so next dot prev is this node equals to new node okay then previous dot next equals to this node then new node dot prev equals to prev node will connect to this node and new node dot next equals to this prev dot next node then it will be represented something like this this is how this method works for better understanding try to write out everything on a picture paper then you will see how it actually works this method will take speak of in time complexity for the worst case for this gate node method and it will take constant space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about deletion in a double linked list in this video we're going to implement these two methods delete at index and delete entire list first let's talk about delete at index then we'll talk about delete entire list this is our code for delete at index first we're going to check the boundary if if index is less than zero or index is greater than or equals to size then we will exit by this return statement if we see index equals to zero then we will move head pointed to the next node and we will disconnect the previous node for our new height if index is not equals to zero this else statement will be executed first we'll get the previous node for that we need this method we're not showing up here the method we have attached the code to this video check that out in the source code we have this method and this is very simple we can get the previous node by using a for loop and a pointer then we're saying here prev node dot next equals to prev node dot next dot next then we're checking if prev node dot next dot next is not equals to null then we're gonna say prev node dot next dot next dot prev equals to prev node if tail equals to index minus one we'll move with tail pointed to the prev node and then we'll decrease the size this size will be right here okay now let's see how it actually works if we call this function with index zero then what's going to happen we'll move head to this node and we'll disconnect this previous pointer and it will become null then the linked list will be represented something like this okay now let's take another example for better understanding let's say we're given this linked list and we call this function with index 2 in this case what are we going to do we're going to find out the previous node of index 2 this is the node of index 2 then we're going to say previous node dot next equals to previous node dot next dot next so this pointer will point to null node okay that means it will point to null node something like this it's pointing to null node in for null 
Then we're gonna check if previous node dot next dot next not equals to null. Then we're gonna apply this formula. But in this case, we see that previous dot next dot next equals to null. So this statement will not be executed. Then we're checking if tail equals to index minus one. In this case, it's true. So we'll move tail to this node. So the linked list will be represented something like this. For better understanding, let's take another example. Let's say we're given this linked list and we call this function with index one. So this is the node of index one. First, what are we gonna do? We're gonna find out the previous node. This is the previous node. Then we're gonna say previous node dot next equals to previous node dot next dot next. So we're going to disconnect this node and we're gonna connect to this node. And then we're gonna check if previous node dot next dot next is not equals to null. We're going to say previous dot next dot next dot prev equals to prev node. This if condition is evaluated false, so this statement will not be executed and here we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be collected by garbage collector and garbage collector will remove this node from ram then our link list will be represented something like this hope you have understood this uh, video explanation this method takes bigger of n time complexity to find out the previous node and it will take constant space complexity now let's see delete entire list method this is our delete entire list method. First, we have this current pointer and we're gonna remove the next pointer. This is your next pointer. This is your next pointer. Okay, we have removed the next pointer. Then we're going to remove head and tail pointer from our head and tail node and we'll move that to null node. Now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node. So this node will be collected by garbage collector and it, and it will be removed by garbage collector automatically. Then this node, there is nothing is connecting to this node. So this node will be removed by garbage collector. Then this node, there is nothing is pointing to this node. So garbage collector will remove this node from RAM. And this is how it works. This solution will take bigger of one time and space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have any issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're gonna see creation of a circular double link list this is our node of a double link list okay the node will be represented something like this and we have here our class my circular double link list and initially the link list is null head and tail pointer is pointed to null node and size equals to zero this is our node of a double link list okay and Initially, we have our node. This is our node initially. Head and tail is pointing to null node. And the size is zero. And this is our, this is our added tail method. This method takes one parameter data. Then we're creating new node here. Then we're checking if size equals to zero. Then we'll initialize head and tail pointer to a new node. Then we're gonna say tail.next equals to head, head.next equals to tail. If not, new node.next equals to head, tail.next equals to new node, new node.prev equals to tail, tail equals to new node, head.prev equals to new node, and size plus plus. Now let's see how this actually works. Initially, we have this linked list. If we call this added tail method with one, then we'll create a new node with data one and we have here prevent next pointer. Since the size of our linked list initial is zero, so we'll initialize head and tail pointer to this node and we'll say tail.next equals to head, head.next equals to tail. So the linked list will be represented something like this. We're storing as prev the address of this node and as next the address of this node. So we have a circle here. We can go from here to here and we can go from here to here. And if we call this function add a tail with two, we'll create a new node. And here we'll say, now here we're at this else statement. Here new node dot next equals to head. So new node dot next equals to head. And then tail dot next equals to new node. So we're going to disconnect this link. Okay. From here to here. So we're going to disconnect this link from here to here. And we're going to say here to this node. Okay. Tail dot next equals to prep node. But we have here another link, something like this from here to here. This link is already exist. But we have removed this link. This might be a little bit complex, don't worry. Then we're gonna say new node.prev equals to tail. So we'll connect this node to this tail and we'll move tail to this node and we'll say head.prev equals to new node. And it looks a little bit crazy, don't worry about that. It will be represented something like this. Try to wrap your head around with this problem, then it will make sense. If we call this method added tail with three, then let's create a new node here. So new node dot 
next equals to height is next all points to this height okay then tail dot next equals to new node so we're going to disconnect this link something like this we have a link something like this from tail to height so we're going to disconnect this and we're going to connect to this node okay then tail equals to new node we're going to move this pointed to this node we're going to move tail to this node and then we're going to say head dot prev equals to new node and it will be represented something like this hope you've understood this video explanations if you're not understanding try to look at this code here we have here two arrow with this same line that might confuse you but don't worry about it try to write out on a speech of paper so you will see how it works this method will take constant time and constant space complexity since we're doing the operations in constant time and we're not using any additional space hope you have understood this video explanations if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know the source code is attached to this video check that out thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about source and traverse method in circular w linked list in this video we're going to implement these two methods source and traverse now let's talk about source method this method takes one parameter data as input then we're checking if head equals to null we'll return minus one then we're checking the value of our head node if the value of our head node equals to data then we'll return zero then we're initializing the index one then we're initializing a current pointer to the next of our head node then we're running a while loop while current is not equals to head we're going to check current dot data equals to data if it's evaluated to we'll read an index then we're increasing the index and we're moving current to the next pointer after doing this while loop if this condition is never evaluated true then it will return minus one now let's see how it actually works if we call this function first we're checking the head node and the value of head node is one two that is not equals to three so we'll move to the next node and the value of this node two is not equals to three so let's move to the next node by the current pointer and the value of this node three is equals to three so we'll return the index of this node since the index are zero based so the index of this node is two zero one two so it will return two if you call this function with five it will return minus one the minus one because the nodes value 5 do not exist in this linked list so it will return minus 1 hope you have understood this search method this method will take speak of in time complexity for the worst case scenario and it will take speak of one space complexity the source code is attached to this video check that out now let's talk about traverse method this is our traverse method this method takes no parameter here we're checking if head equals to null we'll print empty list and we'll exit by this return statement then print here we'll print the value of our head node so let's print one then we're initializing current pointer to the next of our head node and this is not equals to head so let's print two then let's move c to the next node and we see c is not pointing to head node so let's print the value of this node three then c will point to this node and we see this is our head node so this while loop will stop this is how we can traverse a circular single link list hope you have understood this video explanations this method will take speak of in time complexity since you're traversing the linked list from left to the right once and it will take constant space complexity so the time complexity is big of n and the space complexity is big of one this is my implementation of traverse method the source code is attached to this video check that out if you have any question if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about insertion in circular w link list in this video we're going to implement two method added head and added index for circular w link list first let's talk about added head method then we'll talk about added index method this is the code for added head method this method takes on parameter then right inside here we're creating a new node with the data then we're checking if size equals to zero then we will initialize head and tail pointer to the new node then head dot prev equals to tail and tail dot next equals to head if not new node dot prev equals to tail tail dot next equals to new node new node dot next equals to head head dot prev equals to new node 
hit equals to new node size plus plus this is the code now let's see how it actually works if we call this method edit hit with one initially we have this linked list hit until pointer is pointing to null node okay here this code will be applied because size equals to zero initially here we have created a node with data one and then we're going to initialize here head and tail pointer to this node and then we will say head dot prev equals to tail head dot prev equals to tail and tail dot next equals to head so we see a circle here this is called circular w linked list now if we call this method again with data two then we're going to create a new node here with data two then we have to apply here here we have to apply this else statement here new node dot prev equals to tail so this is our new node dot prev equals to tail okay then tail dot next equals to tail dot next equals to new node and here new node dot next equals to head this is next next equals to a head and head dot prev equals to new node here we have connected the head and tail node then what are going to do we're going to move head to the new node so we're going to move head pointer to this node this might seem a little bit complicated don't worry try to write out everything on a piece of paper then it will make sense and the link list will be represented something like this now if we call this function again with data 3 now let's create a node with 3 data now let's create a node with data 3 and here we have prev and next null we have empty empty means nothing now so let's apply this else statement here new node dot prev equals to tail so we're going to apply to this tail then tail dot next equals to new node so this is tail tail dot next equals to new node and new node dot next equals to hate so we're going to connect to this so we have connected this next of this new node to hate and head dot prev equals to this node and we're going to move head pointer to this node then the link list will be represented something like this this is how this added head method works this method will takes bigger of one time and bigger of one space complexity since we're adding one node to the head at a time so it will take constant time and constant space complexity now let's talk about added index method this is added index method this method takes two parameter index and data here we're checking if index is less than zero or index is greater than size then we'll exit by this return statement then we're checking if index equals to zero then we'll call this function with data added head data else if if we found index equals to size then we call this method added tail if not then we'll apply this statement and will increase the size of our linked list if we call this method added index with one and three we have to add this node three at index one so the node will be goes in between these two nodes so let's create a node with data three and here let's apply this formula so we have created a new node and the prev node this is the prev node we're not showing up here the implementation of get node method the source code is attached to this video check the source code where we have the implementation of this method then what we're going to do we're going to say prev node dot next equals to new node so prev node dot next equals to this node we're going to connect this pointer to this node then new node dot prev equals to prev node so we're going to connect this node to this node okay then new node dot next equals to prev node dot next so we're going to connect to this node and prev node dot next dot prev equals to new node so we're going to connect this link to this node and this is how it works the link list will be represented something like this and this is how it works this method will take speaker of in time complexity for the worst case scenario we have to find out the previous node and it will take constant space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know if you have any issues understanding the method added hate and added index then try to write it everything on a piece of paper then it will make sense thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about deletion in circular double linked list 
in this video we're going to implement two method delete at index and delete entire list for circular double link list first let's talk about delete at index then we'll talk about delete entire list this is our delete at index method this method takes one parameter index inside here we're checking if index is less than zero or index is greater than or equals to size then we'll exit by this return statement if we see index equals to zero then we'll move head to the next node then we're gonna say tail dot next equals to head head dot prev equals to tail if not we're going to find out the previous node for that we need this method get node we're not showing here the method we have attached the source code to this video you can check that out where we have the implementation of this method then here prevnode dot next equals to prevnode dot next dot next if prevnode dot next dot next is not equals to null then we will say prevnode dot next dot next dot prev equals to prevnode if size equals to index minus one then tail equals to prevnode and size minus minus here we have this if statement we can remove this if statement for circular double link list no worry we can use this if statement now let's see how this actually works if we call this function with index 0 that means we have to remove the first node at index 0 this is the first node here what we're going to do we're going to move head to this node okay since index equals to 0 then we're going to say tail dot next equals to head so tail dot next equals to head we're going to disconnect this and we'll connect to this node since this is our new head then head dot prev equals to tail so we'll disconnect this and we will connect it to this link okay something like this now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be collected by garwex collector and garwex collector will remove this node so our link list will be represented something like this hope you have understood for better understanding let's take another example if we say delete at index 2 for this link list in this case we have to remove this node okay 0 1 2 the index of this node is 2 for this function call we see that this if statement is false now this else statement will be executed so first we will find out the prev node this is our prev node then we're gonna say prev node dot next equals to prev node dot next dot next so prev node dot next equals to prev node dot next dot next so it will point to this node okay then we're gonna check if prev node dot next dot next is not equals to null we see prev node dot next dot next is not equals to null in this case head node head node is not a null node so we're gonna say head node dot prev equals to prev node so we're going to we're going to connect this link to this node and we're going to remove this link since we have connected the prev to this node then we see size equals to index minus one so we'll move tail to this prev node and will decrease the size of this link list and now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node okay so this node will be collected by garwex collector and garwex collector will remove this node from ram now the link list will be represented something like this hope you've understood how it works now let's take another example for better understanding let's say we're given this link list and we call this function with index 1 in this case we have to remove this node for that first we have to find out the previous node this is your previous node then previous dot next then previous node dot next equals to previous node dot next dot next so we're going to skip this node and we're going to connect to this node and then we're going to say here prev node dot next dot next is not equals to null we see this node is not a null node so this node dot prev equals to prev node so we're going to connect this node to this node okay and this if condition evaluated false so this statement will only be executed and then we decrease the site 
Now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node, so this node will be collected by garbix collector and garbix collector will remove this node automatically from computer memory. Then our link list will be represented something like this. Then our link list will be represented something like this. Hope you have understood this method delete at index. This method will take spigo of in time complexity and it will take constant space complexity. Now let's talk about delete entire list method. This is your delete entire list method. First, we're gonna check if head is not equals to null. We're gonna say head dot prev equals to null. If tail is not equals to null, tail dot next equals to null. And then we're going to initialize current pointer to head and we're going to disconnect the link, the next link from east node, okay? And here also we have disconnected this prev node by this statement and the next node for our tail node okay so these are disconnected now we're going to disconnect head and tail pointer so let's remove head and tail pointer and let's disconnect them and let's point head and tail to a null node now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this tail node since this is disconnected and this next pointer for this node is disconnected so we see there is nothing is pointing to this node so so this node will be removed by garbage collector automatically from RAM. Then we have this node. There is nothing is pointing to this node. So this node will be removed by garbage collector. Then this node. There is nothing is pointing to this node. So this node will be removed by garbage collector from computer memory. This method will take big of in time complexity because we have to disconnect the next pointer for each node. And the solution will take big of one space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. The source code is attached to this video. Check that out. If you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome to this video. Now we're going to solve a classical linked list coding interview problem. You're given a single linked list and you have to reverse it. You have to solve this problem iteratively and recursively. We have already solved this problem iteratively. We have a video link in the description. Check that out. Now we're going to solve this problem recursively. This is going to be a little critical to understand when we're going to solve this problem using recursion. For example, if you're given this link list, then we have to reverse it. So this node becomes the head of our reversed link list okay first four then three then two then one then now so we have to return this link list so for this given input we'll return this link list if you are given this link list we have to reverse it first this is node 5 and this is now our head for the reversed link list then four then three then two then one then now okay so we have to return this link list if we are given this link list. Now let's see how we can solve this problem recursively. For sake of understanding, let's assume we are given this link list. Okay. First, we're going to declare two pointer head and next state that will point to the head of our given link list. Now for the first recursive function call, first we will move this pointer to this node 2 then we'll disconnect this and then we'll connect this node to null node okay and this is for our first recursive function call now this is our head for the new function call now this is the head of our link list for the next recursive function call okay so this is our head and then we have the next node pointed to the next of our head now what we're going to do we're going to disconnect this we're going to connect it to a null node okay then this node will be our head for the next recursive function call all right now again we're going to disconnect this we're going to connect it to the null node then this will be represented like this now we have this node this is the head for our next recursive function call okay so this is the head so what we have done at this far we have done 
for recursive function call and we found our base case set. This is our base case set. Okay. And here for each recursive function call, we're disconnecting the head node from the linked list. So here we disconnected one, then we disconnected two. When we disconnected this node, it means that we disconnected here as well. Okay. When we disconnected this node three from the linked list, then we're disconnecting this node and this node as well. Because in the computer memory, we have the same node. We don't have the different node for each recursive function call. We're just changing the pointer for each recursive function call. Okay. So here we have this node 4 that points to null. Now what we're going to do, we're going to return this node 4 as our head node. Because this will be the head for our reversed linked list. And this head pointer is pointing to this node 4. Then we have this next node pointer. And this pointing to this node 4. Now we're going to disconnect this pointer and we're going to connect it to this node 3. How we can do that? We can do that by using formula next node dot next equals to head. And we have head equals to this node 4. This pointer is pointing to node 4 in the computer memory, right? If we return this node, then what we'll have? We'll have all the node we have connected to this node 4. We don't have to worry about what we're doing on the top. We don't have to worry about what we're doing in the is recursive function call. Still, this pointer, here we created a new pointer, new head. This pointer is pointing to the node 4 in the computer memory, right? If we have some node is connected to this node, then we'll have all the node is connected to this node. So here we're disconnecting this node from this node. Now in computer memory, if we return, now in computer memory, this node is 3, this node 3 is connected to this node 4. And here this head pointer points to this node 3. Now here, this next node is pointing to this node 3 as well. Now if we say next node dot next equals to head, then this will connect to this node. It means that we're adding this node 2 to this node 3 as well because all the nodes are same in the computer memory. We don't have to worry about what we're doing on the previous recursive function call. Okay. So basically it means this node get connected to this node 2. Then right here, if we say next node dot next equals to null, we're connecting this node to this node 1. Okay. What we're doing, we're just adding this node 1 to this node 2 by the link or by the pointer. So what does this mean? It means that we're adding the pointer of node 2 to the node 1. Okay. That basically means that we're adding the pointer of this node 2 to this node 1 because all the nodes are same in computer memory. Now our new head is still pointing to this node 4. Now if we return this node 4, then we'll get all the node is connected to this node 4. And here we see node 3, node 2, node 1 is connected to this node 4. So if we return this node 4, then we'll have our reversed link list. This is going to be a little bit critical to understand. This problem bit of tricky to understand. Once you understand the concept of pointer, then you will be able to understood this problem easily. If you take a look at this picture and what I have said, then it will make sense. This is the code to solve this problem. First, we're checking if the given linked list is a null, then we'll return the null. If we see the next node of our current node is null, then we'll return the head. That means the current node and that node will be our head. And here we're just manipulating pointer and and here we're disconnecting the head node for each recursive call stack. Then this is our new head. This new head will be assigned right here and this will stay the same for all the recursive function call stack. And here we're just reversing the node and we'll return the new head. New head will point to the node for all ages. 
and if we have the node 4 then we'll get all the node is connected to this node 4 and this is how we can solve this problem the solution will take bigger of n time complexity the solution will take bigger of n time complexity and bigger of n space complexity or n is the number of nodes in the given link list all right guys hope you have understood this problem in a very high level if you aren't clear if you aren't understanding this video explanation try to go through with this pseudocode with your own examples then it will make sense if you aren't understanding still then take a look at this picture then it will make sense i have another video on this problem i will link that video in the description you can watch that video i hope if you watch the video link in the description then you will be able to understand this problem clearly thanks for watching this video and i'll see you in the next video now we're going to solve a classical linked list coding to be problem reverse linked list you're given a singly linked list and you have to reverse it you have to solve this problem iteratively and recursively in this video we're going to solve this problem iteratively and i will create another video where we will solve this problem recursively for example if you are given this linked list we have to reverse it if we reverse it for node will be our head then three then two then one then this one node pointing to null node all right and this is our head so we have to return this linked list if you are given this linked list then you have to reverse it if we reverse it five becomes our head then four then three then two then one then null okay so if we reverse this linked list we get this linked list so we have to return this linked list now how we can solve this problem iteratively now let me go through the intuition now let me show you how we can solve this problem for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this linked list this is our head node okay we're going to declare a pointer current that will point to head node now we're going to declare two pointer that points to null node priv and temp first we're going to move this temp pointer to the next of current so temp pointer will point to this node 2 okay now we're going to disconnect this link and we're going to connect this link to this null node where p pointer points to okay then we're going to move p pointer to current and current to temp now we're going to move temp to the next of current so temp will point here now we're going to disconnect this link and we're going to connect it where pre pointer pointing okay so we'll connect this to this node now we're going to move pre pointer to current and current pointer to temp all right now let's move this temp pointer to the next node where current pointer points to then let's disconnect this link and let's connect it where a prep pointer points so we'll connect here now we're going to move prep pointer to current and current to temp now let's move temp to the next of current so temp will point here now let's disconnect this link and let's connect it to the node where prep pointer points to now let's move prep pointer to current and current to temp okay when you see current pointer is pointing to a null node will stop and will return the node where prep pointer is pointing we see that this is the head of reversed link list if we return this head that means we're returning the reversed link list the reversed link list is four three two one null 
So we are returning this linked list. And this is how we can solve this problem. For better understanding, let's take another example. Now let's suppose that we are given this linked list. This is our head node, okay? And we're going to declare a new pointer current that will point to this head node. Then we're going to declare two pointer pev that will point to null node and temp that will also point to null node. Now our goal is to move the temp pointer to the next node where current pointer is pointing. So we'll move temp to this node too. Now we're going to disconnect this link and we're going to connect it to the node where pay pointer points to. In this case, pay pointer is pointing to a null node. So we'll connect it to the null node. Now we're going to move the pay pointer to current and current to temp. Okay, let's move the temp to the next of current. So temp will point here. Now let's disconnect this link and let's connect it to the node where prep pointer is pointing. Okay. Now let's move prep pointer to current and current pointer to temp. Now let's move the temp pointer to the next node where current pointer is pointing. Now let's disconnect this link and let's connect it to the node where prep pointer is pointing. Okay. Now let's move prep to current and current to temp. Now let's move temp to the next node and let's disconnect it. Let's connect it to the node where prep pointer is pointing. Now let's move prep to current and current to temp. Now let's move temp to the next up current. So temp pointer will point to this null node. Now we're going to disconnect this link. Let's connect it to this node. Now let's move prep pointer to this node and current pointer to this node. We see current pointer is pointing to a null node. When we see current pointer is pointing to a null node, we will return the prep pointer or the node where prep pointer is pointing. In this case, we see this is the head of our reverse linked list. The reverse linked list is 54321 null. Okay. And this is how we can solve this problem. This solution will take big of n time complexity where n is the number of nodes in the given linked list. And it will take constant space complexity since we're just using some pointer we are not using any additional space to solve this problem and this is how we can solve this problem iteratively now let me go through the pseudocode for better understanding okay here we have our pseudocode first let's review our pseudocode then we will see how it works first we'll declare a function reverse that takes head of a given linked list then we'll declare three pointer prev current and temp. Then we're going to run a loop while current not equals to null. And here we're manipulating the pointer. We're disconnecting, we're connecting, and we're moving pointers. Okay. At the end, this prev pointer will point to the head of our reversed linked list. All right. For first iteration, if you're given a linked list one, two, three, four, null, then for first iteration, the linked list will be represented like this. Then for second iteration of this while loop, the linked list will be represented like this. Then for third iteration, the linked list will be represented like this. And for fourth iteration, the linked list will be represented like this. And here, this prev is the head of our reversed linked list. So we'll return this linked list. Here you can see 4, 3, 2, 1 and null is our reversed linked list. Okay. I'm not going to go through this pseudocode line by line. If I go through the pseudocode line by line, then you will be get bored. I don't want that. For better understanding, take a look at this picture. Only then you can understand this problem easily. This solution will take speak of n time complexity where n is the number of nodes in the given linked list and it will take constant space complexity. Alright guys, this is my solution to this problem. Thanks for watching. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about what is a stack. Stack is a data structure used to store a collection of objects. It is just like a pile of flats kept on top of each other. Something like this. We have here six flat. One plate top of the other. This is the top flat. 
if you want to place a new plate then you have to put the plate to the top of this pile if you want to place a plate to the bottom then what you have to do we have to remove all the plates then you have to place the plate to the bottom we can made here two operations we can put a new plate on the top or we can remove the top plate and this principle is called last in first out the last item that is the first item to go out so in this pile we see that we have six plate we have to remove all the plate we can we can only remove the plate from the top okay if we remove all the plate from this pile only then we can place a new plate to the bottom okay and this is an example of stack data structure and the principle of stack data structure is LIFO last in first out if we add a new plate right over here this is called last in and if we want to remove a plate from this pile then you have to remove the plate from the top and that's called first out so it's called last in first out now let's talk about leafer principle of stack putting an element on the top of the stack is called push operation removing an item from the top of the stack is called pop operation let's say this is our stack if we say here push and let's push here one now on this stack we have only one element that is one now we have this stack here okay let's push two to this stack now we have this stack and we have only one element we call this method pop pop will remove the element from the top so if we remove the element from the top then we are left with only one element now if we push another element to this stack then we have two elements to this stack again if we say push three and we have added here three so we have three elements on this stack if we say pop it will remove the top element then we're left with only two elements one and two so we're putting an item on the top of the stack by this push operation and we're removing an item from the top of the stack using this pop operation and this is called push and pop operation this is the common operations in a stack that we can make and this is called leaf of principle last in first out so by this push operation we see last in and by this pop operations last out this is called leaf of principle of stack now let's talk about operation in stack we have five common operation in a stack push operation by this push operation we can add an element to the top of its stack by this pop operation we can remove an element from the top of a stack is empty this operation will check if the stack is empty is pull it will check if the stack is full and pick it will get the value of the top element without removing it also have another operation that is called delete stack and that will implement right in this section don't worry about that and this five are the common operations that you can make on a stack we have here stack so let's push one element to this stack so we have pushed one element to this stack and that is four if we say puff it will return four and it will remove the top element and that is four and we're left with three elements after doing this pop operation now in this stack if we made these operations or if we call this method is empty it will return false because this stack is not empty if we say is full and we see that this stack is not full if we consider the size of the stack is four this stack is not full we can add one more element to this stack so it will return false since this stack is not full and peak operations this peak operations will return the top element and it will not remove the top element okay and this is the common operations that you can make we have another operation that is called delete stack and that will delete a stack from our computer memory okay and we'll see how we can implement that right in this section now let's talk about application of stack we use a stack in compilers compilers use the stack to calculate the value of expressions like 2 plus 4 divided 5 times 7 minus 9 and that's inside this parenthesis by converting the expressions to prefix or postfix form so in order to calculate the expression we have to use a stack and in browser the back button in browser saves all the URLs you have visited previously in a stack each time you visit a new page it is added on top of the stack when you press the back button the current URL is removed from the stack and the previous URL is accessed 
this is an example of our browser's back button and this is back button okay and let's say we visited this five website first facebook then linkedin then udemy then google and we see here google okay and this will be represented in stack something like this first we have facebook then linking then udemy then google if we press to this back button then it will remove this site from stack and it will move to udemy site if we click on this back button again it will remove this udemy from stack and it will move to this website linking if we click on back button again then it will move to facebook.com okay and if we if we click on back button again then it will then it will move to the empty tab okay this is how stack works this is a real world example of stack this back button is implemented using a stack hope you have understood the concept of stack in the next video we're going to talk about implementation options or how you can implement a stack see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about implementation option of stack we can implement stack in two ways using an array or using a linked list for array implementation we have pros and cons the pros is that it is easy to implement and the cons is that the size of an array is fixed so the size of stack will be fixed and that might be an issue for some cases and for linked list implementation pros is that the size can be changed it's a variable size we can change the size during runtime and cons is that it moderate to implement and it's a little bit difficult to implement but for array implementation is super easy now let's see the common operations we can make for array implementation and for linked list implementation for array implementation we can make this method here push pop peak is empty is full and delete stack and for linked list implementation we don't know the size okay so we can't implement this method for linked list implementation so for linked list we have push pop peak is empty and delete stack method right in this section we will see how we can implement stack using array and we will implement all the method and also we'll see how we can implement stack using linked list and we'll implement all the method all right guys thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see stack implementation using array and we're going to implement stack from scratch using array for array implementation the pros is it's easy to implement and cons is it fixed sizes we can't change the size now let's see some operations that we will be implementing in this video in this video we'll implement these three operations create stack push operation and pop operation this is the code for stack implementation using array here we have class stack using array and here we have this array and we have this variable top of stack and we have here seven method create stack push pop pick is empty is full delete stack and we'll implement this three method in this video now let's talk about create stack method here we have create stack method this method takes one parameter size inside here we're creating a new array with the given size and top of array equals to minus one using this variable we'll keep track our top element in our stack since we're implementing stack using array if we call this method with five then we're creating a new integer array of length five and we have index number for each cell for first cell index number is zero for second cell index number is one and so on we're using java programming language throughout this course when we create an integer array in java the default value for all the cell of an array are zero we're not showing you zero just for sake of understanding we're assuming that the array is now empty and top of array equals to minus one using this array we'll keep track of our top element in our stack and the stack will be represented something like this the stack is empty this is just a visualization of a stack but internally we're using array to represent a stack now let's see push method this is our push method this method takes one parameter data inside here we're checking if 
the length of the array minus one equals to top of stack then we'll print stack overflow error that means the stack is already full we can't insert any more element to the stack if not we're going to insert the data at the index top of array plus one currently top of array is minus one and it will insert to the first cell initially then we're moving top of stack to the next element and we're printing here insert it now let's see how it works if we, now if we call this method push with one what's going to happen we're going to insert this value one to this array and we'll insert to this first cell top of array plus one is zero since top of array is minus one so we'll insert the data one to this cell and in the stack it will be represented something like this and we'll insert right over here and the value of this top of array variable will be changed to zero now if we call this method again push with two then what's going to happen we're going to insert this data to this cell of index one and we can get the index of this cell by saying top of array plus one so zero plus one is one so let's insert here two and in the stack as well and we're just showing you the visualization of the stack and stack will be represented something like this and the value of this variable will be changed to one now if we call this method again with three then three will be inserted here and it will be represented something like this in stack and it will be increased to two if we call this method again push four we'll insert here four and stack will be represented something like this the top element is four and the value of this variable is a three so what we're doing here we're increasing the value of this variable each time why we want to access the top element in this array which is the top element in this array the top element is this element four and with this index number we can get the top element and in the stack we see that this is the top element okay and that's why we're using this variable to keep track our top element since you're using every implementation of stack if we call this method with five then five will be inserted right here also here for representation and this value of this variable will be increased to four now we see our stack is full if we call again push six then it will throw this error stack overflow error it will not be inserted in our stack since the stack is full this is how this push operation works and this is how we can implement push method now let's talk about pop method with pop method we will remove and return the top element now let's see how we can do that this is your pop method this method takes no parameter and here we're checking if top of stack equals to minus one then we'll print stack underflow error that means our stack is empty if we see top of stack is minus one that means our stack is empty then we're storing the top value to this temp variable and we are printing the value of temp variable and then we're setting the top value to zero since when we created an array an integer array in java the default value is zero that's why we're inserting here zero and we're decreasing the size of top of stack variables so if we pop out the top element then our next top element would be the previous element okay that's why we're decreasing the size of this variable now if we call here pop then what's going to happen it will remove this element five and we can access this element by this index number so it will remove this element and it will return the element five and the five will be removed from our stack as well since we're just showing you here the stack representation actually we're working with this array and the size of this variable will be decreased to three so our stack will be represented something like this array will be represented something like this if we call this method again pop it will return four if we call this method pop again what's going to happen it will return and remove this element four from our stack and it will set to zero it will return four and four will be removed from our stack and the size of this variable will be changed to two now our top element is three and with this variable we can access the top element and this is why we're using top of array variable all right this is all about this push and pop operation hope you have understood push operation pop operation and create stack operation this create stack operation will takes bigger of one time complexity and bigger of one space complexity since we're creating the array at once and this variable 
this operation push operation will takes also bigger of one time and space complexity this pop operation also takes bigger of one time and space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation in this video we have explained create stack push and pop operation in the next video we'll talk about in the next video we'll talk about peak operation is empty operation is pull operation and delete stack operation see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about in this video we're going to talk about these four operations peak operation is empty operation is full operation and delete stack operation in the previous video we have talked about these three operations create stack push and pop operation now let's talk about this four operations first let's talk about peak operation all right in this video we're going to see this four method now let's talk about peak operation for peak operations this method takes no parameter inside here we're checking if top of stack equals to minus one then we are printing here stack is empty if not then we're printing the top value from our stack if we call this method and if you're given this array as a stack and here we have top of array equals to four and this array will be represented something like this since we're implementing stack using array if we call this method this method will return five because five is the top element in this stack and this is peak operations it's pretty simple and this operation will take bigger up one time and big up one space complexity hope you have understood peak operation now let's talk about rest of the operation this is is empty operation this operation will return true or false if the stack is empty then it will return true if the stack is not empty it will return false if we call this method is empty for this given stack then it will return false because the stack is not empty and for this method is full here we're checking if array dot length minus one equals to top of stack then we're returning it true if not we will return false for this given stack if we call this method it will return true because this because the size of the stack is full so it will return true then we have this method delete stack and here we're just setting r equals to null and top of stack equals to minus one if we call this method that will be set to null so arrow get deleted from our computer memory and the stack will be removed as well this stack is just a representation of our array so our stack is removed from our computer memory and all of the operation will take bigger of one time and space complexity this operation takes bigger of one time complexity and space complexity this operation also takes bigger of one time and space complexity this operation as well takes bigger of one time and space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation I have attached the source code in Java for stack implementation using array. Check the source file. If you have any question, if you have any suggestion, or if you have any issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to see stack implementation using linked list. We will implement this six method for linked list implementation in this video we're going to see how to implement this three method in the next video we'll see how to implement this three method now let's talk about create stack push and pop operation let's start off with create stack operations this is our code for stack implementation using linked list first we have this class node this is our node this node contains two attributes data and the next pointer we have your node head this is our head node for our linked list when you are calling this method we're initializing head to null pointer so our initial linked list is null and this is our head node okay head will be top for our stack and the stack will be represented something like this now stack is empty since the linked list is empty now let's talk about push operations this is the push method okay this method takes one parameter data inside here we're creating a new node and then we're going to check if head equals to null then head equals to new node if not new node dot next equals to head and head equals to new node now if we call this method with data one then we'll create a new node since the head of our linked list is null initially we'll move our head to this new node then the linked list will be represented something like this and this is our stack of length one and we have here one element on our stack and head will be our top element 
Now if you call this method push with 2 then we will create a new node with data 2. And here we will apply this else statement since head is not equals to null. So here we are going to say newnode.next equals to head. So newnode.next equals to head and head equals to new node. So head will point to this node. Our linked list will be represented something like this and our stack will be represented something like this. This is just a visual representation of stack and this is our head node okay and this is our top of our stack now if we call this method push with three then we'll then we'll create a new node with data three and here we're gonna say new node next equals to head so we'll connect to this node and we'll move a head pointed to this node then our linked list will be represented something like this and this is the representation of our stack and this is our head node okay this is how push method works and this is a stack this is a linked list but we're treating this linked list as a stack since we're inserting our data to the front and this linked list is represented something like this and in the stack we have three is our top element now if we made here peak operations the peak operations will return the value from our top of our stack so if we say return head dot data then it will return this value don't worry about that we'll explain every single details now let's talk about pop operation. This is our pop operations. This method takes no parameter. Inside here we're checking if head equals to null. Then we're gonna say stack is empty. Else print the value of our head node and move our head node to the next node. Okay. If we call pop method, what's gonna happen? So it will print the value three. We're not returning the value. We're just printing the value. We can return the value, but we're just printing the value here. Don't worry about that. If you want to return the value, you can return the value, but we're just printing here. Here we're going to print the value of our head node. And this is our head node will print 3. So this method will print 3. And we're going to move head to the next node. So if we move head to the next node, then we see there is nothing is pointing to this node. So this node will be removed by garbage collector from our computer memory. From our stack representation, this value 3 will be removed. Okay. Our link list will be represented something like this. If we call this method again, in this case the head we see 2 and the top of our stack is 2. And we will print the value of this head node that is 2. So we will print here 2 and we will move ahead to the next node. And there is nothing is pointing to this node so garbage collector will automatically remove this node from RAM. And this 2 will be removed from our stack representation. This is just a representation of our linked list. Okay. So our stack will be represented something like this. So this is our linked list and this is our stack representation. This is how we can implement a stack using linked list. It's not that much difficult, but you have to understood the concept. This push method will take bigger of one time and space complexity. And this pop operations also takes bigger of one time and space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. In the next video, we'll talk about peak is empty and delete stack method see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about stack implementation using linked list and this is the second part in this video we're going to implement this three method peak is empty and delete stack first let's talk about peak then we'll talk about is empty then we'll talk about delete stack now let's start off with this peak method so in this video, we're going to see this three method. Now let's talk about peak method. Let's say we're given this linked list and this linked list is represented as stack something like this. This is the top element. Okay. This method takes no parameter. Inside here, we're checking if head equals to null, we'll print stack is empty. If not, we'll print the value from our head node. If we call this method, this method will print four from our head node because the head node is four. We see in our stack, the top element is 4 so it's print 4 if we were given this stack and this linked list and the visualization of this linked list as a stack something like this if we call this method for this stack then it will return 3 because the value of our head node or the value of our top because the value of our head node is 3 and that means on the top of our stack we have 3 that's why it's print 3 Hope you have understood this peak method. This method will take speed up one time and space complexity. That means this method works in constant time and constant space complexity. Now let's talk about is empty. This is our is empty method. This method takes no parameter. Inside here we're checking if head equals to null, we're returning to 
if not we're gonna return false for this given stack if we call this method is empty it will return false because here is not null this method takes bigger of one time and space complexity this is super easy okay now let's talk about the last method delete stack and this is super interesting here we're just saying here equals to null so if we say here equals to null the entire linked list will be deleted that means the stack will be deleted if we remove this pointer from this node and if we point to this head to a null node that means to nothing and now we see that there is nothing pointing to this node so garbage scalator will remove this node from ram and then this node we see there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be removed by garbage collector and then this node there is there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be removed by garbage collector so this stack will be deleted as well because this stack is a visualization of our linked list since we're implementing stack using linked list this method will take bigger of one time and space complexity hope you've understood this video explanation i have attached the source code check the source code in the source code we have the implementation of all of our methods if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i will see you in the next video you are given a string containing just the characters this bracket determine if the input string is valid an input string is valid if open brackets must be closed by the same type of brackets and open brackets must be closed in the correct order note that an empty string is also considered valid if we have input this combination of bracket then the program should return true because this is a valid parenthesis if we have this combination of brackets then we should return true because this is valid combination if we have input like this then we should return false because this is invalid format now let's see my solutions in pseudocode all right now let's see how my solution might look like for sake of understanding let's assume this is our input string first i'll iterate through this string from left to right here we will have a hash table that will map closed bracket to corresponding opening brackets and also we have a stack here and here i have the algorithm for this solution now let's see how this algorithm works okay here for i from 0 to len input minus 1 so for this string it will work from 0 to 3 right because len of this input is 4 4 minus 1 is 3 for first iteration of this loop the value of i equals to 0 for value i equals to 0 it points to this bracket in the string right and here we have if condition if hash table dot contains key input i it points to this first character in this string and that is this bracket does this character exist in our hash table as key no it not exist then this condition will be false all right then it will push to the stack this character all right then we have here this character for the next iteration of i the value will be 1 when we have i equals to 1 then it will points to this bracket in this string hash table dot contains key input i and that means this character does this opening bracket exist in our hash table as key no it not exist then it will push to the stack for the next iteration the value of i will be 2 so in this time it points to this bracket this closed brackets hash table dot contains key this bracket does this bracket exist in our hash table yes it does so it pop out whatever we have in this stack and it store in this variable pop this pop function remove the element from our stack from the top of our stack and it's return that value and here pop equals to this bracket and here we're going to check does pop in this case this bracket not equals to hash table dot get input charret i input charret i is this bracket right we have in our hash table and the value against this bracket we have this opening bracket so this bracket and this bracket is a match so it will not return false now for next iteration the value of i will be 
3 and it will points to this close bracket and this bracket exists in our hash table so it will pop out this this bracket from this stack and it will be stored in this pop variable now we have here pop equals to this bracket and here we're going to check does pop not equals to hash table gate input char at i so it will points to this input and whatever we have in our hash table against this we have here this bracket right and this bracket and the value of pop equal so so it is false then it will not return and now the iteration over and we have here empty stack if we have empty stack after all the iteration that means this is a valid parenthesis so then we're going to just return stack dot is empty if we have a stack empty then it will return true so for this function call it will return just true for this input string this will return true all right because we have empty stack at the end and this solution takes bigger of n time complexity because we have to visit is character in the string once the solution takes space complexity bigger of n where n is the length of the given string for the worst case scenario we might have n number of element in our stack so space complexity bigger of n hope this concept now clear if you have any doubt if you have any question let me know i'll be glad to help thanks for watching this video i will see you in another video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a coding interview problem decode string this is a stack problem in this problem you're given a string the string is an encoded string you have to decode that string how should we decode this string here we have three then a we have to repeat this a three times if we repeat this a three times then we get triple a then we have two and then we have bracket inside this bracket we have bc here we have to repeat bc twice if we repeat bc twice then the string will be represented something like this this is our encoded string and if we decode these strings we get these strings so for this input we have to return these strings for example if you're given these strings we have to decode these strings this is an encoded string first what do you have to do first we have to repeat this c twice if we repeat this c twice we get something like this double c and on the left of 2c we have a so let's insert here a now we have to repeat a c c three times if we repeat a c c three times then the string will be represented something like this so this is the encoded string and this is the decoded string for this given encoded string we have to return this decoded string for example if we're given this string we have to decode these strings first we have two then we have a b c there is no nested braces so we don't have to worry about that here we have to repeat a b c twice if we repeat a b c twice then we get a b c a b c then we have three c d so we have to repeat c d three times so c d c d c d then we have this string e f so let's insert here e f so this is our encoded string and this is our decoded string if we are given this string we have to return this string hope you have understood how to decode the given string in this problem you might assume the given string is always valid now how we can approach this problem when you encountered parenthesis problem we tend to use a stack yes this is a stack problems to solve this problem we have to use two stack one is called num stack and another is called string stack let's see how we can solve this problem using two stack let's say we're given these strings and we have here two stack num stack and string stack and we need two variable a string builder and a temp variable and we'll iterate through the string from left to right the first character in the string is a three this three is inside a string so we're treating three as a character when you found a digit we'll run a loop to find out the digit if the digit 
if the digit is greater than 9 okay since we have only one number here 3 so let's insert 3 to our num stack now let's move to the next character the next character is opening brackets when you found a opening brackets what we're going to do we're going to insert whatever we have in our string builder variable to string stack we have here empty string so we have inserted here empty string and we'll set this string builder to empty string the string builder already empty string so nothing need to be done here now let's go to the next character the next character is a whenever you found a character is a english alphabet what we're going to do we're going to insert that character to string builder then let's move to the next character the next character we see closing brackets whenever we found closing brackets will pop out the top element from string stack in this case empty string and the string will assign to 10th variable we have here empty string so let's pop out this empty string and let's assign this empty string to this 10th variable since this 10th variable is already empty string so nothing need to be done here now the next thing we're going to do we're going to pop out the top element from num stack and that is three now let's repeat whatever we have at string builder three times if we repeat a three times using a loop and we're going to insert a to our 10th variable and we're going to append it okay so if we repeat a three times and if we append 3a to this 10th variable then we get something like this then we're going to change this string builder with the 10th variable so string builder equals to triple a and temp equals to empty string and the temp variable will be reset to empty string because we'll use this temp variable in a if statement so this temp variable is a temporary variable we'll lose the value when we'll move to the next iteration we'll see when we'll go through our pseudo code then our next character next character is a digit so let's insert two to our num stack then let's move to the next character the next character is opening brackets whenever you found opening brackets what are we going to do we're going to we're going to insert whatever we have at string builder variable to string stack so we're going to insert a a a to our string stack and we'll set string builder to empty string now let's move to the next character the next character is english alphabet so let's insert b to our string builder and we're going to append b to our string builder then next character is c c is c is english alphabet so let's so let's insert c to our string builder now let's move to the next character the next character is closing bracket whenever you found closing bracket what we're going to do we're going to pop out the top element from string stack in this case triple a and we're going to assign this triple a to 10th variable then the next thing we're going to pop out the top element from num stack in this case two and we're going to repeat whatever we have at string builder variable two times using a loop and we're going to append bc by repeating two times to this variable temp so it will be represented something like this a a a bc bc now we're going to mutate or change this string builder variable using this temp variable so our string builder variable equals to a a a bc bc and we'll lose this value for temp variable since this is a temporary variable because we're using this variable inside a if statement when we're done with our current iterations we'll lose the value okay so temp equals to empty then in the next iteration we're out of our string binary so we're done now what are we going to do we're going to convert our string builder to string and we'll return this string our answer for this given string is this string so if you are given this string we have to return this string now let's take another example for better understanding now let's say we're given this string we have here two stack and we have here two variables string builder and temp so let's iterate through the string from left to right first we have the character three three is a digit so let's insert three to our num stack this is a single digit if we have a digit that is greater than nine we will run a loop to get the number and the number will, will insert to our num stack since three is a single digit so let's insert three to our num stack then let's move to the next character the next character is opening brackets whenever we found opening brackets what we will do we will insert sb to 
string stack and we will set sb to empty string. So let's insert here empty string since we have sb equals to empty string. And we will set sb to empty string since we have sb equals to empty string. Nothing need to be done here. Now let's go to the next character. Next character is A. It is English alphabet. So let's insert A to our string builder. Then let's move to the next character. The next character is 2. 2 is a digit. So let's insert 2 to our num stack. Now let's move to the next character. Next character is opening brackets. Whenever you found opening brackets, what we're going to do, we're going to insert whatever we have at sb variable to string stack. So let's insert here this A to this string stack and let's set sb to empty string. Now let's move to the next character. Next character is C. So let's add C to our string builder. Then next character. Next character is closing bracket. Whenever we found closing bracket, what we'll do, we'll remove the top element from string stack and we'll assign that element to our 10th variable. So let's pop out this A from this string stack and let's assign it to this 10th variable. The next thing we have to do, we have to pop out the top element from num stack and that is 2. So let's pop out 2 and let's repeat whatever we have at string builder variable two times using a loop. If we repeat C two times, we get CC and let's append cc to this temp variable so a cc now let's set this temp variable to the string builder so string builder equals to a cc and since this temp is a temporary variable so we'll lose this value now let's move to the next character the next character is closing bracket whenever we found closing bracket we'll pop out the top element from string stack and we'll assign that value to temp variable we have your empty string so let's pop out empty string and let's assign it to temp variable the temp variable already empty string so nothing need to be done here then the next thing we have to pop out the top element from num stack that is three and let's repeat whatever we have at sb variable three times if we repeat sec three times we get sec 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 and let's add that repetitions to this temp variable so we get sec 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 and now let's set this temp variable to this string builder variable so you get string builder equals to acc 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 since temp is a temporary variable so we'll lose the value of temp variable in the next iteration now let's move to the next character now we see that we're out of string boundary so we're done now what we're going to do we're going to convert this string builder into string and we're going to return this string this is how we can solve this problem this solution will take bigger of n time complexity since we are traversing the given string from left to right once and it will take bigger of in space complexity because you have to construct two stack num stack str stack also string builder and tenth variable actually for the worst case it might take bigger of four in time complexity actually for the worst case it might take bigger of four in space complexity and that's equivalent to bigger of n because four is a constant we can ignore constant in complexity analysis now let's see the pseudo code this is your pseudo code to solve this problem we have this function decode string it takes the string then we're creating two stack num stack and str stack then we're creating a variable string builder then we're calculating the length of our given string then we're running a loop for i from 0 to length minus 1 inside here we're getting the current character and we're checking if the current character is a digit then we're getting the number by subtracting the ASCII value by subtracting the ASCII value of zero from our current digit then we're running a loop if our number is greater than 10 then we have to get the number and we're inserting that number to the num stack if your current character is opening bracket then we're going to convert the string builder into string and we're going to insert that to our string stack and we're going to set a string builder to empty string else if, if we see our current character is closing bracket then we're going to pop out the top element from our num stack and then we're going to pop out the top element from our string stack and we're going to create a new string builder and here temp is the temporary string builder and we're running a loop to repeat the string builder repeat times okay and we're setting string builder equals to temp if not if we found our current character is the English alphabet, we're going to append that character to our string builder. At the end, we'll convert our string builder. In this case, it should be string builder, not st. 
our string builder to string and we'll return that and this is how it works the solution will take big of in time complexity and big of in space complexity for the worst case it might take big of for in space complexity that's equivalent to big of n this is our num stack and this is our string stack this is our given string and here we have string builder and we have here temp variable first we have our digit so let's insert to our num stack then we have our opening bracket when you have opening bracket we we'll insert whatever we have at string builder to our string stack we have empty so let's insert here empty and let's set our string builder to empty and that's already empty then we have our character let's insert character to our string builder then we have closing bracket whenever we found closing bracket we will pop out top element from string stack we will add that to our temp variable temp variable is already empty now let's pop out the top element from num stack that is 2 and let's repeat a white if we repeat a white if we add that to our temp variable so we get temp equals to a a and that's what we're doing using this for loop then we're going to set this temp to this string builder okay and that's what we're doing right here and we will lose the value of temp variable when we move to the next iteration since we are declaring this temp variable inside this else if statement then we have this digit 2 so let's insert to our num stack then we have opening bracket when we found opening brackets we will convert our string builder to string and we will add that to our string stack so let's insert here and let's set it to empty string then we have c so let's add c to our string builder then we have our closing brackets when you have closing bracket we will pop out the top element from string stack and we will add that to our temp variable so let's add here a and a and that's what we're doing right here we'll pop out the top element and we're adding that to temp variable then we're going to pop out the top element from num stack and we're going to repeat c two times if we repeat c two times and if we add that to our temp we get a a c c we're just appending here okay using this statement temp dot append sb and then we're going to set this temp to this sb variable so we get a a c c and we'll lose the value of this temp variable so let's remove it in the next iteration we'll move to the out of string boundary so we're done and then we'll convert this string builder into a string and we'll return the string so for this given input we have to return this string this is how we can solve this problem hope you have understood this video explanations the source code is attached to this video check that out if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about q data structure q is abstract data structure similar to stack unlike stack q is open at the both end one end is always used to insert data and the other end is used to remove data inserting data in a queue is called in queue and removing data from queue is called dq here we have some peoples they're standing in line let's say they're standing in a line and they want to book ticket the first person who comes to this line first will get the ticket first first this person will get the ticket then this person will get the ticket then this person will get the ticket and so on if we want to add a new person the person should stand at the end of this line so right here and here we see the first person will get the tickets so first in first out q data structure works in first in first out principles the first person who comes first will go out first okay in this line we see that this person come first so this person will get the ticket first from the ticket counter so this is called fipo principles first in first out inserting data is called in queue and removing data is called dq if we want to add a new person to this line then the person should stand to the end and the person from the front will get the ticket this is called fipo principle and this is the entire concept of queue data structure now let's talk about operation in queue in queue this operation will add an element to the end of a queue dq it will remove an element from the front of a queue is empty it will check if the queue is empty is full it will check if the queue is full pick it will get the value of the element from the front without removing it and these are common operations in queue that we can perform 
let's say we're given this queue and we we have inserted data to this queue using this nq operation if we dequeue it will remove the element from the front and it will return that element if we made this operation it will check if the queue is empty it will return true if the queue is not empty it will return false is full in this case it will return true if the queue is full if the queue is not full this operation will return false this peak operation will return element from the front without removing the front element now let's talk about application of queue we use queue for cpu scheduling when the data is transferred asynchronously between two processes the queue is used for synchronization for example io buffer pipes file io etc for handling the interruption in real-time systems we use queue in call center phone systems use queues to hold people calling them in order these are the application of queue hope you have understood what is a queue data structure how it works which operation we can perform using queues and the application of queues from the next video we will start implementing queue from scratch see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about queue implementation options we can implement queue using array and we can implement queue using linked list for array implementation we have two types of queues linear queue and circular queue for linked list implementation we have only one type of queue that is linear queue okay and in this section of this course we'll see linear queue and circular queue using array and linear queue using linked list in linear queue implementation of array uh, we might face some problems and that's problem we can overcome using circular queue all right guys in this section we'll see all the implementation options thanks for watching this video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about linear queue using array we're going to implement queue using array in this video we're going to implement this seven method create queue nq dq peak is empty is full and delete queue now let's start off with create queue this is our linear queue using array this is our class here we have array to variable front and rear front mean front of our queue rear mean the end of our queue create queue nq dq peak is empty is full and delete queue now let's start off with create queue method this is our create queue method this method takes one parameter side here we're creating the array and we're initializing front and rear to minus one if we call this method with five then we're creating an array this array will treat like a queue data structure and we have these two variable front and rear they will point to minus one and they're on left on our index zero we have your empty cell okay empty cell means in java programming language when you create an integer array the array are filled with zero we're representing empty you can consider we have zero in our empty cell for resetting the cell we'll use the concept of zero we'll set zero but we're not showing you the zero when you have empty cell you can consider we have zero now let's talk about nq method this method takes one parameter value then inside here we're checking if the queue is already full then we'll print queue overflow if red equals to minus one that means if the queue is empty we'll set front to zero and rear plus plus will move rear to the next and we'll insert our value to our rear okay if not if we have some element in our queue then we will move rear to the next and we'll insert our current element to our queue if we call this method in queue with 10 we'll insert 10 to our first cell and we'll move front to the next and rear to the next if we call this method again in queue with 20 we'll insert 20 to this cell here and we'll move rear to the next okay first we'll move rear here and then we'll insert if we call this method again we'll move rear here and we'll insert here 13. if we call this method again with 14 we'll move a rear and we'll insert 14 since we have some elements in our queue then if we call this method again then we'll move rear to the next and we'll insert 50. if we call another method with 60 then it will throw an error queue overflow because the queue is already full this is how nq method works 
this method will take bigger of one time and bigger of one space complexity. This create queue method will take bigger of one time complexity but order of n space complexity since we are creating an array of size n. Now let's talk about dq. This is your dq operation. This method takes no parameter. We are checking if red equals to minus 1. That means if the queue is empty. That means if the queue is empty, we will print queue under flow error. If not, we are going to print the value from our front and we will set front to 0. When I set front to 0, that means we are going to set that value to the default value. And we're going to move front to the next. If we found front is greater than rare in that case, if we delete the value 50, then we'll move rare and front to the minus one. If we call this method dq, it will return the value 10 and it will set this value to zero and front will move to here. Okay, it print 10. When it's returning for this dq, we can return, but we're just printing the value and we have set it. The value to zero and we're not showing you zero because zero is the default value when you create integer array in java then if we call this method again dq then it will print 20 and it will remove this that means it will set to zero and front will be moved to this cell so it will be represented something like this and this is how this dq method works this method takes bigger of one time and bigger of one space complexity now let's talk about peak operation this is pretty simple. This method takes no parameter. We're checking if front equals to minus one. If the queue is empty, then we're printing queue is empty. Else, we're printing the value from the front. If we call this method fig, it will print 30. It will not remove anything. It will just return the value from the top or it will print the value. We're just printing here, we're not returning. So for this queue, it will print 30. This peak operation will take order of one time and space complexity. Now let's talk about is empty operation. This operation takes no parameter. Here we are checking if front equals to minus 1. If we found front equals to minus 1, then we are returning 2 because if front is pointing to minus 1, uh, the queue is empty. Else we are returning false. We see that the queue is not empty, front is not minus 1. So if we call is empty, it will return false since the queue is not empty. And this operation will take big up one time and big up one space complexity. Now let's talk about is full operation. If we found rare equals to array dot length minus one, then we'll return two. For this queue, we see rare equals to array dot length minus one. So if we call this method, it will return true. Don't worry, what we have on the left, we see here the two cell empty, the first two cell. But we're not using this first two cell. We'll talk about more when we talk about circular queue. Okay? If we removed all the elements from this queue, only then we can start inserting from the left. If we removed 14 and 30 from Q, if we have only 15, also we can't insert anything to our Q. That's why we have to learn circular Q data structure. We'll talk about that in the next video. This operation will take bigger of one space and bigger of one time complexity. Now let's talk about delete Q operation. And we're just setting array to null. If we set array to null, the array will be deleted from our computer memory. So if we call this function, the array will be deleted. And this is delete key operation, super simple. You have to set the array to null. And this operation will take big up one time and big up one space complexity. And this is the linear queue implementation video explanation. Hope you have understood this video explanations. I have attached the source code and in the source code, we have all the method for linear queue using array. Check the source code for the complete implementation of linear queue using array. Hope you have understood this video explanations. If you have an issue, if you have any question, let us know. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next video. Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to implement circular queue using array. We're going to implement this seven method for circular queue. Create queue, in queue, dq, pick, is empty, is pull, and delete queue. In the previous video, we saw that when you implement linear queue using array we encounter a problem we have unused cell and that cell we can't use and that's not super efficient and to solve that issue we can use circular queue now let's talk about circular queue first we're gonna see this method create queue then we'll talk about all of the method one by one first let's talk about create queue 
this is our class okay here we have this seven method and we have array then front and rear and this is the size of our array this is our create queue method this method takes one parameter length and here we are creating an array of the given size and then we're going to initialize front and rear to minus one and size equals to length if we call this method with six then we're going to create an array of length six this is an array of length six and this array is represented in circular fashion something like this we have index number zero one two three four five initially our array is empty and front and rear is pointing to minus one and the size equals to six now let's see how we can insert data to our queue now let's talk about nq method this is our nq method this method takes one parameter here first we're going to check is full if the queue is full we're going to print queue is full we'll see this method in this video don't worry about it then we have else if front equals to minus one we'll set front to zero and then we're going to calculate rear rear plus one modulus size then array rear equals to value if our rear goes out of our array boundary then we'll move our rear to the first cell okay now let's see how it works if we call nq10 now what's gonna happen we see our queue is empty so we're gonna set front to zero and then we're gonna calculate a rear so zero modulus six here size is six zero modulus six is zero so rear will point to this cell and here in this cell we're going to insert the value the value is 10 so let's insert here 10 and let's move front and rear to this cell now our queue is represented something like this this is front and this is rear we have only one element in our queue if we call again in q20 now we're going to calculate rear a rear will be evaluated one so rear will point here and we're going to insert here 20. if we call this method again with 30 rear will move to this cell and here we're going to insert 30. If we call again with 40 then we're going to move a rear to this cell rear plus one modulus six here size is six so three modulus six equals to three so rear will point here and here we're going to insert 40. then if we call this method again rear will point here and here we're going to insert 50. again if we call this method in q60 then we're going to move rear here and we're going to insert here 60. this is how nq method works hope you have understood this nq method this method takes constant time and constant space complexity this create queue method takes a bigger of one time complexity and a bigger of n space complexity where n is the length of the array this is our circular queue okay this circular queue is represented something like this in a circle okay we see this is a circle 10 20 30 40 50 and 60. this is our front and this is our rear now let's talk about is empty method here we're going to check if rear equals to minus one then we're going to print two if rear equals to minus one that means our queue is empty if our rear is not minus one we'll return false if we call this method this method will return false because for this queue we see rear equals to five rear is not minus one so this method will return false now let's talk about is pool method this is is pool method this method takes no parameter here we're going to check if front equals to zero and rear equals to and rear equals to size minus one we see rear equals to size minus one rear is five size is six so six minus one is five rear so rear equals to size minus one so in this case we'll return true and here we have this if statement if front equals to rear plus one then we'll return true and we'll get to this statement after doing dq operations now let's see dq operations how we can make dq operations to this queue if we call this method is full it will return true because this queue is full and we'll get to this statement later in this video now let's talk about a dq method this method takes no parameter inside here we're checking if is empty if this function return true that means our queue is empty 
then we're printing q is empty if not then we're getting the front element and we're printing that element and we're checking if front equals to rear then we're setting front equals to rear equals to minus one else front equals to front plus one modulus side okay if we call this method this method will print 10 and will move front to this element we're not changing the value of this first we're not changing the value of first cell or just skipping the value we can set the value to the default value zero for java programming language but we're just skipping the value and front will point to this element this is your front okay in our circle we see that front is now pointing to this element and this is your rear if we call this method again it will return 20 and front will move to the next and then if we call again it will return 30 front will move to the next then if we call again it will return 40 and front will move to the next now if we call again it will return 50 and front will move to the next now we see a rear and front is now pointing to the same element and here we see in our circle a rear and front is pointing to this element and this is how this deco operation works this method will take big up one time and big up one space complexity now let's get back to our nq operations if we call this method nq with 70 then what's going to happen our rear will move to this cell and here we'll insert 70 at the place of 10 okay then if we call again then it will replace this value 20 with 80 if we call again with 90 then rear will move here and this value will be updated with 90 if we call again with 100 this value will be updated with 100 if we call again with 110 then this value will be updated with 110 okay now we see that rear is pointing to this element and front is pointing to this element now let's go back to our is pull operation this is your is pull operations here we see front equals to rear plus one and we see here our q is full okay and this condition is true in this case a uh, front equals to rear plus one front equals to rear plus one so rear is four four plus one is front so it will return true and this is the if statement hope you've understood this if statement if we call this method this method will return true this is how this is full method works this will works in constant time in constant this method will works in constant time and in constant space complexity. Now let's talk about peak operations. It's super simple. First we're checking if our queue is empty or printing queue is empty. If not, we're just printing the value from our front. And here our front is 60, so it will print 60. If we call this method, it will print 60. We're not returning the value. We can return the value as well, but we're just printing here. This method will take big up one time and big up one space complexity. Now let's talk about a delete queue method here we're just setting our array equals to null so our array will be set to null and we're just setting rear and front equals to minus one so a rear and uh, front will points to minus one and this array will be deleted from our computer memory okay and this entire array will be deleted this is our circular queue this is the representation this is just a visual representation of our array okay this array this array is treating as a queue. This is how this method works. And this method will take big up one time and big up one space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. Hope you have understood the concept of circular queue. Using circular queue, we can use our unused cell, okay? We're not wasting any computer memory space. Hope you have understood this method. Hope you have understood what is a circular queue. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement linear queue using linked list in this video we're going to implement linear queue using linked list data structure and we'll implement this six method create queue in queue dq peak is empty and delete queue now let's see create queue method then we'll talk about all of the method one by one this is our class this class contains one node this node contains two attributes a value and a pointer next here we have front and rear of our queue and we have here six method now let's talk about create queue 
This is our create queue method. This method takes no parameter and inside here we're setting front and rear to null. Now if I call this method create queue, then we're going to assign front and rear pointer to null node. Okay. Here front and rear pointer is pointing to null node. Now let's see in queue method. This is our in queue method. This method takes one parameter value. Inside here we're creating a new node. Okay. And we're checking if front equals to null, then we're setting front and rear to the new node. Else we're gonna say rear dot next equals to new node and rear equals to new node. If we call this method with 10, then we're gonna create a new node and then we're gonna move front and rear to this node. So the link list will be represented something like this. This is our queue, okay? This link list is treating as a queue data structure. We have front and we have a rear. Let me call this method again with 20. Then here we are creating a new node with value 20. And what are we going to do? We're going to say here rear.next equals to new node. So we're going to connect this pointer to this node and we're going to move a rear to this node. So the queue will be represented something like this. We have front and we have rear. This is your front and this is rear. If we call this method again with 30, then we're going to create a new node and then we're going to assign this pointer to this node by saying rear.next equals to new node. Then we're going to move a rear to this node. Then our link list will be represented something like this. This is a link list. This link list is treating as a queue data structure. We have here front and we have a rear. This is how this NQ method works. This method takes big up one time and big up one space complexity. This method create queue it takes big of one time and big up one space complexity. Now let's talk about peak method. This method takes no parameter. Here we're checking if front equals to null, then we're printing queue is empty, else we're printing the value from our front. Okay, we call this method pick, it will print 10 from the front, okay? And it will do nothing, it will just print 10. We can return the value 10 from our front node, but we're just printing the value. You can return it as well. Now let's talk about is empty operations. This operation takes no parameter. Inside here we're checking if front equals to null, then we're returning true. Else we're returning false. If we call this method for this link list, then it will return false because front is not pointing to null node. And we see this is not an empty queue. That's why it's written false. This operation takes big up one time and big up one space complexity. This operation this peak operation also takes bigger up one time and bigger up one space complexity. Now let's talk about a DQ operation. This is your DQ operation. This method takes no parameter inside here. We're checking if front equals to null, then we're printing Q is empty. Else we're going to print the value from our front and then we're going to move front to the next node. And we're checking if front equals to null, then we're setting rear and front to null. If we found front equals to null, then we are setting our rear pointer to null node. If we call this method, this method will print and remove the value from our front. Okay, this is our link list and it will return this value 10 and it will remove this node. Okay, and this front will be moved to this node. Then our link list will be represented something like this. And here we're just moving our front. Okay, we're not removing this node. Whenever garbage collector found there is nothing is pointing to this node this node will be automatically removed by garbage collector from ram so the link list will be represented something like this if we call this method again it will print 20 and it will move front to this node so our link list will be represented something like this and garbage collector will remove this node from ram if we call this method again this method will print 30 and it will move front to null node since front equals to null this rear will be moved to this node as well to this null node and our link list will be represented something like this and there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be 
removed by garbix collector so our link list will be represented something like this now we see our queue is empty this operation takes big up one time and big up one space complexity and this is how dq method works hope you've understood how dq method works now let's talk about delete queue method here we're just setting front and rear to null if we set front to null and rear to null then this link list will be removed by garbage collector automatically first it will remove this node because there is nothing is pointing to this node then this node there is nothing is pointing to this node this node will be removed by garbage collector then this node there is nothing is pointing to this node so this node will be removed by garbage collector and we see our link list is empty and this is how garbage collector will delete the queue from ram that means our link list hope you've understood this method this method will take big up one time and big up one space complexity hope you've understood this video explanation hope you've understood how to implement linear queue using link list if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about tree data structure tree is a non-linear hierarchical data structure that consists of nodes connected by edges. this is an example of a tree we have nodes and we have left and right child on the left we have nodes and that node contains another left and right child and so on for this node we have only right child we don't have any left child for this node we have left child right child for this node we have left child right child for this node for this node for this and for this node there is no left and right child and this nodes are called lip node and the top node is called the root node and we'll talk about that when we will talk about three terminologies this is an example of a tree data structure arrays link list stack and queues are linear data structures that stores data sequentially in order to perform any operations in a linear data structures the time complexity grows as the data size grows but this is not acceptable in today's computational world different tree data structures allows quicker and easier access to the data as it is a non-linear data structure so we understand that for linear data structure we might have problems whenever data size grows our time complexity will be increased for linear data structure t data structures come into the picture to solve that issues why should we learn tree data structure different tree data structures allow quicker and easier access to the data as it is a non-linear data structure and this is a non-linear data structure this is a tree representation we can create a tree using link list or array data structure and we will see all in this section don't worry about that now let's talk about different types of a tree we have many different type of trees but in this course we will talk about especially for this five types of a tree binary tree binary search tree avl tree binary heap and try we'll talk about that all of this data structure in this course now let's talk about applications of tree data structure binary search tree data structures are used to quickly check whether an element is present in a set or not heap is a kind of tree that is used for heap short a modified version of tree called tries is used in modern routers to store routing information most popular databases use tree data structure compilers use a syntax tree to validate the syntax of every program you write and there are many applications of tree data structure in this course we'll talk about tree data structure in details in the next video we'll talk about tree terminologies see you in the next video in this video we're going to talk about three terminologies first let's talk about a node a node contains two attributes a data and a reference or pointer this is a node this node contains three data here we have two pointers and one data this is a 
node of a double linked list. In order to represent a tree, we use array or linked list. Let's say this is a tree data structure. How this tree data structure is represented? Something like this. We have 10 and we have left child and right child. And on the left we are storing the address of left child and on the right we are storing the address of right child. Something like this. And we are representing 0x002, 0x003 as the address. Okay? And this is how tree is represented. And here this is a node, this is a node and this is a node. So in this tree we see 10 is a node, 20 is a node and 30 is a node. Now let's talk about root. What is root? The topmost node of a tree is called root. This is the root of this tree. This is the topmost node. The topmost node is called the root node of a tree. Now let's talk about is. What is is? Is is the link between any two nodes. Here we see this is a link. This is a link. This is a link. This is a link this one this one and this one this all are called is so we see the link is called is this link are in between two nodes so this link are called is now let's talk about leaf what is leaf node nodes with no children is called leaf node here we see this node 40 has no children so this is a leaf node this node 50 has no children so this is a leaf node this node and this node has no children so this two nodes is called a leaf node the next terminology is ancestor what is ancestor ancestor means parents grandparent great grandparent and so on so what is the ancestor of this node 40 ancestor of this node 40 is the parent this is the parent this is the grandparent and this is the great Gant parent. So the ancestor of this node 40 is 30, 20, and 10. The node itself is also the ancestor of the node. Okay. The node itself, the ancestor of the node. So the ancestor of this node 40 is 40, 30, 20, and 10. So here this 60 is not the ancestor of this node 40. The ancestor of this node 40 is 40, 30, 20, and 10. What is the ancestor of this node 60? The ancestor of this node 60, this node 60 itself also. So 60, the parent is 20 and the grandparent is 10. So the ancestor of this node 60 is 60, 20 and 10. What is the ancestor of this node 50? The ancestor of this node 50 is 50, 30, 20 and 10. Hope you've understood what is ancestor. Now let's talk about next terminology. The next terminology is height of node. Now let's talk about height of node. Height of a node is the length of the path from the node to the deepest node. So what is the height of this node? The deepest node we see is 50 or 40. So the height of this node is 1 and 2. We have two edges in between this node and the deepest node. So the height of this node 20 is 2. The height of this node is 1, 2, and a 3. So what is the height of this node? The height of this node is 1. Because the deepest node here we see this node 80. So the height of this node 70 is 1. Now let's talk about depth of node. The depth of a node is the length of the path from root to the node. So what is the depth of this node? Ages we have in between root and this node is 2. So 1 and 2. So the depth of this node 60 is a 2. So what is the depth of this node? The edges we have in between root and to this node is 1, 2 and 3. So the depth of this node 50 is a 3. What is the depth of this node? The depth of this node is 2, 1 and 2. What is the depth of this root node? And that is 0 because there is no edges in between root and node and this node because this is the root node hope you've understood height of a node and depth of a node now let's talk about height of tree what is height of a tree height of tree is the length of path from root to the deepest node this is our root and this is our deepest node so the height of this tree is one 
two and three. We have three edges, so the height of this tree is three. Now let's talk about depth of tree. The depth of tree is the same as depth of root node. The depth of root node is zero because there is no edges in between root node and this node 10 because this is the root node. So the depth of this tree is zero. Hope you have understood tree terminologies. In the next video, we're going to talk about predecessor and successor. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about tree terminologies. In this video, we're going to talk about predecessor and successor. Predecessor of a node is the immediate previous node in e node tower cell of a binary tree. Let's say we're given this binary tree. The in order tower cell of this binary tree is okay. So we can get this list by traversing this binary tree in order. So now if we say what is the predecessor of this node 9? So we have to find out the predecessor of this node 9. We have to find out first the in order tower cell. This is the in order tower cell. In the in order tower cell, the immediate previous node of 9 is called predecessor. So for this node 9, the predecessor is 4. Okay. So the predecessor of this node 9 is 4. This node. Now if we say what is the predecessor of this node 6? So first let's find out 6 in this in order tower cell. Here we find out 6 and the immediate previous node of 6 is 12. So the predecessor of this node 6 is a 12. What is the predecessor of this node 10? First let's find out the 10 in this list and here we see this is a 10. The immediate previous node of 10 is this node 2. So the predecessor of this node 10 is this node 2. Hope you have understood what is predecessor of a node. Now let's talk about successor of a node. Now let's talk about successor. Successor of a node is the immediate next node in, in order traversal of a binary tree. So what is the successor of this node 9? So this is the node 9 and the immediate next node is 2. So the successor of this node 9 is this node 2. So the successor of this node 9 is 2. Now what is the successor of this node 6? First, let's find out 6 in this in order tower cell. Here we find out 6 and the immediate next node is 13. So the successor of this node 6 is 13. What is the successor of this node 3? First, let's find out 3 in the in order tower cell. Here we find out 3. Now the next node, the immediate next node of 3 in this in order tower cell is 14. So successor of this node 3 is this node 14. Hope you've understood what is predecessor and what is successor. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about what is a binary tree. A binary tree is a tree data structure in which is parent node can have at most two children. This is an example of a binary tree. This node has two children, this node has two children, this node, this node, and for this node, there is no children. In the definition of binary tree, we see that each parent node can have at most two children. So, by the definition, we can say this is a binary tree. This is a binary tree as well. This node has two children, this node has two children, this node has two children. This node has no children, this node has no children, this node 7 has no children, and this node 3 has no children. So it follows the definition of binary tree. So this is a binary tree as well. This tree is also a binary tree. This node has two children, this node has two children, this node has two children. And all leaf nodes, we see, has no children. This node 4 has no children, this node 5 has no children, this node 4 has no children, this node 5 has no children. So by the definition, we can say this tree is a 
binary tree. These are the example of binary tree. Now let's see some more examples. This is a binary tree, okay? This node has two children. This node has two children. This node has two children. This node has no children. This node has no children. This node has no children. This node has only one children and this node has no children. In the definition of binary tree, we see that every node should have at most two children. This tree is following the properties of binary tree. So this is a valid binary tree. This is also a binary tree. This node has one children. This node has one children. This node has one children. This node has no children. So a node can has at most two children. Here we see this three node has one children and this node has no children. So this is a valid binary tree. This is a binary tree as well. This is called left skewed binary tree. This node has one children. This node, this node has one children and this node has no children. So this is a valid binary tree. This is also a valid binary tree. This is called right skewed binary tree. We have one children for this node. This node has one children. This node has one children. This node has no children. So this is a valid binary tree as well. Hope you've understood what is a binary tree. In a tree, if we see a node contains at most two children, then we can say the tree is a binary tree. Hope you've understood what is a binary tree. Now let's see some applications of binary tree. Binary tree is used for easy and quick access to data. In router algorithms, we use binary tree. To implement a heap data structure, we use a binary tree and compiler uses binary tree for building syntax tree. We can validate code using syntax tree and in syntax tree, we use a binary tree. Hope you've understood what is a binary tree and the applications of binary tree. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about different types of binary tree. In this video, we're going to talk about full binary tree, perfect binary tree and complete binary tree. Let's start off with full binary tree. What is a full binary tree? A binary tree is a full binary tree if every node has zero or two children. This is a full binary tree. This node has two children. This node has two children. This node has two children. This node, this node, this node, and this node has no children. That means there's four nodes, four, six, seven, and three has zero children. So this is a full binary tree. Here, this is a full binary tree as well. This node has two children. This node has two children. And these are leap nodes. This node has zero children. So this is a full binary tree. For this tree, we see this tree is also a full binary tree. This node has two children. This node has two children. For this node two, four, and five has zero children. So you can say this is a full binary tree. Hope you've understood what is a full binary tree. Now let's talk about perfect binary tree. What is a perfect binary tree? A binary tree is a perfect binary tree in which all the internal nodes have two children and all leaf nodes are at the same level. This is an example of perfect binary tree. This node has two children and these two nodes are leaf nodes from the definition of leaf nodes, we know that leaf nodes has no children. And we see they're in the same level, these two leaf nodes in the same level. So this is a perfect binary tree. Here this is also a perfect binary tree. This node contains two children, this node contains two children, this node contains two children. And we have here four leaf nodes. Leaf node has no children. and the leaf nodes are in the same level. We see that they're in the same level. So this is a perfect binary tree. This is also a perfect binary tree. This node contains two children. 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 
this node contains two children for this node this node also contains two children and this node is also contains two children and these are all leaf nodes okay the nodes 8 19 11 12 13 14 and 15 are leaf nodes and the leaf nodes are in the same level so this is a perfect a binary tree hope you have understood what is a perfect a binary tree now let's talk about complete binary tree what is a complete binary tree a binary tree is a complete binary tree if all the levels are completely filled except possibly the last level and the last level has all keys as left as possible this is an example of complete binary tree this is an example of complete binary tree as well and here we see the last level has all keys as left as possible we see these are the leaf nodes and this is the last level the last level has all keys as left as possible so this is a complete binary tree for this tree we see that all level are completely filled okay this level filled and this level is filled as well but here we see this level is not filled totally but this level has all keys as left as possible so you can say this is a complete binary tree hope you have understood what is a complete binary tree in this video we have talked about full binary tree perfect binary tree and complete binary tree hope you have understood this video explanations if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about implementation of a binary tree how binary tree is represented this is an example of a binary tree we can implement binary tree using array or linked list data structure first let's see how we can implement binary tree using linked list implementation let's say this is our given binary tree and this tree we can create using a linked list this is a node of double linked list here we have address of this node 0x001 this node contains three attributes two pointer and one data left pointer and right pointer this left pointer is pointing to left child the right pointer is pointing to right child and here we have address of this node and here we have address of this node this is the left child of our root node this is root node and this is the address of this node and this node contains three attributes left and right child here we're storing the address of left child and here we're storing the address of right child this is left child this is right child this node has no left child no right child this node as well has no left child no right child the right child of this root node is this node this is the address of the right child here we're storing the address of this node this node has three attributes left and right child and a data and here we're storing the address of left child here we're storing the address of right child for this node there is no left and right child for this node there is no left and right child we have null and this is how we can represent a binary tree using linked list hope you have understood how we can implement a binary tree using linked list in this section of this course we'll see how we can create a binary tree using linked list data structure and we'll make all the standard operations now let's talk about how we can implement binary tree using array data structure we have here array of length 8 and here we have the index number 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 initially we'll pick the item from index one as root so this is our root now let's create a root node this is our root node okay now the left child of this node will select using this formula array 2x here x means the current index so two times one equals to two so we'll set the left child whatever we have at this index two so let's set as left child 20 now let's find it right child we'll find it right child using this formula 2x plus 1 
So two times one plus one equals to three. So we'll insert right away here whatever value we have at index three. So let's insert here 30. Now for this node 20, let's find the left child. So two times two equals to four. So left child of this node 20 is whatever value we have at index four. So let's insert here this value 40. Now the right child of this node 20 is 2x plus 1. That means whatever value we have at index 5. So let's insert here 50. Now for this node 30, the left child is 2x. That means 3 times 2, that is 6. So whatever value we have at index 6, we'll insert as left child of this node 30. So let's insert here 60. Now the right child array 2x plus 1, that is index 7. 3 times 2 plus 1 equals 2, 7. So whatever value we have at index 7, we'll insert here. So let's insert here 70. Now let's find out left child of this node 40. So this is 40. So 2 times 4 equals to 8. 8 is out of array boundary. So we'll insert null as left. And as right, 2x plus 1 is 9. So we'll insert as right child null. Left child null and right child null. And same for the rest of the node. This is how we can construct a binary tree using array. This is how we can implement a binary tree using array. In this section of this course, we'll implement a binary tree using linked list data structure and also using array data structure. And we'll make all the standard operation for linked list implementation as well as for array implementation. In the rest of this course, we'll talk about linked list implementation. Just for this section of this course, we'll talk about linked list implementation and array implementation. Linked list implementation is way more efficient than array implementation. That's why we'll be using linked list implementation option for the rest of this course. But for this section of this course, we'll talk about linked list implementation and array implementation. So you will have a better understanding. Hope you've understood how you can implement a binary tree using linked list and array data structure. In the next video, we'll talk about how to create a binary tree using linked list data structure. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to implement binary tree using linked list data structure. In this section of this course, we'll be implementing create a binary tree, insert source delete node, delete binary tree, and traverse method. In traverse method, we'll traverse the binary tree using this four traversal algorithm in order, pre-order, post-order, and level order. In this video, we're going to talk about these two methods, create binary tree and insert. First, we'll see how we can create a binary tree, then we'll see how we can insert data into a binary tree. Now, let's talk about create a binary tree. This is our class binary tree using linked list. Inside this class, we have a node. This node has three attributes, value and two pointer left and right. Here we're declaring the root of our binary tree. And then we have this method create binary tree. Inside this method, we're going to set a root to null node. So our root is null node. So this is our binary tree. And this is our root node null, okay? Initially, we have this root node null. Now let's talk about insert method. This is insert method. This method takes one parameter value. Inside here, we're creating new node with the value. And then we're checking if root equals to null, we're setting, then we're setting our root to the new node. And we're returning by this return statement, we're just exiting from our function call. If root is not equals to null, if we have some value in our binary tree, then we're creating a queue. And then we're adding the root node to the queue and then we're running a while loop. While queue is not empty, we're going to pop out the top element from queue and we're checking if current node.left equals to null, we're setting current node.left equals to new node. Here we're just setting the new node to the left node of our current node if we see current node.left equals to null and we're exiting from our loop using this break statement. If not, we're checking if current node.right equals to null, we're setting the new node to the right child, okay? And we're exiting from the 
loop by this break statement if this condition evaluated true. If not, we're adding the left and right child of our current node to Q. And we're doing this process until we hit any of these two conditions or our stack is empty. Now let's see how it works. If we call this method insert 10, in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to create a new node 10. So we're creating a new node 10. Here we're creating new node and the node checking if root equals to null. Initially root is null. So we're going to set root to this node and we're going to exit from our function call. So this is our root node. And the left and right child of this node is null by default. So now we have the root node 10. Now if we call this method insert with 20, then we're going to create a new node 20. And we see root is not equals to null. So here we'll create a new queue. So here we'll create a queue. This is our queue. And we're going to add our root node to the queue. So let's add here the root node 10. Now we see queue is not empty. So we're going to pop out the top element from front of our queue. So here we're storing the node 10. So let's pop out this node and we pop out this node. Now we have current node equals to the node 10. That means the root node. Then we're going to check if current node dot left equals to null. We're going to set the new node to the left node. Here we see that the left node of our current node is null. So let's set the node 20 as the left child to this node. Okay. So let's say it here 20. So we assigned the node 20 as the left child to this root node and then we're going to break. So this loop stuff here. Now we're done with this function call. Now let's call this function again with value 30. Now what's going to happen? We're going to create a new node with value 30 and we see root is not equals to null. So this condition is false. Then we're going to declare a queue and inside this queue we're going to add the root node that is 10. So let's add here 10. Then we're going to run a loop. Then we're going to pop out the front element from our queue. So let's pop out this element 10 from queue and let's check does current node dot left equals to null. No, the left node of the node we popped out from our queue the node 10. Now we're going to check the left node of this node 10. Does the left node of this node is null? No. Now let's check the right node. Does the right node of our root node is null? Yes, it is. So let's set the current node to the right child of this root node. So let's add here the node 30. Then our binary tree will be represented something like this. And then we'll break. The while loop will stop whenever it found this break statement. Now we're done with this function call. Now let's call this function again with value 40. Now what are we going to do? We're going to create a new node with value 40. Then we see the root node is 10, not null. So we're going to declare a queue and inside this queue, we're going to insert the root node that is 10. So let's insert here 10. Now we're running this while loop, queue is not empty. So our current node equals to queue.pop, current node equals to the node 10. Now we're going to check, does the left node of our current node is null? No. So let's check this condition. This condition is also false. So what are we going to do? We're going to add the left child 20 and the right child 30 to the queue. So the queue will be represented something like this. In the next iteration, we're going to pop out the node 20. So this is our current node. Now let's check does the left child of this node 20 is null? Yes, it is. So let's insert here the node 40. Now we have in our queue 30 and we have here our break statement. So this break statement will stop this while loop. Since we're calling this function, we're done with this function call and our binary is represented something like this after performing this function call. Whenever we call the insert method again, the queue will be created. So you can consider the queue is empty. Now let's call the function again with value 50. Now what are we going to do? We're going to create a new node 50 and then we're going to declare new queue. This is our new queue and let's insert here the node 10. So let's insert here 10. Then we're going to run this while loop. Then we're going to run this while loop here. We're going to pop out this node 10. Now this is our current node. Let's pop out and we see the left node and the right node is not null. So let's add the left and right child to this queue. So 20 will be added here and 30 will be added here. 10 is removed already. Okay. In the next iterations, we're going to pop out the 
front element that is 20 so our current so our current node is 20 now the left child of this node is not null but the right node is null so let's insert here the node 50 so here we're going to insert the node 50 and we already popped out this element 20 so let's insert here 50 then our binary tree will be represented something like this now let's call this method again with 60 we're going to create a new node with value 60 and here let's add the root node to our queue and then we're going to pop out this element from our queue so let's pop out this 10 now this is our current node now we see that the left child and right child is not null so let's add left and right child to our queue so 20 will be added here and 30 will be added here so 20 will be added here and 30 will be added here in the next iteration of this while loop we're going to pop out this node 20 so our current node is this node 20 and we see that the left and right child of this node 20 is not null node so what are we going to do we're going to add the left and right child to this queue so let's add here 40 and let's add here 50. now what are we going to do we're going to pop out this node 30 from this queue now 30 is our current node now what are we going to do we're going to check the left child of this node 30 and that is null so we can insert here the node 60 so let's insert here the node 60 then our binary will be represented something like this now let's call this method again with value 70 now what are we going to do we're going to add the root node to this queue so 10 will be added here then we're going to pop out this node 10 now this is your current node now let's pop out this node 10 and let's add left and right child to this queue so 20 and 30. now what are we going to do we're going to pop out this node 20 so 20 so this is your current node we see left and right child is not null so let's add left and right child to our queue so 40 will be added here and 50 will be added here then we're going to pop out this node 30 our current node is this node 30. now we're going to check the left child left child is 60 is not null then let's check the right child the right child is null so we can insert here the node 70. so let's insert here the node 70. okay then our binary t will be represented something like this so we're done with this function call and then we get this binary tree and this is how we can insert value in a binary tree if we call this method again with 80 then 80 will be added here hope you've understood how this method works this method will take big of n time complexity and big of n space complexity if you're not understanding how this method actually works try to write it everything on a piece of paper then it will make sense if you have any suggestion if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about this method sars now let's see how we can implement this method this is our algorithm for sars method this method will return true or false if the given value is exist in the binary tree then it will return true else it will return false this method takes one parameter value inside here we're checking if root equals to null then we're going to print tree is empty and we're going to exit by returning false then we're declaring a queue and we're adding the root node to the queue and we're running a while loop and then we're popping out the front element from queue and we're checking if current node that value equals to the given value then we'll return true if not we're going to check if the left child is not null we're going to insert that to queue and then we're going to check if the right child is not null that we're going to then we're going to insert that child to the queue if we see this condition is never evaluated true then we'll return just false now let's see how this method works let's say we're given this binary tree and if we call this method search train then what's going to happen here we're going to declare a queue since the root is not null and here we're going to insert the root node so let's insert here the root node 10 then we're going to pop out the root node so let's pop out this node 10 and now we see this is our current node and we see the current node dot value equals to value the value of this node equals to the given value this condition is evaluated true so we'll return true for this function call we will return true now if we call this method with value 50 now let's see how it works first we're going to insert the root node to our queue then what we're going to do we're going to pop out this root node then we have our current node equals to this root node now we're going to check the value of this node the value of this node is not equals to 50 so 
we're gonna check the left child does left child is null no so let's add that to q does the right child is null no so let's add that to the q now let's pop out the front element that is 20 now our current node is 20 does the value 20 is equals to 50 no so let's check the left child does the left child is null no so let's add 40 to the q does the right child is empty no so let's add 50 to our q now we're gonna pop out this top element 30 so let's pop out this element 30 now this is your current element now let's check the left and right child and we see left child is not null right child is not null so let's add 60 and 70 to the q 60 will be added here and 70 will be added here now let's pop out this 40 from our q now this is our current node okay and we see left and right child is null and this value is not equals to 50 okay here also we should check the value 30 with 50 and we see they are not equal so we have inserted 60 and 70 to the q and we popped out the front element that is 40 now this is our current node and we see left and right is null so there nothing need to be done here and the value is not equals to 40 is not equals to 50 now let's pop out the front element from q and that is 50 this is our current node now we see the value of this node is equals to 50 so we find out this value 50 in this tree so we'll return true and we're done we're returning true using this written statement this is how this search operation works and we can search a given value in this binary tree if the value does not exist in the binary tree then it will return simply false hope you've understood how this method actually works this method will take big off in time complexity and big off in space complexity hope you've understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this method delete node this method will take a given value and this method will delete the value from the binary tree now let's see how we can implement this method first let's talk about what is the deepest node deepest node is the last node we get traversing a binary tree in level order traversal if we traverse this binary tree in level order let's find out the last node so first we'll traverse this node 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 then 50 60 70 so 70 is the last node we found by traversing this binary tree in level order so 70 is the deepest node in this binary tree if we're given this binary tree let's find out the last node we found by traversing this binary tree in level order so first we'll traverse 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 then 50 then 60 so 60 is the last node we found by traversing this binary tree in level order traversal so 60 is the deepest node if we're given this binary tree what is the deepest node so let's find out the last node by traversing this binary tree using level order traversal first we'll traverse 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 50 60 70 then 80 so this is the last node we get by traversing this binary tree in level order traversal so 80 is the deepest node for this binary tree hope you have understood what is deepest node now how we can solve this problem let's say we want to delete the node 10 this node if we delete this node we'll get two separate link list so we'll get this two separate link list and merging the two link list is not easy it's going to be a little bit difficult things that you have to handle so how you can delete a particular node when we say it we have to delete a node first we'll find out the deepest node and we'll update the node that we have to delete with the value of deepest node so in this case we'll update the value 10 with the value of deepest node the deepest node in this binary tree is 70. so we have updated the value of this node 10 with 70 and then we'll remove the deepest node now we see that we have deleted this node 10. for this binary tree let's say you want to delete the node 10 as well then what are we going to do we're going to update this value 10 with the deepest node so the deepest node is 60 so let's update this value 10 with 60 and then just remove the deepest node so we deleted the deepest node and we updated the value of our root node 
or our desired node with the value of deepest node. We were taking the value of deepest node because of easy implementation. We can take the value of any leap nodes. For this binary tree, let's say we want to delete the node 10. Then what we're going to do? We're going to find the deepest node. This is the deepest node. So let's update the value of this node 10 with the value of the deepest node 80. And then at the end, just delete the deepest node. So we have deleted the root node, okay? Instead of choosing the deepest node, we can choose any leaf node. So we can choose this node, we can choose this node, or we can choose this node. That's completely fine, but for easy implementation, we're choosing the deepest node. Now let's say we want to delete this node 20. Now let's say you want to update the value of this node with this node. If we update this value with, with this node 20, then there is a problem. These two nodes is dependent on this node. So if we delete this node, then we'll have a compact on these two nodes. If we delete this node, then we have to solve the dependency of these two nodes, and that's going to be difficult. That's why we're choosing the deepest node, and we're just updating the value of our desired node with the value of the first node and at the end we'll remove or delete that node let's say we want to delete the node 30 then what we're going to do first we're going to find out the deepest node this is the deepest node so we're going to update the value of this node with the value of deepest node and at the end we'll just delete the deepest node so we've deleted the node 30. this is how we can delete a node in a binary search tree so first we have to find out our desired node in this binary tree, then we have to find out deepest node, and then we have to update the value of our desired node with deepest node, then we have to delete the deepest node. There is three process involved. First, finding the desired node, then finding out the deepest node, and then deleting the deepest node. Okay, now let's see how we can delete a particular node in a binary tree. This is the pseudocode to delete a particle node from a binary tree. First, we're gonna check if tree equals to null, then we're printing tree is empty and we're just exiting by this written statement. If not, we're declaring a queue and we're inserting the root node to the queue and we're running the while loop. Then we're popping out the front element from queue and we're checking the current value. If we found our desired node, then we're going to update the value with the value of deepest node we can find out the deepest node using this method. We'll see how we can find out the deepest node. No worry about that for now. And then we'll delete the deepest node and we'll break. Then here we're gonna check if the left child is not null, then we're gonna add that node to Q. If the right child is not null, then we're gonna add that node to our Q. Now let's see how it works. If we call this method delete node 10, then we'll declare a Q. Then we're gonna add the root node to our Q. So let's add here 10. Then let's pop out this root node. So if we pop out this root node, this is our current node. Now we're gonna check the value of this current node with the given value. We see this value 10 is equals to the given value. Now what are we going to do? We're going to find out the value of deepest node. So this is the deepest node, the value is 80. So let's update this value 10 with the value 80. And then what are we going to do? We're going to delete the deepest node. And we'll see this method in this video. Don't worry about this method right now and we'll delete the deepest node using this method so this node will be deleted and will break and we're done okay so we have deleted the node 10 this is how we can delete a particular node from a binary tree then our binary tree will be represented something like this hope you have understood how to delete a particular node from a binary tree if we call this method again in this time we want to delete the node 30 First, we're going to add the root node. So the root node is 80. Now let's add the root node to our queue. Root node is 80. Then we're going to pop out this root node. So this is our current node. Let's pop out. Then we're going to check the value with our given value. 80 is not equals to 30. So let's add left child because left child is not null 20. And let's add right child. Right child is not null. That is 30. Let's add here the right child 30. Now let's pop out this front element 20. Now this is our 
current node, okay? We see 20 is not equals to 30, so let's add left and right child to our queue. So let's add here 40 and let's add here 50. Now let's pop out the front element from our queue, that is 30. So this is our current node. Now we see the value of this node 30 equals to the given value. So now we have to find out the deepest node. This is the deepest node that we can find out and this is the deepest node. And we can find out the deepest node using this method and we'll see in this video how we can find out the deepest node and we're going to update this value 30 with the value 70. So let's update this value 30 with 70. And at the end we'll delete the deepest node using this formula. So let's delete this deepest node and we'll see this method and then we'll break. Then our binary tree will be represented something like this. This is how we can delete a node from a binary tree. Hope you have understood how to delete a node from a binary tree. This method will take big of n time complexity. Actually, it will take big of 3 n time complexity because we have to find out the desired node and we have to find out the deepest node, then we have to delete the deepest node. So it will take big of 3 n time complexity, that's equivalent to big of n, and it will take big of n space complexity for the Q. Now, let's see how we can find out the deepest node. This is the method to find out the deepest node. First, we're checking if 2 equals to null, we're printing tree is empty and we're exiting by this return statement. Then we're declaring a queue and we're adding the root node to the queue and we're setting current node equals to null. And this current node will store the value of deepest node. Here we should have C U double R node, okay? Not current node. Since inside here we're using car node. Here we have while loop while queue is not empty. We're popping out the front element from Q, then we're checking if the left child is not null, we're, we're adding the left child to Q, then we're checking if the right child is not null, then we're adding the right child to the Q. At the end, we'll return current node. The current node is the deepest node, or the last node that you can find it traversing a binary tree using level order traversal. Let's see how we can find it the deepest node. If we call this method, first we'll create a Q, and we'll insert the root node to this queue. So let's insert here 10. Now let's pop out this node 10 from the queue. So this is our current node. Now we see left child is not null. So let's add left child to queue. Then the right child, right child is not null. So let's add right child to the queue. Now let's pop out this front element 20. Now this is our current. So 20 is our current node. The left node is not null. So let's add here left node. The right node is not null. So let's add here right node 50. Now let's pop out the front from our queue, that is 30. Now 30 is our current node, left is not null, so let's add here 60. Right is not null, let's add here 70. Now let's pop out front node from our queue, that is 40. So our current node is 40. The left is 80, that is not null, so let's add here to our queue. And the right is null, so we'll not add that to our queue. Then let's pop out this top element, 50. Now this is our current. and left and right is null then our current node is 60 left and right is null so nothing need to be done here then 70 the left and right is null so nothing need to be done here then we have 80 now this is our current node and the left and right is null so we're done and we'll return this node 80 to this function call get deepest node so we get our deepest node from this binary t this is how we can find out the deepest node this method will take big of n time complexity and big of n space complexity. Since we are traversing every single node of our given binary tree and it will take big of n space complexity to construct the queue data structure. Hope you have understood this method. Now let's see how we can delete the deepest node. This is the method to delete the deepest node. First we are checking if root equals to null, then we are printing tree is empty, then we are returning. If not, we are creating a queue and we're adding the top node to the queue and we have here two nodes, prev and current node. And we're initializing prev node and current node to null node. Then we're checking while queue is not empty, we're setting prev node to current node and current node to queue.pop. And then we're checking if left is null, then we're setting prev node.write equals to null and we're exiting. Else if current node.write equals to null, then we're setting, then we're setting the left of our current node to null and we're exiting by this return statement. If not, we're adding the left and right child to the queue. Let's see how we can delete the deepest node. Now if we call this method, then first we'll construct a queue data structure. First we're gonna insert here 10. So let's insert here 10. And here prev node equals to current node. So prev will points to node initially. Then we're gonna pop out 
the front element from Q. So let's pop out and this is our current. Now the left and right is not null. So let's add here left and right it's 20 and 30. In the next iteration of this while loop, we're going to set prev to this node. So let's set our prev node to this node. Okay. And we're going to pop out the front element from Q and we're going to set. So we're going to set current to this node. Now we see the left and right of this node 20 is not null. So let's add here 40 and let's add here 50. Then in the next iteration, we're going to move prev to this node and we're going to pop out the front element from Q that is 30 and we're going to set current to this node 30. We see the left and right of this node 30 is not null. So let's insert here 60 and let's insert here 70. Then in the next iteration, we're going to set prev to this node. Okay. So let's set prev to this node and let's pop out the front from our Q that is 40. So current will point to this node. We see the left node of this node 40. And here we see the left node of this node 40 is not a null node. Let's check the right node. The right node is null. We found that the right node is null. So current dot right equals to null. And then what are we going to do? We're going to say current dot left equals to null. So we're going to set the left node to null node. So the left node will be connected to null node. So this node will be disconnected and this node will be removed by garbage collector. This is the dependent node that we have removed. Here we're using this return statement to exit from our function call. And this is how we can delete the defaced node from a binary tree. If we find out the left node is null, if we see here the left node of this node 40 is null, then what are we going to do? We're going to say prev node dot right equals to null. In that case, we will remove this node. We will set prev node dot right equals to null. So this node will be removed. This is how we can remove deepest node from a binary tree. Hope you've understood this operation delete deepest node. This operation will take big of n time complexity and big of n space complexity. Hope you've understood this video explanation. If you have any question, if you have any issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to implement delete binary tree method. This method will delete the entire binary tree. This is the delete binary tree method. This method takes no parameter. Inside here, we're just setting root equals to null. Whenever we set root equals to null, the entirety will be deleted by garbage collector. Let's see how. Let's see we're given this binary tree. And here, this is our root node. If we call this method delete a binary tree, then this root will be set to null node. Okay. So this root will set to null node. Now we see there is nothing is pointing to this root node 10. So this node will be removed from RAM by garbage collector. Now there is nothing is pointing to this node 20 and this node 30. So this two node will be removed by garbage collector as well. Now we see there is nothing is pointing to this node 40. So it will be removed by garbage collector. There is nothing pointing to this node 50. This node will be removed by garbage collector. There is nothing is pointing to this node 60. So this node will be removed by garbage collector as well. And then 70, there is nothing is pointing to this node 70. So this node 70 will be removed by garbage collector. Now we see our entire tree is deleted. This is how this delete binary tree method works. This method will take constant time and constant space complexity. Hope you have understood how delete binary tree method works. I have attached the source code, check the source code. If you have any suggestion, if you have any problem understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? In this video, we're going to talk about binary tree tower cell. This is not a coding video. In this video, we're going to see some tree tower cell algorithm and how the tree tower cell works. In this video, we're going to talk about pre-order tower cell, in-order tower cell and post-order tower cell. There are many ways to traverse a binary tree, but these three are the major traversal algorithms and these are depth first traversal algorithm. Now let's see how they actually works. This video is the prerequisite for the 
next three video of this section we can traverse a binary search tree using this three algorithm using recursively and iteratively for iterative approach we have to use a stack in this video let's see the tricks involved to this traversal algorithm first let's talk about pre-order traversal this pre-order traversal algorithm first process the current node then it will process the left node then a right node and this is applied for every single node of a given binary tree for e node traversal first we process the left node when we're done with the left node then we process the current node then the right node and this policy will be applied to every single node for post node traversal first we process the left node then right node then the current node and this policy is applied to every single node now let's see how we can traverse a binary tree using pre-order in order and post order in details first let's talk about pre-order traversal in for node l for left and r for right let's suppose that we're given this binary tree and we have to traverse this binary tree using the concept of pre-order traversal this is our current node okay this is our root node first we have here the node first we have to process the node this current node then the left node of this node then the right node of this node first let's process this node first we process this node so we get the value of this node one so we're done with this current node now let's go to the left we have to process the left node then we have to process the right node and we can do this using recursion or we can do this using a loop now let's go to the left node of this node and this is the left node so we moved to the left node so let's remove this when we're done with the left node then we'll back to this node for this node let's process the node 2 first so let's add 2 to our list we have processed this node this is our current node now let's go to the left node then we'll move to the right node so first we have to process the left node of this node the left node of this node is 4 so we moved to the left node so let's remove this left here let's process this node 4 so if we process this node 4 we get the value 4 so let's remove this now we have to move to the left node of this node the left node of this node is this node so we moved to the left node we're going to remove this left from here and here let's process this node so we get the value 8 and let's remove this node since we have processed this node then let's go to the left left is null so we're done let's go to right and right is we see right is null so we're done with the right node as well this will be done using recursion or using a stack for is recursive call stack we have new state for every single recursive function call in that state we'll have the left right and the current node for every single node when we're done with the leftmost node then we'll back to this node 4 and here we see we have the right node and this node is not processed and here we see we have the right node so let's go to the right node and let's process the right node and the right node is 9 so let's process this node so we moved to the right node of this node so let's remove this right from this node and here let's process this node 9 so if we process we get this value 9 let's remove this now let's go to the left left is null of this node so let's remove left and the right and right is null as well for this node so we're done with the left sub t of this node 2 now let's go to the right subtree and this is our right subtree so since we moved to the right subtree we'll remove the right from here so here we have this node 5 let's process this node if we process this node we get the value 5 then let's go to the left of this node that is 10 so let's remove this left from here here let's process this node if we process this node we get the value 10 let's remove n from here and let's go to left and left is null so we're done right is null as well so let's remove this so we're done with the left 
sub t of this node 5. Now let's go to the right sub t and right sub 3 is this node 11. So let's remove this r from here since we moved to the right sub 3. Here let's process this node so we get 11. So let's remove this n. Now we have to visit the left node. Left node is null so we'll just return and here the right node is null as well so we'll just return. At this point we see that we have done with the left subtree of our root node. So we're done with the left subtree now let's go to the right subtree. So this is our right node of this root node. So let's remove this right from here and here now let's process this node 3. So let's add 3 to this list. We processed this node 3. Now let's go to the left. This is our left node. Let's process this node and let's remove here L. So if we process this node, we get 6. Then let's go to the left of this node and this is our left node. And let's process this node, we get 12. So let's remove this node as well. Since you moved to this node, to the left of this node 6, so we have to remove this L as well. And here let's go to left, and left is null, so we'll just return. The right is null as well of this node, so we'll return. And we're done with the left subtree of this node 6. Now let's go to the right subtree. This is the right subtree. So let's remove this R since we moved to the right subtree. And here let's process this node 13. So let's add this to our list 13. So let's remove in. Then let's go to left. Left is null. So we'll return. Right is null as well. So we'll return. So we're done with the left subtree of this node 3. Now let's go to the right subtree. And this is our right subtree and let's remove this r since we moved to the right subtree here let's process this node 7 let's add 7 here and we're done with the current node and let's go to the left this is our left node and let's remove l since we moved to the left and let's process this node we get 14 so let's remove end left is null so we'll return right is null so we'll return as well now let's go to the right of this node 7 that is 15. Since you move to right so let's remove this r and here let's process this node 15. So let's add 15 to this list and left is null so let's remove it. Right is null as well so let's remove it. This is our periodic traversal techniques. First we processed the current node then we process the left node then the right node. And this policy is applied to every single node. And this is called periodic traversal. We get this list 1, 2, 4, 8, 9, 5, 10, 11, 3, 6, 12, 13, 7, 14, 15. This is something like this. 1, 2, then node 4, then 8, then 5, then 11, then 3, then 6, then 12, then this node 13 then 7 14 and then 15 and this is the direction of pre-order traversal hope you have understood the techniques of pre-order traversal now let's talk about the techniques of in-order traversal now we're going to talk about in-order traversal the formula here is that first we have to process the left node then the current node then the right node and this policies will be applied to every single node let's consider this is our given binary tree this is our root node. So before processing this node, we'll process the left node. So let's move to the left. And here, before processing this node 2, let's move to the left 4. And before processing this node, let's go to the left node. And the left node of this node 4 is this node 8. Before process this node 8, let's go to the left. And the left is null, so we'll just return. Then we'll process this node 8. So let's add 8 to list. So we have processed this node. Now, let's go to the right of this node and right is null, so it will just return. So we're done. We have processed the left node of this node 4. Now let's process this node. So let's add here 4. So let's remove this and now let's go to the right node of this node and that is 9. So we moved to the right node. Now let's move to the left node of this node 9 and that is null, so it will just return. And then we have this node n. Let's process this node. So if we process this node, we get 9. Now let's go to the right node of this node and that is null. So let's return for this node. 
and we're done with the left node of this node 2. So now let's process this node 2. If we process this node 2, we get 2. Now let's remove this here and now let's process the right node of this node 2. And the right node of this node 2 is 5. Before processing this node 5, let's process the left node. And the left node of this node is 10. So let's remove this. We're going to move to the left node. So let's remove this L. Now before processing this node 10, let's go to the left and left is null. So we'll return. Now let's process this node 10. So let's add 10 to our list. Then let's go to the right and right node is null. So let's remove this R as well. So we're done with the left node of this node 5. Now let's process this node 5. So we get 5. Now let's move to the right node of this node 5 and that is 11. And let's remove this node R. And let's remove this R. And now for this node, before processing this node, we'll go to the left and left is null, so it will return. Now let's process this node 11, so we'll add 11 to our list. Then let's go to the right and the right node is null, so it will just return. At this point, we see that we are done with the left subtree of our root node. Now it's time to process our root node. If we process this root node, we get 1. So we processed our root node. Now let's go to the right node and this is our right node so let's remove r from here and here before processing this node 3 let's go to the left node and our left node is this node 6 and before processing this node 6 let's go to the left node here let's remove this as well and here before processing this node let's go to the left node and left node is null so it will just return then let's process this node 12. If we process this node 12, we get 12. Now let's go to the right node of this node 12 and that is null, so it will just return. So we're done with the left subtree of this node 6. Now let's process this node 6. If we process this node 6, we get 6. Now let's go to the right node of this node 6 and that is starting. So let's go to the right node of this node 6 and that is starting and here before processing this node 13 let's go to the left left is null so it will return now we have n so let's process this node 13 let's add it 13 let's remove it and let's go to the right and the right is null so it will just return so we're done with the left subtree of this node 3 now let's process this node 3 if we process this node 3 we get 3 so we have processed this node 3 so we're going to remove n now let's go to the right node and this is our right node and here before processing this node let's go to the left node and the left node is this node 14 and here before processing this node 14 let's go to the left left is null so let's process this node and then we get 14. now let's go to the right node and the right node of this node 14 is null so we'll return so we're done with the left subtree of this node 7 so now let's process this node 7 so we get 7 now let's go to the right node of this node 7 and that is 15 so let's go to the right node and this is your right node and let's process the left node of this node and that is null so it will return now let's process this node then we'll get 15. now let's process the right node and the right node is null so let's remove r and this is how we can traverse a binary tree in order traversal and this is how in order traversal works first we process the left node then we process the current node then the right node and this is how it works if we traverse this binary tree using e node traversal then we get this hope you have understood this concept if you're not understanding these explanations i will highly encourage you to go through with your own examples now let's talk about post order traversal for post order traversal we're going to process the left node first then the right node then the current node let's see how it works for that let's take this binary t as an example this is our root node we have to process left node first then right node then the current node so let's go to the left of this node one this is our left node of this node one and now let's go left again this is our left node of this node two now let's go to the left node again and here let's go to the left node again and we see that the left node is null so we will just return then let's go to the right node and the right node is null as well so let's return and now we're going to process this node so we get the value 8 and we're done with this node now 
let's go to the right node of this node 4 and that is 9 and here let's remove this r since we moved to the right node and here let's go to the left left is null let's go to the right right is null as well and now let's process this node then we get 9 by processing this node and we're done with the left and right now let's process this node 4 so we get the value 4 and this concept will be applied applied to every single node we're going to remove this node since we have processed this node now let's go to this node 2 and here we have to visit the right node we are processing this node so this is our right node and let's remove r from here before processing this node let's go to the left of this node 5 and that is 10 here i'm going to remove l and here before processing this node let's go to the left left is null now let's go to the right right is null as well so we'll just return and now let's process this node 10 so we get 10 so we're done with the left subtree of this node 5 now let's go to the right subtree this is our right node of this node 5 let's remove it since you move to the right node and here let's go to the left left is null so we'll return let's go to the right right is null as well now let's process this node 11 if we process this node 11 we get 11 we see that we have process the left and right node of this node 5 now it's time to process this node if we process this node we get 5 at this point we have processed the left and right subtree of this node 2 now let's process this node 2 if we process this node 2 we get 2 now let's remove this n here we see that we have processed every single node in the left subtree of this root node now let's go to the right node this is our right node 3 and here let's remove here r and here let's go to the left and this is our left node of this node 3 now let's go to the left again and 12 is our left node of this node 6 and now let's go to the left again then it will return null then we have here r so let's go to the right right is null as well so let's process this node then we get 12 so we're done with the left subtree of this node 6 now let's go to the right this is our right node of this node 6 so let's remove r from here and let's go to the left left is null right is null so let's process this node 13 so we get the value 13 and we're done with the left and right subtree of this node 6 now let's process this node so we get 6 now let's remove it now let's go to the right node of this node 3 and this is the right node of this node 3 before process this node let's go to the left the left is 14 so let's remove here l and before process this node 14 let's go to the left left is null let's go to the right right is null as well and now let's process this node then we get 14 we have processed the left node now let's go to the right node so let's remove here this node r now let's go to the right node of this node 7 and that is 15 and here let's go to the left left is null let's go to the right right is null as well so let's process this node we get 15 now we're done with the left and right subtree of this node 7 so let's process this node so let's process this node if we process this node we get 7 and here also when you move to the right we have to remove it so we have processed this node 7 now for this node we processed the left and right subtree so now let's process this node if we process this node then we get 3 at this point we see that we have processed all the node in the left subtree and all the node in the right subtree for the root node it's time to process this node if we process this node then we get 1 and let's remove n so we get this list and this is how we can traverse a binary tree using post order traversal so in this video we saw how to traverse a binary tree using pre order traversal in order traversal and post order traversal in this section we will see how we can implement the pre-order traversal in order traversal and post order traversal recursively and iteratively if we implement these three traversal algorithms using recursively and iteratively then you will have an easy time solving t problem either recursively or iteratively first i will highly recommend you to understand the pre-order in order and post order traversal when you are understanding the pre-order, in-order and post-order traversal, then move to the next video. In the next video, we discussed about pre-order traversal. 
then we will talk about another traversal then we'll talk about post order traversal and you will see how we can implement pre-order in order and post order traversal in details hope you have understood the concept or the tricks for pre-order in order and post order traversal thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys in this video we're going to solve a coding interview problem binary tree pre-order traversal given the root of a binary tree return the pre-order traversal of its nodes values so we're given a binary tree and we have to traverse the binary tree in pre-order let's take an example this is a binary tree and this is the root node we have to traverse this binary tree in pre-order traversal so first we have to visit the leftmost node so this is our root node so we'll add this one to a list so first one then we'll go to the left this is the left of this node one so let's add here two then this is our left node of this node two so let's add this node four and here we see the left node is null when you found left node is null we'll move to the right node and here we see the right node is null as well when you found left node and right node is null we'll visit the nearest right node and the nearest right node for this node is this node so we'll add five to our list now let's go to the left node left is null and right is null as well so now what is the nearest right node of this node 5 and the nearest right node is this node or in other words you can assume that when we found the left and right node is null for a specific node we will go back so for this node we'll go to this node and for this node the right node is already visited so let's go back then we'll move to this node and here the right node is this node so let's add this node to a list and here we're adding the node value not the node itself then let's go to the left node this is our left node so let's add six to our list and the left node is null right node is null as well so let's go to this node and let's add seven and the left node is null and the right node is null as well so we have visited every single node of this binary tree using pre-order traversal how pre-order traversal works first we visit the leftmost node when we found the left node is null only then we'll visit the right node that means first we have visited all the left node then when we found a null node we move to the right node and this is the direction of pre-order traversal first we visit this node one then this node two then four then five then three then six then seven so for this given input we have to return this list for better understanding let's take another example now let's assume we're given this binary tree we have to traverse this binary tree in pre-order so first we'll visit the leftmost node this is our root node so let's add one to our list now let's go to the left node the left of one is this node and when we're done with the left node only then we'll move to the right node and this is two for every single node so let's add two to our list then let's go to the left node and this is our left node four so let's add four to our list and we see left node is null so let's go to the right node and right node is null as well so let's go back and then we'll visit this node five so let's add five to our list then let's go to the left node left node is eight so let's add eight to our list then the left node is null right node is null so let's go back and the right node of this node five is nine so let's add nine to our list then let's go to the left of this node nine and this is eleven so let's add eleven and the left and right of eleven is null so let's go back and the right node of this node is eleven so let's add 11 then we have the left node of this node 11 is 12 so let's add here 12 
and the left and right of this node 12 is null so let's go to the right node of this node 11 and that is 13 so let's add 13 to our list and the left and right of this node 13 is null okay so let's go back to the root node since we have visited all the node in the left subtree of this node 1 so i've visited all the node in the left subtree now let's go to the right subtree and here we have three so let's add three to our list then let's go to the left and that is six so let's add here six left and right is null so let's go to the right node of this node three and that is seven so let's add here seven and the left and right of seven is null so we're done we have visited all the nodes in this binary tree using pre order traversal so the direction of pre order traversal is this first we visit one then two then four five eight nine eleven eleven twelve thirteen then three six seven so this is the pre order traversal for depth first traversal we have three types of traversal pre order traversal in order traversal and post order traversal and in this video we're covering the pre order traversal so if you are given this binary tree we have to return this list and this is the pre order traversal of this binary tree now how we can solve this problem we're going to solve this problem recursively and iteratively first let's see how we can solve this problem recursively this is our algorithm to solve this problem and this is our given binary tree for example first let's review the algorithm first we have this function pre order traversal that takes the root of a given binary tree then we have list this list will hold our answer then we're calling this function dfh with root and the list this function will visit all the node in pre order traversal this function will traverse all the node in tree order and it will add all the node value to the list variable at the end we're returning the list and this is our dfs function this function takes two parameter node and list we check if root node equals to null then we will exit if node is not equals to null then we're adding the current node value and then we're calling we're calling the dfs function with node.left and list and then we're calling with node.right and list now let's see how it actually works this is our root node so first we'll visit the leftmost node first so we have this node 1 and this node is not a null node so we'll add this value 1 to a list so let's add 1 to a list and this is the list then our left node this is our left node when we're done with this left node only then we'll move to the right node now let's add this value 2 to the list because this node is not a null node so let's add to the list so two will be added here then let's call this dfs function again recursively so we'll move to this node so let's add this node value to our list because this is not a null node so let's add here then we have null node so for null node we'll just return this return statement means we're just exit then right node right node is null as well so we're done let's go up in this case we're calling this dfs function node.right in this case we're calling this function with node.write this is our current node and the value of this node is 5 and this is not a null node so let's add it to our list then let's go to the left we're calling this function with node.left so left node is 8 this is our current node and this is not a null node so let's add this value 8 to our list then we have this null node on the left so we'll exit and for this function call we have this null node so we'll exit here now let's go to this right node and for this right node we see that this node is not a null so let's add 9 to our list and let's go to the left and left node is 10 and this is not a null node so let's add 10 to our list and we see that the left node of this node is null and the right node is null as well so the function call will exit for null node now let's go to this node and this is 11 and this is not a null node so let's add it to our list 11 then let's go to the left node and this is our left node 
12 and this is not a null node so let's add this value to our list we see that the left and right node of this node is null so the function call will exit for null node for left and right of this node now let's go to the right and right node is 13 and 13 is not a null node so let's add it to our list the left and right node of this node is null so the function call will exit so we have processed the left subtree of this node one now let's go to the right subtree and this is our right subtree so on the right we have this node three since we're done with the left subtree of this node one so we'll move to the right subtree in this case we're calling this function dfs node.right so this node is not a null node so let's add three to our list now let's go to the left node left node is six six is not a null node so let's add it to our list and the left and right node of this node six is null so it will exit the function call for left and right now let's go to the right node this is a right node this is not a null node so let's add seven to our list and the left node is null so it will exit by this return statement and the right node is null as well so it will exit by the return statement so we're done with this recursive function call and we have visited all the node in this binary tree and we get this list and this is the nodes value for pre-order tower cell and this is how pre-order tower cell works and this is how we can solve this problem recursively this is not a hard problem if you try with your own examples then it will make sense i highly encourage you to go through with this pseudocode using your examples try to draw everything and try to write every recursive function call then you will see how it actually works if this is your first time then i will highly recommend you to go through with your own examples and try to write out every single function call on a piece of paper then it will make sense the solution will takes bigger of n time complexity or n is the number of nodes in the given tree and it also takes bigger of n space complexity for the recursion call stack we're calling this function dfs recursively if we include our answer list to the complexity analysis then the space complexity should be bigger of 2n and that's equivalent to bigger of n hope you have understood the pre-ordered traversal technique recursively now let's see how we can solve this problem iteratively let's suppose that we're given this binary tree and this is our algorithm for iterative approach and this is our stack to solve a tree problem using iterative approach we have to use a stack let's see how we can solve this problem before that let's review our algorithm first we have this function pre-order that takes the root node of a given binary tree then we have our list and then we're creating a stack and then we're checking if the current node is not equals to null then we'll add the node to our list let's consider this is our list and this list will and this list will store the node values then we're checking if the right node of a current node is not equals to null then we'll add that node to our stack in the stack we'll always just add the right node if the right node is not equals to null then we're gonna check if the left node is null and stack is not empty then we'll pop out the top node from stack if not then we're going to set the left node as our current node at the end we'll return our list now let's see how this actually works so this is our root node and this node is not a null node so let's add the value of this node to our list one then let's check the right node and we see the right node is three and the right node is not a null node so let's add this node three to our stack here we're storing the node not just the value okay then let's go to the left node since left node is not a null node we'll move to the left node and we see that this node is not a null node so let's add the value of this node to our list and the right node of this node is 5 and that is not a null node so let's add this node 5 to our stack we're storing here the node not the value of a node okay then let's move to the left node since the left node is not a null node so this is our current node for this node we see that right node is null so we'll not add the right node to our stack since the right node is a null node 
now let's go to the left and we see on the left we have null node as well if we have the left node equals to null node then what we will do we will check if our stack is not empty then we will pop out the top element from stack in that case we're going to pop out this element 5 from the stack and before that since we visited this node 4 so we'll add this node to our list now let's pop out this node 5 from the stack we have pop out the node 5 so this is our current node and we see that this node is not a null node since this node is not a null node we'll add the value of this node to our list then we'll check the right node if the right node is not a null node we'll add that node to our list so let's add here 9 here we're storing the node and now let's go to the left node and we see the left node is not a null node since the left node is not a null node so let's go to the left node this is our left node and we see the right node is a null node so we'll not add that node to our stack so let's go to the left node we see the left node is null before that we have to add this value 8 to our list since this node is not a null node on the left we have this node null if we found the left node equals to null we'll check the stack if stack is not empty we'll return the top element and we'll remove that element so we'll pop out this node 9 and we'll move to this node so let's remove this node and now 9 is our current node since 9 is not a null node so let's add 9 to our list and here we see that the right node of 9 is not a null node so let's add 11 to our stack now we see the left node is not a null node so we'll move to the left node this is our current node since this node is not a null so let's add this node to our stack and here we see the right node is null node so we'll not add this node to our stack and we see the left node is a null node if we found the left node is null node and stack is not empty then we will pop out the top element from stack and we'll move to that node and in this case we'll pop out the node 11 from this stack and we'll move to this node 11 so this is our current node since this node is not a null node so we'll add this node to our list and for this node we see that the right node is not a null node so let's add the right node 13 to our stack now let's go to the left node since the left node is not a null node so this is our current node we see this node is not a null node so let's add 12 to our list then let's check the right node and the right node is null node so we'll not add null node to our stack then we'll move to the left node and the left node is a null node since the left node is a null node and stack is not empty so we'll return the top element from stack and we'll move to that node in this case we'll visit this node 13 and we'll pop out this node for this node we see this node is not a null node so let's add 13 to our list here you see the right node is a null node so we'll not add that node to our stack now let's go to the left node and we see the left node is a null node and our stack is not empty so we'll return the top element from stack and we'll move to that node so let's pop out three and let's go to this node for this node we see that right node is not a null node so let's add the right node 7 to our stack and we see the left node is not a null node so we'll move to the left node since we have visited this node 3 we must add this node to our list now we see the left node is not a null node so let's go to this node this is our current node and the right node is null so we'll not add this node to our stack we see that this node 6 is not a null node so let's add this node to our list 6 now we see the right node is a null node so we'll not add this node to our stack and the left node is null node and stack is not empty so we'll return the top element from stack and that is 7 we pop out the top node from stack and we'll move to this node 7 right and here we visited this node 7 so let's add this node 7 to our list and the right node is null so we'll not add this node to our stack and the left node is null and our stack is empty so we'll not visit any more node we have visited every single node of this binary tree in pre-order traversal and this is the algorithm for pre-order traversal and this is how it works hope you have understood the concept of pre-order traversal iteratively the solution will take big of in time complexity where n is the number of nodes in the given tree and the solution will take big of 2n space complexity to construct the stack and to construct our list so the overall space complexity is bigger of n that means the order of n and this is how we can traverse a 
binary tree in pre-order. So this is the pre-order traversal of a binary tree. In order to understand, uh, in order to sync your head around to this problem, you have to try with a couple of examples, then it will make sense. I will highly recommend you to go through with your own examples. In this video, we have solved this problem recursively and iteratively. Hope you have understood this concept. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Right in this video, we are going to solve a coding interview problem binary tree in order traversal given the root of a binary tree return the in order traversal of its nodes values for examples if you're given this binary tree then you have to traverse this binary tree in order here we have numbering first we'll process this node 8 then we'll process this node 4 then this node 9 then 2, then 10, 5, 11, 1, 12, then this node 6, then this node 13, then this node 3, then this node 14, then 7, then 15. Okay? And this is called E node traversal. First, we have to process the left node then the current node then the right node and these policies will be applied to every single node if you're not understanding in order traversal i will highly encourage you to watch the first video in this section now let me show you how we can solve this problem recursively then we'll see how we can solve this problem iteratively using a stack now let's see recursive approach this is our recursive algorithm to solve this problem First, let's review this algorithm, then we'll see how it works. First, we have this function in order traversal that takes the root of a given binary tree. Then we have our list. This list this list will hold our answer. Then we're calling this function helper with root and the list. Then we're returning the list. This is your function definition helper. It takes two parameter node and list. Then we're checking if node equals to null. Then by this return statement will exit then we're calling with node.left and list recursively then we're adding our current node to the list and then we're calling with the node.write and list now let me show you how it works here this helper function will call recursively until node.left becomes a null node now let me show you how it works so first we have this root node on the left of this node root, we have the node 2. On the left of 2, we have the node 4. On the left of 4, we have node 8. And on the left of node 8, we have null. So we'll exit for this function call for this node. Okay? Because node left equals to null. Now let's process this node. We're going to process this node by this statement list.add node.val. So let's add this node value to a list. Now let's go to the right of this node. The right of this node is null. So the function call will exit by this return statement. Then let's go to this node and we're going to process this node. And here we're going to add the node value 4 to our list. Now let's go to the right of this node. The right of this node is this node 9. And here let's go to the left. Left is null. Now let's process this node. In processing mean we're adding the node value to the list. So let's add the node value 9 to this list. Now let's go to the right. Right is null. So it will just exit by the return statement. Now we're done with the left subtree of this node 2. Now it's time to process this node. So let's add this node value to the list. Then let's go to the right of this node. On the right we have this node 5. On the left of this node 5 we have this node 10 on the left of 10 we have null now let's process this node 10 let's add the value 10 here now let's go to the right right is null so function call will exit then let's process this node 5 let's add the value 5 to the list now let's go to the right of this node 5 the right of this node 5 is 11 and let's go to the left of 11 that is null the function call will exit then let's process this node we get 11 
and let's go to the right right is null so we're done with the left subtree of this node one now it now it's time to process this node if we process this node we get the value one now let's go to the right of this node one that is three let's go to the left of this node three that is six now let's go to the left of this node six and that is 12 and the left of this node 12 is null so the function call will exit now let's now let's add the node value 12 to the list now let's go to the right of this node the right is null it will exit then let's process this node 6 now let's go to the right right is this node 13 now let's go to the left of this node 13 that is null the function call will exit now let's add the node value to the list 13 now let's go to the right right is null so function call will exit here now let's process this node 3 now let's go to the right of this node 3 and that is 7 now let's go to the left of this node 7 that is 14 and let's go to the left of this node 14 that is null and then let's add the node value 14 then let's go to the right of this node 14 that is null so function call will exit now let's process this node 7 now let's go to the right of this node 7 and that is 15 now let's go to the left that is null so the function call will exit now let's add this node value to the list and now let's go to the right and right is null the function call will exit so we have traversed this binary search tree using in order traversal techniques hope you have understood the in order traversal this is our recursive solution and this is how it works if you're not understanding i will highly encourage you to go through with your own examples and try to write out everything on a piece of paper to see things how it works we have here a lot of recursive function call if you're not familiar with recursion then i will highly encourage you to write out all the function call to a speech of paper so you can understand it better the solution will take big of n time complexity or n is the number of nodes we have in the given tree and it will take big of n space complexity for the recursion call stack hope you have understood the recursive solution now let me show you how you can solve this problem iteratively this is our iterative solution to this problem this is your algorithm now let's review the algorithm first then we will see how it works first we have the function in order traversal that takes root of a given binary tree then we have the result list here then we are creating a stack to solve three problem we have to use a stack then our current node is root so first our current node is root then this while loop if the current node is not equals to null and stack is not empty then we're going to check if current element is not null then we're going to push that element to stack and then we're going to move to the left and then we will pop out the top element from stack then we're adding the value of the popped element to our result list then we're moving to the right node and then we'll return the result list now let me show you how it works our current node is one first we'll add the node one to our stack then we're going to move to the left node so we're done with this node let's move to the left node and this is our left node we see this node is not equals to null so we'll add that node to our stack now let's go to the left of this node two and on the left we see we have this node four and this is not a null node so let's add the node to our stack we're adding the node to stack not the value okay now let's go to the left of this node 4 and on the left we have this node 8 and 8 is not a null node so let's add 8 to our stack now let's go to the left of this node 8 and we see that on the left we have a null node when we found null node on the left we'll pop out the top element from stack and if we pop out this node from this stack then we get this node 8 okay now if we add the value of node that we pop out from stack the first value is 8 now we're going to move to the right and on the right we see that we have a null node 
so we have processed this node and let's go to the right and also we have to remove this from our stack and we see on the right we have a null node since we have the right equals to null node so this while loop will not run and this while loop will run because stack is not empty and this while loop will not run because the current node is a null node so we'll pop out element from stack so we get the node 4 and let's add the value 4 to our list and let's pop out we have processed the current node now let's go to the right of this node 4 and on the right we see we have node 9 9 is not a null node so let's add this 9 to our stack then what i'm going to do i'm going to move to the left of this node 9 okay and on the left we see we have a null node when you found on the left null node then we will pop out the top element from stack so if we pop out this 9 from stack then we're going to add this node's value to our list and we'll move that from stack and let's go to the right right is null as well then what i'm going to do when you found right equals to null then we'll pop out the top element from stack so let's pop out this element from stack and let's add the value of pop out element to the list so we have processed this node too now we're going to move to the right and the right of this node is this node 5 and this node is not a null node so let's add this node to our stack now let's go to the left of this node 5 on the left of this node 5 we have this node 10 now let's add this node 10 to our stack since this node is not a null node so we're going to add 10 to our stack and now let's go to the left on the left we see that we have a null node when you found a null node we'll pop out the top element from stack and we'll add the nodes value to our stack so we pop out the node 10 from stack we get here 10 and we'll add that value 10 to the list and then now let's go to the right of this node 10 on the right we have null node when i found null node on the right so we'll pop out the top element from stack so let's pop out this element from stack and let's add the node value to our list so we have processed this node 5 now let's go to the right of this node 5 and that is 11 11 is not a null so let's add 11 to the stack we're storing the node not the value okay then on the left of 11 we have null when we found the left is null we'll pop out the top element from stack and we'll add the value of that node to our list so let's add here 11 and we'll pop out 11 from here we have processed this node 11 now let's go to the right of this node 11 and we see on the right we have null when you found null on the right we will pop out the element from stack if the stack is not empty so we'll pop out this node 1 and we will add the value of that node to our list so here we see we have processed this root node now let's go to the right on the right we have this node 3 3 is not a null node so let's add that to our stack now let's go to the left of this node 3 and on the left we see 6 6 is not a null node so let's add 6 to our list now let's go to the left of 6 and on the left of 6 we have this node 12 and 12 is not a null node so let's add that to our stack now let's go to the left of 12 we see null when you found the left node equals to null we'll pop out the top element from stack so if we pop out 12 we get the value 12 let's add 12 to our list so we have processed this node 12 now let's go to the right right is null so we'll pop out the top element from stack so we'll pop out this node 6 and we'll add that to our list and by this line here okay raise dot at current dot val so we have processed this node 6 now let's go to the right right is 13 13 13 is not a null node so let's add 13 to our stack and the left of 13 is a null node so let's pop out the top for element from stack and we'll add that element to our list so let's add here 13 and let's pop out this 13 and we'll process this node 13 okay now let's go to the right right is null if we found right is null we'll pop out the top element from stack if stack is not empty so let's pop out this element 3 from stack and let's add it to this list and here 
we have processed this node 3. Now let's remove this node from stack. Now let's go to the right of this node 3 and that is 7. 7 is not a null node so we'll add 7 to our stack. Now let's go to the left of 7 and that is 14 and 14 is not a null node. We'll add 14 to our stack. So we'll add 14 to our stack. On the left of 14 we have null node. So we'll pop out the top element from stack and we'll add that to this list. So let's add 14 to this list and let's pop out this 14. So we have processed this node 14. Now let's go to the right. Right is null. So let's pop out the top element from stack. So we'll add 7 and let's remove this element 7 from here. So we have processed this node 7. Now let's, now let's go to the right of this node 7 and that is 15. 15 is not null. So let's add 15 to our stack and let's go to the left. On the left we see we have a null node. So we'll pop out the top element from stack and that is 15. So let's add 15 to our list and let's remove that element from our stack and we have processed this node 15. And now we have right. Right is null of this node 15 and our stack is empty. If we found right is null and stack is empty this while loop will stop executing current node is null so is not equal to null. this condition is false here and this condition is false here so this while loop stop here and we're done and this is how it works i hope you have understood the video explanation the concept is that first we'll first we'll visit the leftmost node by adding all the node from root to the leftmost node to a stack Whenever we found the left node is a null node, then we'll pop out the top node from stack and we'll add the node's value to our list and we'll move to the right of our popped out node. And if we found right node is null, then also we'll pop out the top element from stack if stack is not empty. And this is how we can solve this problem. This solution will take bigger of in time complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in a given binary tree. And this solution will take bigger of n space complexity to construct the stack. This is how we can solve this problem iteratively. Hope you have understood the video explanation. In this video, we have discussed about recursive solution and iterative solution. Hope you have understood both. If you are not understanding any of them, I will highly encourage you to go through with your own examples, then it will make sense. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Right in this video, we're going to solve a coding interview problem. Binary tree post to the tower cell. Given the root of a binary tree, return the post order tower cell of its node's values. Now let me show you how you can solve this problem. For example, if you're given this binary tree, we have to traverse this binary tree in post order. Here we have numbering. First we have to process this node 8, then this node 9, then this node 4, then this node 10, then 11, then 5, then 7, then 12, then 13, then 10, then 14, 15, 7, 3, and 1. Now, in this video, we're going to solve this problem recursively and iteratively. First, we're going to see how we can solve this problem recursively, then we'll talk about iteratively. If you're not understanding post order traversal, for each node, we have a policy here L for left, R for right, node for the current node. For every single node, this policy will be applied. For this node, first we have to process the left node, then right node, then the current node. And this policy will be applied to every single node. If we apply this policy, then we will get this list. If you are not understanding, I would request you to watch the first video to this section. Now let me show you how we can solve this problem recursively. This is our recursive algorithm. To solve this problem first let's review this algorithm then we'll see how it works 
First, we have this function post order traversal that takes root of a given binary tree. Then we have list. This list will store the answer. Then we're calling this function helper with root and list. Then we're returning the list. This helper function will traverse the binary tree and will construct the list using pre order traversal techniques. And here we have this function definition helper. This function takes node and the list as input. And here we're going to check if the current node is equals to null, then we will return. Then we're calling the function recursively node.left. Then list when you encountered null node on the leftmost node, then we'll call with the right node. And then we're adding the current node value to the list. Now let me show you how this actually works. First, we have L. So we have to process the left node first. So let's go to the left of this node one. Recursively, we're calling this helper function. Okay. And we have to move to the left of this node two. So the left of this node two is four and the left of this node four is this node eight and the left of this node eight is null. When you found left node of a node is null, we will exit that function call using this return statement. Now let's go to the right. On the right, we have a null node. When you found null node, we'll just return. That means we'll exit. Then we'll process this node. So if we process this node, our node value is 8. So we're done with the left node of this node 4. Now let's go to the right of this node. On the right, we have this node. So now let's go to the left. Left is null. And right, right is null as well. Now let's process this node. So we get 9. Now we're done with the left and right node of this node 4. Now let's process this node. So let's add the value 4 to our list. Now we're done with the left node of this node 2. Now let's go to the right node. And here we have this right node 5. Now let's go to the left of this node 5. And that is 10. Now let's go to the left. Left is null and right is null. Now let's process this node. We get 10. When you found left null or right null, the function call will exit. We're done with the left. Now let's go to the right. Right is 11. Let's go to the left. Left is null. Right is null as well. Now let's process this node. So we get value 11. Then let's process this node 5. Let's add here 5. Now we're done with the left and right sub of this node 2. Now let's process this node. So we get 2. Now we processed the left subtree of this node 1. Now let's go to the right subtree of this node 1. So let's go to the right subtree. Here we have this node 3. Now let's go to the left. On the left we have this node 6. Let's go to the left. On the left of 6 we have this node 12. Now let's go to the left of this node 12. That is null. So we'll exit. Right of this node is null as well. So we'll exit. And then we have this current node. Now let's process this node. We get the value. 12. Now let's go to the right of this node 6. Since you processed the left sub of this node 6, let's go to the right. On the right, we have this node 13. Let's go to the left of this node 13. And on the right of this node, we have 13. So let's add. Now we have to process this node. Now let's add 13 to our list. At this part, we see we have processed the left and right sub t of this node. Now let's process this node so we get the value 6. Now let's go to the right of this node 3. If we move to the right, we get this node 7. Now let's go to the left of this node 7. We get this node 14. Let's move to the left. Left is null. Right is null. Let's process this node 14. Let's add here 14. Now let's go to the right of this node 7. That is 15. Let's go to the left of this node 15. That is null. And you have to remove this. And on the left of this 15, we have null. And on the right, we have null. So now let's process this node. We get 15. Okay. Now we have processed the left and right sub of this node 7. Now let's process this node. So we get 7. Now we see we have processed the left and right sub of this node 3. Now let's process this node. If we process this node, we get 3. Now at this point, we have done with the left subtree and the right subtree of our root node. 
now let's process this node if we process this node we get one okay and we have processed all the nodes in this binary tree this is how we can solve this problem using recursion if you're not understanding try to go through with your own examples and try to write out every single recursive function call on a speech of paper then it will make sense this solution will take bigger of in time complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in the given tree and it will take bigger of in space complexity for the recursive call stack now let me show you how you can solve this problem iteratively for iterative approach we have to use a stack this is our recursive algorithm to solve this problem first let's review the algorithm then we'll see how it works first we have this function post order traversal that takes the root of a given binary tree then we declare a list this list will hold our answer then we are declaring a stack then we're gonna check if root equals to null we're going to return the empty list and then we're going to insert the root the root node to our stack so we're gonna insert the root node one to our stack then we're gonna check if stack is not empty then we're going to pop out the element from top and then we're going to add the value to the list from the end and then we're gonna check if the left is not equals to null then we're going to push the left and if the right is not equal to null we're going to push the right and then we're returning the list the overall idea here is that first we'll insert the root node to our stack then we will check if the left is not empty we'll insert to stack and if the right is not empty then we'll insert to the stack and then we'll pop out the right and we'll insert the left and right and then we'll pop out the right we'll insert the left and right and we'll keep doing this process until we have traversed all the nodes in a given tree traversing simply means visiting in nodes okay now before we start solving this problem let's see a pattern here we see that on the bottom we have one and here we have a path 1 3 then 15 11 then 10 9 8 then 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 and we see a direction here okay and this is something like pre-order traversal on pre-order traversal will traverse the given binary tree from the left side okay something like this in pre-order we traverse the given tree something like this uh, right this direction okay in pre-order and here we see that here we see that if we add one from the end very end then at the end one then 3 then 7 then 15 then 14 then 13 6 something like this at the end 1 then 3 then 7 then 15 and so on and so forth then we will get our answer in post order traversal and that what we will do using iterative approach we'll store the root on the stack first then we'll pop out the root and we'll insert left and right and we'll pop out the top that means the right and then we'll insert left and right and we'll be doing this process until we have traversed all the nodes and we'll be adding the nodes value from the very end now let me show you how you can solve this problem iteratively and this is the core intuition now first what i'm gonna do first i'm going to pop out this node and i'm going to add it to a list from the end okay one so we have processed this node one then what are we going to do we're going to add the left node and the right node and we'll pop out the node one from stack and we'll add two and three we're adding the node not the nodes value okay then what are we going to do we're going to pop out the node three from stack okay now we're going to pop out the top element from stack and that is three so let's add it to the list in reverse order okay from the right to left now we're going to remove this node 3 and let's add the left and right to our stack 6 and 7 
now let's pop out the top element from stack that is 7 so let's add it to our list and then for the node 7 the left is not null so let's add to our stack 14 this is node not a value okay and right is not null so let's add 15 to our stack now we're going to pop out the top element and that is 15 so let's pop out 15 and let's add 15 to our list in reverse order from right to left so we have processed 1 3 7 15 now we see left is null so we'll not push left to the stack and we see right is null so we'll not push right to the stack now what are we going to do we're going to pop out the top element from stack if left and right both null and stack is not empty so let's pop out the top element from stack 14 and let's add it to our list and let's see if the left of 14 is not null and we see null so we'll not add this to the stack and the right is null so we'll not add this to the stack so so process this node 14 and we see left and right is null so we will pop out the top element from stack if the stack is not empty and we see stack is not empty so let's pop out this element that means the node from stack we get 6 let's add here 6 and let's remove it from stack and the left of 6 is 12 so 12 is not null so let's add 12 to our stack and the right of 6 is 13 13 is not null so let's add 13 to our stack now what are we going to do we're going to pop out the top element from stack and that is 13 so let's add it to our list in reverse order from right to left so we have processed 13 left of 13 is null and right of 13 is null so we can't add left and right to our stack if we found left and right is null we will pop out the top element from stack if stack is not empty so let's pop out 12 if we pop out 12 then we get the value 12 and the left and right node of this node 12 is null so we can't add that to our so we have processed this node 12 now what are we going to do we're going to pop out the top element from stack in this case we'll pop out 2 so let's add 2 to our list and let's remove 2 and on the left of 2 we have node 4 4 is not null so let's add 4 to our stack and the right is not a null node as well so let's add 5 to the stack now what are we going to do we're going to pop out the top element from stack that is 5 so let's add 5 to our list in reverse order and let's pop out 5 and the left of 5 is 10 let's add 10 to our stack since 10 is not a null node then let's add the right node right node is 11 now what are we going to do we're going to pop out the top element from stack so we're going to pop out 11 now we're going to now the left of 11 is null and the right is null so we can't add that to stack and then we will pop out the top element from stack if we found left and right of a node is null if stack is not empty let's pop out the top element that is 10 so let's add here 10 to our list and let's pop out 10 from stack and we see that we processed 10 as well and the left and right of 10 is null so we will pop out the top element from stack and we see stack is not empty so let's pop out this element 4 and we will add 4 to our list and we see that the left and right of pop out element is 8 and 9 so let's add them to the stack since they are not null 8 and 9 we're going to pop out the top element and that is 9 so let's add so let's add 9 to the list and let's pop out this node and we see left and right is null so we can't add that and we process this node 9 since the left and right of this node 9 is null we're going to pop out the top element from stack so let's pop out this element 8 and let's add it to our list so we get this list and the left and right of this element is null so we'll pop out the top element from stack since the stack is empty we can't pop out anymore and we are done we have processed all the nodes we have processed all the nodes in the given binary tree using post order traversal techniques and we get this list and this is how we can solve this problem hope you have understood this explanation the solution will take bigger of n time complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in the given binary tree and this will take bigger of n space complexity 
to construct the stack. In this video, we have solved this problem recursively and iteratively. Hope you have understood the both approach. If you are not understanding any of them, I will highly encourage you to go through with your own examples and try to write out everything on a speech of paper, then you will see how it works. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have any question, if you have any suggestion, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to solve a coding interview problem, binary tree, level order traversal. Given the root of a binary tree, return the level order traversal of its nodes values. For example, if you're given this binary tree, you have to traverse this binary tree in level order. That means first you have to traverse this node 1, then this node 2, then 3, then 4, 5, 6, 7, something like this. 1, 2, 3, then 5, 6, 7. So if you're given this binary tree, in this tree we have three levels and we have to return this list. At level 0 we have only one nodes, at level 1 we have two nodes, 2 and 3, and at level 2 we have four nodes. So if we are given this binary tree, we have to return this list. For example, if you're given this binary tree, in this binary tree we have four levels, level 0, level 1, level 2, and level 3. And we have to traverse this node in level order traversal first 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, 5, 6, 7, then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So if we're given this binary tree, we have to return this list. At level 0 we have one node, at level 1 we have two nodes, 2 and 3, at level 2 we have nodes 4, 5, 6, 7, at level 3 we have nodes 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 and 15. In this video, we're gonna solve this problem recursively and iteratively. First, let's see how we can solve this problem recursively. Then we'll see how we can solve this problem iteratively. For sake of understanding, let's assume we're given this binary tree. This is level 0, this is level 1, and this is level 2. Now we're going to construct a list and inside that list we'll store another list. So let's traverse this binary tree. First we're going to traverse this node 1. And in this level we have only one node. So we'll construct a list inside this list at index 0 by mapping to this level 0. And let's add this value to our list. Now let's go to the left. On the left we have this node 2. Now let's construct a new list at index 1 and let's add the nodes value to our list. Now let's go to the left. On the left we have this node 4 and let's construct a new list at index 2 and let's add this node value to our list. On the left and on the right of this node 4 we have no nodes that means we have null node. For null node we'll just return, we'll do nothing. Now let's go to the right, on the right we have this node 5, 5 is located at this level 2. So let's add this node 5 to index 2. So 5 will be added here, then this node. This node is located at level 1, so let's add this node to index 1. 3 will be added here, then this node 6. 6 is located at index 2, so let's add 6 to our list of index 2. 7 is located at level 2, so let's add 7 to our list of index 2. 7 will be added here. And this is how we can solve this problem recursively. For better understanding, let's take another example. Let's say we're given this binary tree as input. We have to traverse this binary tree in level order traversal and you have to return the nodes values in level order traversal. We have here four levels, level 0, level 1, level 2 and level 3. Now let's construct a list that list will store node values in level order traversal. Now let's traverse this node. First we have this root node. Let's process this node. This node is located at index 0. At index 0 we're going to create a new list and in that list we're going to insert 1 at index 0. And that index maps to the level number. Now let's add 1 to this index 0. Now let's go to the left. On the left you have this node 2. Now let's create a new list at index 1 and let's add the nodes value at that list. So let's add the node value 2 to this list. When we'll encounter this node, we'll find out our index number. Then we'll add that node values by getting the list of index 1 
and we can manage the index by recursion call stack and we'll see when we'll go through the pseudo code in each recursive function call stack we have a new state in that state we will have the level number with that level number we can access any of the list inside this list and we can add to that list the nodes value okay now let's go to the left on the left we have this node 4 let's create a new list at index 2 and let's add this value 4 to that list now let's go to the left again we have this node 8 now let's create a new list at index 3 and let's add this node value 8 to that list on the left we have null so we'll return on the right we have null we'll return that means we'll just exit we'll do nothing now let's go to the right node on the right node we have 9 so let's add 9 in the list of index 3 so let's add here 9 now let's go to the node 5 5 is located at level 2 and let's add in the list of level 2 the node value 5 so 5 will be added here then let's go to the left 10 is located at level 3 so let's add 10 to this list 10 will be added here on the left we have null so we'll exit on the right we have null we'll exit now this node this node is located at level 3 so let's add this node values to index 3 the left and right of this node 11 is null so we'll just exit for that node we'll do nothing now we're done with the left subtree of this node 1 now let's go to the right subtree on the right node we have this node 3 this node is located at level 1 so let's add this node at index 1 and we can get the index number that means the level number in recursion call stack all right so we'll we'll see how we can get that when we we'll go through our pseudo code now let's add this value 3 to index to the list of index 1 so 3 will be added here then 6 6 will be added to this list then 12 12 will be added to this list of index 3 then 13 13 will be added to this list of index 3 then 7 7 will be added to this list of index 2 then 14 14 will be added to this list of index 3 then 15, 15 will be added to this list of index 3. This is how we can solve this problem recursively. Hope you have understood the intuition. Now let's see how we can implement this solution using pseudocode. This is our pseudocode to solve this problem. And for sake of understanding, we're assuming that we're given this binary tree. First, we have this function called level order. That function takes the root of a given binary tree. Then we're creating a list. And then we're calling the function level helper with list root and zero. This zero is the level number, okay? And then we're returning the list. This function will construct our result. This is our function definition level helper. This function takes three parameter, list, root, and level. Then we're checking if our current node is null, we'll just return. That means we're exiting from the current function call using this return statement. If level is greater than or equals to list.site, then we'll create a new level and we'll insert that level to our list and we can get the index number of that list by the level number and we're managing the level number using this recursion call using this recursion function call level plus one and here we're checking and here list dot get level we're getting the current level and we're adding the right node to the right level and then we're calling the function recursively left and right initially we have this root node and we're going to add the root node to a list and we'll create that list right over here new level let's add a new list here and let's add the node one at index zero then we have this node at level one let's create a new list at index one let's insert this node two and we're inserting using this statement and then this node four at index two we have no list so let's create a new list and let's insert this value of this node 4 to this list then this node 5 let's insert 5 to this list then this node 3 let's insert this to this list of index 1 then 6 6 will be added to this list of index 2 then 7 7 will be added to this list of index 2 we're done this is how we can solve this problem hope you have understood this solution and this is the recursive solution for this problem the solution will take bigger of in time complexity or n is the number of nodes we have in the given a tree and this solution will take bigger of 2n space complexity to construct the output list and for recursion 
call stack and the overall space complexity is bigger of n where n is the number of nodes we have in the given tree if you're not understanding i will highly encourage you to go through with your own examples then it will make sense now let's see how we can solve this problem iteratively all right now we're going to go through the iterative approach to this problem for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this binary tree and we have a queue to solve this problem we have to use a queue uh, most of the time when we solve a tree problem using a loop we have to consider using a stack or queue now let's see how we can solve this problem first we have this root node let's add this root node to our queue now now we're going to create a new list let's say this is our new list and if count equals to one count equals to one means at current level we have only one node now let's create a new list right over here and let's add one to this list and let's pop out this node let's add left and right node to our queue so two will be added here and three will be added here now count will be changed to two because at our current level we have two nodes now what are we going to do we're going to pop out this node and we're going to create a new list and in the list we're going to insert this node value two and then we're going to add the left and right node of this node two to our queue so let's add here four and let's add here five now let's pop out this node three and let's add this node value to our list right over here then we're going to add the left and right node of this node three to our queue so six and seven now count will be changed to four because now we have four nodes in our queue because you have four nodes in the new level now what we're going to do we're going to pop out this node four and we're going to create a new list and we're going to add that node value to our new list the left and right is null so we we can't add null node to our queue then five let's add the value of this node five to our list then six let's add the value of this node six to our list left and right of this node six are null so we can't add null node to our queue then we have seven let's pop out and let's add to our list and we're done and our queue is now empty when our queue is empty we're done with that problem for this given binary tree, we have to return this list of list this is for level zero this is for level one and this is for level two now let's see the iterative algorithm to solve this problem all right this is our iterative algorithm to solve this problem first step this function level order this function takes the root of a given binary tree. then we're creating a list then we're checking if root equals to null we're returning the empty list then we're creating a queue this is our queue then we're adding the first node to our queue let's add your first node and our list initially we created this list let's say this is our list then while loop while queue is not empty we see queue is not empty we have one node in the queue now we're going to create a new level that means a new list to our list and we're going to pull out this node from queue and we're going to add that value to our new list and then we're going to add the left and right of this node one to our list two and three here we have count count equals to q dot size count means at current level how much nodes we have okay then we're running this loop and then we're pulling out the node and we're adding that node to our current list and then we're checking if the left node is not null we're adding to the queue if the right node is not null then we're adding to the queue and then we're adding the level to our list and this is the level we added to our list now we have in the queue two nodes queue is not empty and we have two nodes and we created a new list this is our new list count equals to two that means we have two nodes at the current level so let's pop out two and let's add two to our list and let's add the left and right of two to our queue so we have added four and five to our queue now let's pop out this node three let's add the value to our list and then let's add the left and right node of three to our queue six and seven now we see that on the queue we have four nodes Q is not empty now let's create a new level here we're going to create a new level and then count count equals to four because at that level we have four nodes and then we're pulling out the first from our queue so let's add four to our list then the left and right is null so we so we can't add the null node to our queue then we have five let's add five to our queue the left and right of five is null then let's pull out this node let's add six to our list then seven 
let's pull out seven and let's add seven to our list at the end we're returning this list of list and this is the list of list okay this is how we can solve this problem iteratively hope you have understood this video explanation this solution will take big of n time complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in the given binary tree and this solution will take big of to n space complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in the given tree it takes 2n time complexity because we're constructing a queue and we're constructing our result list the overall space complexity is bigger of n because 2 is a constant all right guys this is my solution to this problem hope you've understood the recursive and iterative solution to this problem if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know oh i attached the source code to this video check it out if you have any question if you have any suggestion or if you have any problem in understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement a binary tree using array data structure in this section of this course we'll be implementing these operations that you can perform in a binary tree in this video we're going to talk about these two operation create a binary tree and insert a value and then we'll talk about search delete node delete binary tree and then we'll talk about traverse operation and in this traverse method we're going to implement four types of traversal in order pre-order post-order and level order now let's talk about create binary tree and insert operation this is a binary tree using array class in this class we have an array and we have a variable last used index for array implementation side of the tree is fixed we cannot change the side of the tree once we have created the tree this method create binary tree takes a parameter side inside here inside here we're creating an array new int size plus one we're creating an array of side size plus one because we will not use the first cell then we have this last used index that is zero initially and we're printing here tree is created if we call this method create binary tree with seven then we'll create an array of length eight where we have index from zero to seven initially we can consider our tree is null because the array is empty we'll not insert any value to the first index that's why we're choosing the last used index equals to zero here zero is the index of this cell and we'll not use this cell while implementing the binary tree using array we can consider this null is our root node since our array is empty now let's see insert method this insert method takes one parameter value inside here we're checking if tree is full we'll implement this method in this video don't worry about that if this method written true then we're printing tree is full previously we mentioned that for add implementation of tree data structure size of tree is fixed we cannot change the size once we have created the tree using array data structure and then we're returning here if the array is not full then we're inserting the value to the last used index plus one so we'll insert the value from this position that means from this index one and then we're increasing the index by one now let's see how the tree data structure represented logically and we'll use this formula to construct the logical tree data structure from this array in in computer memory we'll have the array okay and logically we'll have a tree representation using this formula and we'll choose the element from index one as the root node and then we'll apply left child equals to this formula and right child equals to this formula here x is the current index if we call this method insert 10 then we'll insert here 10 then in logical representation we'll have 10 10 is our root node okay if we call this method with 20 then we're going to apply this formula left child array twix here we will insert the value 20 to this cell at index 2 and in logical representation we'll have 
added to x here x is the index of root node that is 1 so 2x is 2 so we'll get this value and we'll insert that value to the left child of this binary tree so we'll insert 20 to the left child if we call this function again with 30 we'll insert 30 to this to this cell at index 3 and then we're going to assign the value 30 as the right child of this root node 10 so right child equals to array to x plus 1 here x is index 1 so 2x plus 1 is 3 so we'll take this value 30 and we'll insert to the right child of this root node then logically the binary tree will be represented something like this if we call this method with 40 then we're going to insert 40 at index 4 we'll consider this is your root node so the left child is array to x index of 20 is 2 so 2x is 4 so we'll insert 40 is the left child of this node 20 so let's add 40 right over here if we call it again then we'll insert 50 right over here and we'll insert 50 to the right of this root node 20 is our current root and we can get the index of this element 50 by 2x plus 1 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5 now if we call this method again with 60 we'll insert 60 at index 6 and we're going to apply this formula left child of 30 3x that is 6 so let's insert 60 as the left child of this node 30 if we call again with 70 then we'll insert 70 right over here and we're going to apply this formula by considering 30 is our root node current root node so 3 times 2 plus 1 is 7 so we'll insert here 70 so we'll insert here 70 and the left of 40 is twix and that is 8 the 8 is out of array boundary so we'll just return we can consider null and the right node is also null 2 times 4 plus 1 equals to 9 that is out of our array boundary so we can consider left and right null for 40 50 60 and 70. this array will be stored in computer memory but logically the tree data structure will be represented something like this this is the logical representation of our t data structure hope you've understood how insert method works this method takes big of one time complexity and big of one space complexity this method create binary tree will take big of one time complexity and big of n space complexity where n is the size of the array now let's talk about useful method this method will return true or false if array.length minus 1 equals to last used index then we'll return 2 else we'll return false if we call this function is full for this given binary tree it will return true because the size of our array is full hope you've understood this video explanations if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implementing this method search this is search method and for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array this array is treating as tree data structure because we're implementing a tree using array data structure this is the array and this is the logical representation of this array how we can search a value in a tree data structure when we implement tree using array this is the algorithm for search operation this method takes one parameter value inside here we're running a loop from index 1 to the last used index and here the last used index is 7 here we're searching from index 1 to the last used index we're not starting from index 0 because 0 is the unused index first we're gonna check from index 1 if we call the method with value 20 then what it will return first we see 10 in the next iteration of this loop we see we have 20 so it will return the index of of the value 20 that is 2 so it will return 2 if we call this method with 70 and first we'll check with 10 10 is not equals to 70 then 20 20 is not equals to 70 then 30 30 is not equals to 70 then 40 40 is not equals to 70 50 is not equals to 70 60 is not equals to 70 and we see 70 equals to 70 so it will return the index 7 for this function call it will return 7 if we call this function with 80 we see 80 
do not exist in this array so you can say 80 is not exist in this binary tree so we'll just return minus one this is how this method works this method will take bigger of in time complexity and bigger of in space complexity where n is the number of nodes we have in the binary tree hope you have understood this method thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this operation delete node this method will take a value as input and it will remove the value from the binary tree let's see how we can do that this is the pseudocode to delete a particular node from binary tree for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array and this array is represented as tree something like this this method takes one parameter inside here we're finding out the location of the given value if the value do not exist in the tree then this method search will return minus one we already saw this method if the method return minus one that means the value do not exist in the binary tree so we'll print value doesn't exist and we will just return if not we're going to get the deepest node that means the last element from array and we'll update the value at the desired position and we'll move the last used index to the left without modifying the value we can modify the value or we can change the value to the default value or we can skip the value here we're just skipping the value let's see how it works if we call this method delete node with 30 then first what are going to do we're going to find out the index of 30 and that is 3 then we're going to find out the deepest node that means the last element from our array that is 70 so this element and here this node and then we're going to update the value 30 with the value of deepest node so let's update 30 with 70 and then we're going to skip the last used index so last used index will move to this element so we can consider 70 do not exist in the tree or just skipping the value okay we have the node from index 1 to the index 6 so the array will be represented something like this and the logical tree will be logically represented something like this the right node of 70 is null we have deleted the node 30 right here we updated the value of this node 30 with 70 if we call this method with 60 first what we're going to do we're going to find out the index of this node 60 that is 6 and then we're going to find out the defense node and that is this node itself so we're going to just skip nothing need to be done here and also we'll update the value 60 with 60 using this statement and we will move this last used index to this previous cell so we'll skip the current value and logically we can consider there is no node called 60 so the tree will be represented something like this and the array will be represented something like this this is just a logical representation of this array and we skipped these two items this is how delete node method works here we're taking the deepest node we can take any leaf node as well but for easy implementation we're taking the deepest node that means the last element from our array and we're updating the value of our desired node with the deepest node hope you have understood this video explanation this method will take bigger of in time complexity and it will take constant space complexity hope you have understood this method thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see this method delete binary tree this is the method this method takes no parameter inside here we're just setting array equals to null so how the array will be deleted when you set array equals to null for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array and this array is treating as t data structure and this is the logical representation of this array the array is pointing to the first element the array variable is pointing to the first element of the array and it works like a pointer the array is pointing to the first element when we say array equals to null the array 
will not point to the first element arrow will point to the array will point to null so there is nothing is pointing to the first cell so the array will be deleted since the array works in contiguous fashion the entire array will be deleted by the garbix collector so the linked list will be deleted from ram and the array will be deleted as well when you set array equals to null and this operation will take big up one time complexity and big up one space complexity hope you've understood how this method works this is all about this video thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to traverse binary tree using pre-order traversal now let's see how we can traverse a binary tree using pre-order traversal for sake of understanding let's add him we're given this binary tree first let's see what is a pre-order traversal in pre-order traversal first we'll visit this node 10 then 20 then 40 50 then 30 60 then 70. this is called pre-order traversal if you're not understanding what is a pre-order traversal we have a section in this video where we have talked about free order in order and post order traversal in details and how the tricks really works if you're not understanding i will highly encourage to watch that video if you're given this binary tree we have to return this list first 10 20 then 40 50 30 60 70. now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for pre-order traversal it takes the index index is the index of first element and there is one this is the root node okay and then we're checking if index is greater than last used index or just returning that means we're exiting by this return statement if not we're printing the value from our current index and we're calling pre-order two times index and we're calling pre-order two times index plus one this is something like lift and this is something like a right and we call this method pre-order with index one this is the index of root node this is our root node so let's print the value 10. now let's go to the left two times index two times one is two so the value is 20 then left of 20 is two times two that is four and that is 40. here we'll print 20 then we'll print 40. then let's print 40 because two times 2 is 40 then 2 times 2 plus 1 that is 50 so let's print 50 then for this node 2 times 1 plus 1 that is 30 let's print 30 the left of 30 is 60 2 times 3 is 6 so 60 let's print 60 then 2 times 3 plus 1 that is 7 at index 7 we have 70 so let's print 70 so by traversing this binary tree using pre-order traversal we get this list and this is how this algorithm works hope you have understood how this algorithm works if you're not understanding i will highly encourage you to try to understand this algorithm by taking some examples the solution will take big of in time complexity and it will take big of in space complexity as well for the recursion call stack or it is the number of nodes in the given binary tree thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about in order traversal of a binary tree if you're not understanding what is the in order traversal in this section of this course we have a video what we have talked about pre-order in order and post order traversal in details in in order traversal first we'll visit this node 40 then 20 then 50 then 10 then 60 then 30 then 70. so if we're given this binary tree we have to return this list and this is the list we can get by traversing the binary tree using in order traversal now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm of in order traversal this method takes one parameter index the index of root node then we're checking inside if index is greater than last used index then we're returning if not then we're calling with in order two times index when we visited the leftmost node we're printing the value of leftmost node and then we're calling with two times index plus one this is something like right this is something like left and this is something like right this is our root node then two times one is two that is 20 using this function call then again two times two is four that is 40. 
at index 4 we have 40 then left is null then we'll process this node let's process 40 let's print 40 then right right is null it will just return now we have processed the left node of this node 20 now let's process this node so let's print 20 then let's go to the right right is 50 let's print 50 now we see we have processed the left of this node 10 so now let's process this node 10 then let's go to right now let's go to left and the left is null so let's print 60 right is null as well now let's print this node 30 since we have processed left node of this node 30 now let's go to the right and that is 70 now let's process this node 70 this is how we can traverse a binary tree using in order traversal this is just a logical representation of this array and we can construct this tree using these properties left child and right child array to x array to x plus one and by taking the valid index one as a root node hope you've understood this method in order traversal hope you've understood this method this method will take bigger of in time complexity and it will take bigger of in space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement post order traversal for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this binary tree first let's talk about what is a post order traversal in post order traversal first we'll process this node 40 then 50 then 20 then 60 then 70 then 30 then 10 the concept here is that we'll process the current node after processing all the left and right child if you're not understanding what is a post order traversal we have a video in this section what we have talked about pre-order in order and post order traversal in details now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm of post order traversal this method takes the index of root node here we're checking inside here we're checking if index is greater than last used index will return if not we'll call with two times index and in order two times index plus one this is left and this is right here we're calling with left node and here we're calling with right node and we are processing the current node when we have processed all the left and right child of a particular node so first we have 10 then two times index is two because two times one is two then two times two is four so we'll visit to this node and the left is null so we'll return right is null so now let's process this node we have processed the left and right child so if we call this method post order with the index of root node it will print first 40. now we process the left of this node 20. now let's go to the right and the left and right is null so let's process this node let's print 50. we have processed left and right child of this node 20 so let's process this node let's print 20. we're not calculating index for every single node if i calculate index of every single node then you'll get bored you can calculate that using this algorithm okay that's super simple two times index and two times index plus one we have processed all the left node of this node 10 now let's process right node here now let's process here left node this is left and left is null right is null so let's process 60 let's print 60 we're done with left child of this node 30 let's go to the right left is null right is null so it will just return now let's print 70 since you have processed left and right child now let's print 30 since you have processed left and right child of 30. for this root node we have processed the left and right child so let's print the current node 10 and we're done this is how this post order method works this method will take bigger of in time complexity and bigger of in space complexity you can calculate the index using this formula two times index two times index plus one that is super simple when you have processed left and right child will process the current node and this is how we can get this list hope you've understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to see level order traversal of a binary tree let's see how you can do that this is going to be super simple first let's assume this is your given a tree 
what is level order traversal in level order traversal we traverse three level by level first this level 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 50 60 70 so this is a level this is a level and this is a level 10 20 30 40 50 60 70 now let's see the algorithm and this is super simple algorithm we're just iterating from index 1 to the last used index from index 1 to this index 7 if we call this method level order we'll traverse from index 1 to index 7 first we'll print 10 then we'll print 20 then 30 then 40 then 50 60 then 70 and this is the level order traversal of a binary tree this is super simple so we see that level of the traversal of a binary tree is super simple when we implemented binary tree using array hope you've understood this method this method will takes bigger of in time complexity and constant space complexity hope you've understood a level order traversal thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video